Hello, New York. Hello, New York. I'm your New York local president, Ezra Knight. I am honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your energy through this long, amazing journey that we're on. Uh, we're not there yet, but where we've come to so far is profound, unique, and remarkable. We are now in an incredible moment. We all can feel it. So many things are happening worldwide, nationwide, New York City-wide. I want to say how proud I am to be a leader in New York City. This city is an amazing city. It is our second largest local in SAG-AFTRA. Of the 25 locals, yes, right on. We are an indelible, remarkable presence in this union. Besides, New York is the best city in the world. Best city in the world. So I'm proud to represent. I'm happy to have you all here. New Yorkers are tough. We are smart. We are resilient. We are passionate. A lot can happen in a New York minute because New York has that kind of energy in it, and the people that live in this city reflect that type of dynamism and that type of energy. So I'm proud to be here on behalf of you all, on behalf of leadership, and I welcome you to this meeting, this informational meeting for the TV theatrical contract for 2023. So once again, give yourselves a hand, please. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're going to move forward because we're already a little bit behind. We want to make the best of this time. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, there's going to be presentations. And I really request, it is important, that you stay seated through the entire presentational phase. After the presentational phase, we will have a Q&A. Mic stands will appear in the aisles, and you will approach them, but not until after the presentation is done. Just want to make sure that's clear. Is that clear? <laughs> yes. OK, good. So this meeting is about our present TV theatrical contract. Nothing else. It's a, it's a singular issue meeting. OK? <laughs> Anything else, <laughs> it can wait for another event or the other proper channels to address those other issues, whatever they may be. This meeting is confined to our reflection and information Q&A on the TV theatrical contract. So we'll move forward from there. But before we move forward, or rather our next step forward, will be a message for you all from our national president, Fran Drescher. Thank you. your SAG after national president. And I just wanted to thank you all for coming to this informational in-person meeting. It's so important that you fully understand the breadth and width of this contract so that you can make an informed decision when it comes to the ratification process. It is a very big and complex contract that services many, many different career paths in our union. And so if you have questions, now is the time to ask them. If you go to sagaftra.org slash contracts 2023, you will see a lot of information there that might be helpful for you, including frequently asked questions. I'm just so happy that you're here. I'm so proud of your interest in this. We want to satisfy all of your concerns and all of your questions. We worked very hard. We're very proud. And I'm proud of you as well. So let's get on with understanding the contract and asking the questions meaningful to you so that you can go ahead and vote by December 5th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you so much, and take it away, Duncan. 
Hello, New Actually, York. Hello, hello. <laughs> Let's do Linda first. <laughs> it's amazing to see everybody tonight, and I, I'm just like I'm thrilled by this turnout. I'm so glad you all are here. I'm Linda Powell. I'm a New York board member, and I am. I am also coming to you tonight for the first time as your new executive vice president. Thank you for all who supported me. It is uh, my privilege tonight to get to introduce the folks that are here to work the room through the terms of this amazing deal we've got up for ratification. There's a lot to get through, so I'm not going to take too much time, but I do really want to acknowledge the members of the New York negotiating team that are up here, besides me and Ezra, up here on the stage with us tonight. These folks have been in the trenches for membership since the beginning of the year. They've been educating themselves about the issues. They've been advocating for their constituencies. They've been debating amongst themselves about the best course to take at any given moment. They've been away from their families, sometimes across the country, sometimes in the other room because uh, we've been in a lot of Zooms. So I just want to recognize Avis Boone, Aaron Fritch, Michael Gaston, Samantha Mathis, Jack Mulcahy, and John Rockman. I also just want to take this opportunity to thank our staff that supported us throughout the strike and throughout the negotiations. Anywhere we are, they got there first. Anywhere we leave, they're there afterwards, and they are invested in our success as we are. So thank you so much to our amazing staff. I was the chair of our uh, New York W&W process. I'm happy to see some of you who were part of that process here tonight, and you're going to recognize some of the gains that we talk about tonight from our conversations in those W&Ws, the outsize increases, the improvements to residuals, the hair and makeup provisions, the raising of the pH and caps, among others. And I know there's going to be a lot of questions tonight about the AI guardrails we've put in the contract. I'm glad that folks with concerns are going to get a chance to talk to Duncan and Ray about what's bothering them so they can feel fully informed before they vote. And they'll know exactly what is and what isn't in the contract. Our negotiators and contract staff and lawyers have been working on the better half of three years to be ready for this moment, pushing legislation, hosting industry panels, researching the technology, formulating contract language, it's a lot of energy, and rightly so. It's only the biggest technological advance of our lifetime, so no biggie. <laughs> On that note, I would like to introduce, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our chief negotiator and executive director of SAG-AFTRA, Duncan Crabtree Ireland. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Linda. and. Uh, I just have to join in the appreciation and acknowledgement for our negotiating committee. Some of them are here, some of them are from New York, and they're here at these tables uh, with you today. And I can't tell you how proud you should be of your negotiating committee throughout a process that has lasted almost a year, actually beyond when you talk about all the preparation work, throughout a process that involved the first time we've been on strike in this contract in over 40 years throughout a process that involved not only 35 days of intensive negotiations, but 118 days, as every one of you know, that we were on strike. These leaders were courageous, they were smart, they were devoted, dedicated, and powerful, and um, I just hope you know how proud you should be of them. And I can't see all of you as well now because the house lights went down, but before the house lights went down, I looked out and I saw a lot of faces that I saw out on picket lines, uh, out at rallies, at like the Times Square rally. The New York local has done so much during the strike to really deliver the message to the studios and streamers and their CEOs about the unity and power of, of this union. And I just wanna really appreciate all of you and especially the strike captains who are here in the audience. Picket lines every day of the week. Yeah, I mean, I, I was here as much as I possibly could be during the strike and was out on all of the different picket lines that you all put up every day in New York City, and uh, it was a powerful message was delivered, and so just thank you to everyone who made that happen. And of course, our membership uh, in general, uh, 
I couldn't be prouder, uh, honestly, to, to fight for members of a union than the members of SAG-AFTRA. Um, we're here to talk about the 2023 TV theatrical contract, so um, if you thought we were here for some other reason, <laughs> then now's your chance. <laughs> now's your chance to escape, because we are going to, we're going to do that. And I want to just note that this contract is the result of a process that started back in December of last year with W&W &W meetings, where all of our members here in New York and around the country came to meetings, told us what your priorities were, what you were concerned about, and that's how our negotiating committee ultimately formulated our proposal package, which was the most aggressive proposal package. Certainly, we've delivered in my 23 years of working at this union, and I think uh, for in, in a long time, possibly ever. And that set the stage for this historic negotiation and strike process. And I just want to note that it is through the unity and devotion and dedication that all of us delivered together as a partnership between members, your elected leadership, and your staff that we have been able to achieve a contract that I think uh, is truly, as President Drescher would say, seminal, is unprecedented and is groundbreaking. That doesn't mean that um, everything about that contract is perfect. It doesn't mean that there are not things for us to improve upon in future rounds of bargaining. That is the nature of collective bargaining. Um, and one of the things that I think you'll see as a theme in the presentation we're about to make is the fact that in this negotiation, we have built structures where nothing ever existed before. And that's always the hardest part. And I've seen that in the many other uh, collective bargaining agreements I've negotiated uh, for SAG-AFTRA, where once you fight and build that structure, that gives you a strategic positioning to advance that contract cycle after cycle thereafter. And it creates the kind of leverage and power that let us make um, the gains that our members deserve, not just this round, but in future rounds of bargaining as well. Um, before I just start the presentation, I want to just take one extra moment to acknowledge your extraordinary local staff here in New York, led by your local executive director, Rebecca Damon. They supported you. They supported you in very special ways, and this whole process couldn't have happened without them. So thank you so much to everyone from our New York team. Really, really appreciate you. So we're going to launch into the presentation, and Ray and I are going to sort of uh, take turns doing parts of it so that you don't have to listen to just one or the other of us for this entire time. And we'll go you know, as quickly as we reasonably can so that we maximize question time, but we do want everyone to have full information about what the contract's all about. So let's start out with the value of the contract, or the valuation of the contract. Um, it's not necessarily the single most important factor, but it is a huge factor because it reflects what we accomplished in terms of economic gains in this contract, and it is unprecedented. For the first time uh, in, in the industry's history, a collective bargaining agreement exceeds $1 billion in gains during the contract term, in this case during a 31 and a half month term, and that comprises new compensation and uh, increased benefit plan funding, um, specifically $697.6 .6 million in wages and residuals, and additional wages and additional residuals, and $317.2 million in the form of additional contributions to the SAG After Health Plan, the SAG Producers Pension Plan, and the After Retirement Fund, which I think we can all agree, all of those benefit plans can, can, can benefit significantly from having that kind of uh, influx of additional contributions and funding. So next, let's talk about minimums. Uh, this is really an important accomplishment in this contract, and sometimes I worry that it's overshadowed by the technical conversation that we have about AI, which is obviously a hugely important conversation, but no one has broken the so-called industry pattern on minimum increases in decades in this industry. No union has been able to do that until now. And we have broken that pattern, and as you can see here, in the first year of this contract, there will be two increases, a two-step increase. First of all, a 7% general wage increase that took effect on the 9th of November, and an additional 4% increase that takes effect on July 1st of next year for a compounded first-year increase of 11.28%. And that is an amount that our economists have told us is sufficient to ensure that we are remedying, remedying that is, the impact of inflation that's hammered our members over the last couple of years in terms of uh, not allowing the advances and increases in our minimums to keep up. And so that accomplishes that. There's an additional increase, by the way, of 3.5% on July 1st of 2025. And I just want to note, this is really important beyond just our union. So when you talk to your friends who are in IATSE or the Teamsters or AFM, for example, three unions that have their own negotiations with the AMPTP in this coming year, 
those unions and no other union after them will ever have to believe the idea that the pattern can't be broken. Those unions now know and can say back to the AMPTP across the table that they can negotiate for minimum increases that are suitable for their members and the circumstances they, their members find themselves in. So this is the kind of accomplishment that is gonna have repercussions far outside the scope of even our contract, and frankly, the CEOs acknowledge that to us in some of our discussions with them. So um, I think that's something that we should all be justifiably proud of, is that, that breaking of the industry pattern. So I know that AI is something that everybody wants to talk about because it's, a, it's a, certainly been a hot topic since this agreement um, uh, was reached. And wanna just take a moment to talk a little bit about the AI provisions just right up front now. Um, but first of all, let's just, let's just start by acknowledging a few things about AI provisions. Number one, the current contract, the, the, the contract we were renegotiating, has no provisions that relate to AI. So we were working from a blank page. Uh, if we were continuing to operate under the terms of the old contract, there is nothing prohibiting or restricting the use of AI technology, whether it's generative AI or whether it's just digital replication. Uh, by these companies. So it was incredibly important for us from the very beginning to make sure that we put those kinds of protections in place. Number two, when we started out our um, strategizing for how we were gonna deal with AI, and it's even before this contract, it's a broader issue relating to AI, we had to acknowledge a fundamental fact, which is we cannot stop the technology of AI from happening. As much as we might want to, as much as there, I'm sure, are plenty of people in this room and probably at this dais as well who would like to see AI technology paused, that's not going to happen. That's not realistic. We don't have the power to do that any more, any more than our uh, predecessors in this union had the power to stop the advent of television or the Industrial Revolution or the invention of the printing press or the advent of the Internet. Um, we had to make a choice, we had to make a strategic choice. Do we wanna use our bargaining leverage to try and fight this technology and prevent it from happening in a doomed effort and to tilt at those windmills? Or do we wanna use our power and leverage to channel the way that AI would be implemented in this industry to make sure it's done in a manner that is not harmful to our members and lifts them up rather than tearing them down? And so our strategic choice was to do the latter of those two things and to focus on putting in guardrails and limitations on the industry's use of AI so that our members would be protected. And as we move forward in this industry, we would have those protections already in place before the industry starts to even implement those technologies in any kind of broad-based way. And so that's what we did in this negotiation. So what did that translate into? That, you know, in the discussions with the negotiating committee and all our preparations for this negotiation, that really is framed in two specific philo philosophies. Number one, informed consent, and number two, fair compensation. And the reason we had to come up with these sort of philosophical approaches is because we know the technology will evolve, and we need to enshrine restrictions and principles in this agreement that survive the evolution of the technology. So the first principle was, a performer's image, voice, likeness, performance cannot be used by an AI system without them having informed consent about what that intended use would be and having every right to say no to that if they don't want to agree to that. Put the power in the hands of our members to decide what it is that they do and do not agree to do. Number, number two is fair compensation, to make sure that when our members do agree to allow the use of their image, voice, likeness, or performance as part of an AI system, that the members have the right to receive fair compensation for that, and where appropriate, to establish minimums or to ensure that there is a bargaining right for that compensation. And so that's what we've done, and as we go through the, the specific provisions, you'll see that's precisely uh, what is part of this agreement. The third thing that I just want to make sure is really clear about this agreement is we also wanted to make sure that producers couldn't abuse their power by creating a digital replica of you or taking your image, voice, likeness, or performance, even with your consent, and then keeping it and using it in the future without having to come back to you and get your consent for that future use. This contract protects against that happening. And that's so important because, thanks. Yeah.
And that's so important that if you remember back to that press conference when we started the strike, one of the things that we specifically talked about was a proposal the producers had made to do the opposite of that with background actors, where they had proposed that once a background actor worked for them for a day and had a digital replica created, that they could use that in the future for any project without further consent or compensation. Our negotiating committee said an absolute no to that, and that is not in this agreement, and they are not allowed to do that, and not only are they not allowed to do it for background actors, they're not allowed to do it for principal performers either. So let's go in, let's delve into the details. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to put those things out at, at the beginning. So digital replication, this is one of the uses that, the, of AI that has actually already occurred. And we spend a lot of time and energy on putting guardrails around digital replication because we know this is something that can actually happen. In the immediate term, in the term of this contract, there will be some amount of digital replication done, and that's why we needed to protect it, first of all. So there is a concept of an employment-based digital replica in this agreement. That is the concept where a producer engages you to work on a project, a picture, a series, whatever, and they say to you, we want to make a digital replica as part of your being hired on this project. So there are specific rules around that that include, first of all, no more surprises. They cannot have you show up on set, like one of our negotiating committee members has told us happened to her, um, and show up on set without any warning and be told, um, we are gonna need to do a scan of you today for the creation of a digital replica. That cannot happen. There has to be at least 48 hours notice of any intention to actually conduct that type of scan. Second of all, they cannot do it without clear and conspicuous and informed consent not only for the creation of the scan, but also for the intended use of a digital replica. And that means it can't be buried in a contract somewhere, it can't be you know, one line on page 12 of the contract that says, I give you my consent to create a digital replica and use it however you want in perpetuity throughout the universe, you know, et cetera. That cannot happen, that's prohibited. Instead, it has to be clear and conspicuous, your attention has to be drawn to it on a separate page or by an initialing requirement, et cetera. And even more importantly than that, it has to contain specific, reasonably specific details about the intended use of the replica. And without that information, they cannot go forward with it. The third thing is that any kind of time that you spend in the creation of a digital replica is considered work time, and that means you get paid for it, either as part of your regular work day, or if they have to keep you later, or have you come in earlier, or do it on a different day, then you're paid accordingly for that time. Also, any use that's then made of the digital replica has to be paid to you as though you had, <coughs> excuse me, as though you'd done that work in person. So, they can't say, okay, we're gonna hire you for a week or two and create a digital replica and then have your digital replica do the rest of this project and not pay you for it. They have to pay you just as though you worked on those additional days of the project, even though they might be using your digital replica and even though on those days you could go and work other jobs potentially and actually supplement that way. <laughs> And another really, really important thing, and if you only take one thing away <clears throat> from this AI conversation, I wanna make sure you take this, this away, because there is no concept in this contract of them creating a digital replica of you and just keeping it and using it in the future without your consent. That cannot happen under this contract. If they make a digital replica of you and they wanna use it for any subsequent project at any time, they have to come back to you <clears throat> they have to get your informed consent with that specific, reasonably specific detailed information about the use. And they cannot do it at the time of initial employment. So they have to come back to you at the time of use and that's when they have to negotiate with you. And I know there are some uh, members in this uh, room who work the commercials contract. So I just wanna highlight a, a concept for you that's similar. When you work the commercials contract and you, you, know, you're, you have a commercial going and that commercial nears the end of its maximum period of use, and the company wants to continue using it, what happens? They have to come back to you, right? And they have to renegotiate for your use. And what happens to, for many people is, this gives you a lot of extra leverage and you can maybe negotiate for double scale or maybe even triple scale for that continued use because now you're in the driver's seat because they couldn't get that at the time of initial employment. Same concept here, they cannot get your consent for the future use of your digital replica at the time of initial employment, unless it's part of a multi-picture deal that you're making all at once right then. 
If it's not that, they have to come back to you at a time in the future. You can decide yes or no at that time, whatever works for you. If in your life you've decided you don't want that, you can just say no. If you do want that, you can say yes, and you can say, but well, here's what it's gonna take to get my, uh, my agreement to that. And so that puts you in a position of power and control with respect to the future use of your digital replica. So <clears throat> one other thing that I think we should note and, and is particularly um, an accomplishment, I think, in this agreement is the same consent requirements apply for independently created digital replicas. And what does that mean? So an independently created digital replica is one that is not part of an employment relationship under this contract. It's created either by you. Um, you might have heard some performers are out there already contemplating creating their own digital replicas of themselves and then ho holding the rights in that and then just licensing it out for certain uses. It could be in the future you partner with a third party company to do exactly that. But whatever that method is, the studio or streamer might be licensing your replica from you or this company rather than employing you to come in and have it created. Now, this was a challenge because under this contract, normally we can only, we're only entitled to demand as a mandatory subject of bargaining to negotiate over things that are terms and conditions of employment. But because of the unity and solidarity all of you showed on the picket lines and throughout this negotiation, we were able to get these companies to voluntarily agree to provide the same informed consent requirements even when that replica is obtained from you or from some other source as a third party before it can be incorporated into any project they make. So they will have to come back to you with the reasonably specific details of the intended use and get your consent. So that is an extra protection for all of our members against the misuse of a digital replica. And on top of that, any compensation that's negotiated, you will get benefit plan contributions. You'll get P&H contributions on, those, on that compensation. So that is, I think, a really valuable uh, gain in this contract. Some other important parts on the, of the AI provisions. There's a provision regarding digital alteration. The concept behind this provision was that the companies wanted us to agree, and ultimately we did agree, that things they can do now using traditional editing techniques, CGI, and VFX, they should be able to continue to do in the future, even if they use an AI tool to do the same thing. And so that is the essence of this provision. And you'll see that in this provision, there is a requirement that if they do anything beyond that, they have to come back with that same clear and conspicuous informed consent. So they can't use the digital alterations provision to create new scenes, to have, you know, to do anything that would have been part of what we just talked about in terms of creating a digital replica and getting your consent. That all is still covered by those requirements. The exceptions to that are things that are part of traditional sort of editing VFX CGI. So things like um, making adjustments to the um, soundtrack to fix glitches, things like um, making cosmetic adjustments, things like uh, cutting words to meet ratings requirements. Um, and there's a list which you can find in the summary that's found at the website that Fran mentioned in the video, which is sagafter.org slash contracts 2023. Um, I do want to note that one thing we should highlight, one thing that is different than traditional um, post-production editing and so forth, is a provision that allows for lip, face, or body movement or voice uh, to be adjusted for translation to foreign language. And I want to just give you some insight into what we're talking about here. Um, one example of this is there's a company called Flawless, which we've highlighted a few times in other, in other contexts, that uses this AI technology to, to, instead of the traditional way, which is adjusting the script in the translation so that the words match the mouth movements as much as possible, instead keeping the script intact, not changing the content of the script, and instead adjusting the mouth movements of the actor um, on screen to match the dub. I want to emphasize this is still dubbing work done with voiceover actors. This is not synthetic voices or anything like that. This is about making the quality of the resulting um, dubbed version better and more consistent with the original vision of the director and the script. So that's what that is about and that is the use and we're really happy that Flawless as one example have committed to the use of voice actors and not synthetic voices going forward for that technology.
Um, next, let's talk about generative AI. I mean, this is one of the areas that I think um, people have got people really concerned or people are very concerned about it because it is such a hot topic and uh, particularly people who may have experimented with large language models like ChatGPT or maybe you've used Midjourney or Dali or other tools are concerned about what this means for our industry. So first of all, let me tell you that we do have a broad protective definition of generative AI included in this agreement um, and, and that's an important starting point here. Second of all, um, with generative AI, this is another area similar to the independently created digital replicas where there was a question about whether this was going to be something we could strike over and bargain over in this contract because of a question about the employment relationship. Because what we're talking about um, primarily in generative AI is the creation of synthetic fake performers, right? And just so we're all clear, the difference between a synthetic fake performer and a digital replica is a digital replica is a recreation of a one specific real person who exists. So a digital replica of Linda would be a digital replica of Linda. A synthetic fake performer would be using a generative AI tool to bring in an unknown, untold number of training inputs into the system to generate a fake performer output that is not any real person in real life, but is created by this system based on all of this data that's been put in that has trained the system. And so that, that's a very different thing than creating a replica of a performer who's working in a project and using it to do reshoots or making some minor adjustment with it. This is about creating a, an entirely fake person. So nonetheless, we were able to achieve some really important protections in this negotiation. Again, thanks to the solidarity and unity of our members and the power of the strike we were able to achieve a requirement that any uh, signatory company notify the union before they create any synthetic fake performer using generative AI, and that they have to bargain with us over compensation or consideration for any such use. So why is that important? Well, the first thing we really wanted and we were not able to achieve in this negotiation was we would have liked to have a right of consent over whether they could do it at all. Um, that was a hotly fought issue throughout this entire negotiation from day one, June 7th, up until day 118 of the strike. Um, but the fact is the companies are too afraid of letting competitors like Google and YouTube do this and tying their hands behind their back. So they would not give the union or agree to the union having a right of consent over whether they can do it. But what we were able to achieve, and I think it, it brings us tremendous level of protection, is notice of any intent to do it and an obligation on their part to bargain with us over the economics of doing that. And I think that's really important because one of the things that we can do with that requirement is we can negotiate to make sure that synthetic fake performers are not an economic benefit to the employer. We can negotiate to take away any economic advantage to doing it. And as we know, these companies are highly motivated by money uh, and by economics. And so if we can make it not to their economic benefit to try and use synthetic fakes, then they won't try to use synthetic fakes. I also want to note that we were able to achieve on the very last day of this negotiation an individual performer consent right when any individual performer's recognizable facial feature is used as part of a generative AI system to create an output, even if the resulting output doesn't look like them, if a recognizable feature of them like uh, Julia Roberts smile, for example, would be one example of that. If that is part of that output, then that can trigger a requirement or does trigger a requirement if the generative AI system is prompted with, with her name to go back to her and to negotiate individual consent before that use can be made. And while that's not a perfect solution to this issue, it is an important stepping stone towards further breakthroughs here. The other thing I just want to point out and I think it's important to note is we are really ahead of the curve on generative AI and synthetic fakes because right now this is not something that is happening. Digital replication, yes, that's happening now. If you saw you know, Carrie Fisher's final performance in Star Wars or if you saw Paul Walker in, um, in Fast and the Furious after his, his untimely passing, then you know that these types of replications already exist and have already been used. But synthetic fakes is something that is potentially coming down the road and we're looking around the bend to try and be out, and, out ahead of it. And I think it's really important to note that because even the most advanced companies doing um, generative AI technology, such as one example that we've used, which is a company called Metaphysic, um, they, what they are doing is using AI technology to 
alter the image of performers, not to recreate entire performances. So if you think about, some of you are probably familiar with the deep fake of Tom Cruise. That's not a synthetic fake, right? Because there's an actual actor there whose appearance is being modified to look like Tom Cruise. It's not an synthet entirely synthetically generated performance. So something like that falls into the realm of digital replication, not into the realm of synthetic fakes. And is, so I think it's just important to note that this technology is coming, but it's not here yet, and we're out ahead of it, looking to direct its implementation in a way that doesn't take away jobs or consent rights from our members. Lastly on this slide, um, I will just note, we also have an agreement with the companies that they will meet with us twice a year, every year, to discuss what they're doing in generative AI so we can keep ahead of that. And I promise you we will use that information to prepare for our next round of bargaining, which I think will be very helpful because we've gone from a blank page to what will be, I think, 15 or 16 pages of detailed protections and regulations. And those will need to continue to evolve, but they will evolve based on the directions these companies are taking and the places that we need to install these guardrails. And so these meetings will really help us do that. Also, these meetings will give us an opportunity, and it's specifically agreed as part of this, to help make sure that as generative AI systems are trained, that we avoid encoding past bias into those systems. Because when systems are trained on things that have happened in the past, these computers, the computer systems, the algorithms, just replicate what they have seen. So we, if we want to see a world that's moving in a direction of more inclusion, of more equity, we can't just train systems on the past and not adjust for that. And so the companies have agreed to have that as a specific topic of those meetings to help make sure that any creation of generative AI systems mitigates those past biases and they don't continue on into the future. So now let's talk about background actors and AI. So let me just tell you, if you're a background actor or someone who does background work, I am very pleased to assure you there are incredibly strong protections for background actors in this contract. First of all, all the same rights we talked about with respect to principal performers in terms of advance notice, informed consent, all apply to background actors as well. In addition to that, there's a specific provision that requires that if a digital replica of a background actor is created and then used in another way, like let's say in another contract or, or in any other way, they will have to be compensated for that in accordance with that, those contractual terms, including if that is in a manner of a principal employment that they be compensated accordingly, including benefit plan contributions and residuals. In addition to that, um, any kind of use of a, uh, of a, a background actor's digital replica requires the engagement of that background actor under the contract. And this, I think, leads to one of the most important pieces. For background work under the coverage limits, within the numbers, the companies are obligated to hire actual background actors to fill those roles. They cannot fill those slots with digital replicas. So that means every job that would have been filled with a, ba a human background actor will continue to be filled with a human background actor under our contract. In addition to that, if they do uh, get your consent and create a digital replica of you as part of that job and then use it on another day, let's say on a day when they hire other people to fill those covered numbers, they will have to compensate you for that use because there's a provision that they cannot evade the engagement of a background actor by use of a digital replica. And so what that means is if that happens, there will actually be more covered work for background actors because those digital replicas will also be paid under the contract you will be paid for that use, including uh, pension and health contributions. So that will help you as well gain eligibility. And as far as digital alteration of background actors goes, all the same rules apply as apply to principles with one special additional provision that I think you'll probably appreciate, which is if the companies use digital alteration of lip or mouth movements to make it look like a background actor spoke a line that they didn't actually speak, that background actor will be entitled to an upgrade to principal and payment of all that compensation. So now, finally, you get to stop listening to me for a minute. I'm going to hand the reins over to Ray, and he's going to talk about high budget SVOD and the streaming bonus program. Great. 
So one of the uh, objectives that we went into this negotiation with uh, was to address some of the challenges to our members' economics that have been brought about by the shift to streaming. Uh, streaming shows, as we know, they have shorter seasons, uh, fewer episodes in a season, fewer seasons of the show, and in various ways, you know, what our members have come to expect from their work have been undercut by the shift to streaming. So in addition to uh, very substantial improvements to the residual formula that we'll get to later, we were looking for an alternate source of revenue uh, for streaming programs, uh, and this is what we got. So the high budget SVOD streaming bonus is going to apply to performers uh, working on made for high budget SVOD, whether it's a season of a series, a mini series, or a long form picture, um, and uh, it will be paid if you hit a certain success metric. Uh, essentially, the success metric is that 20% of the, subs the domestic subscribers to the streaming service that the program is made for uh, have to watch the program within the first 90 days of an exhibition year. And we did generate data, we got some information, the, the list of shows itself is confidential, we can't share it, but we did uh, obtain what shows would have hit this metric in 2022, and our economists have been able to use that to project that this is gonna generate on the order of $40 million a year of additional compensation to members in the area of streaming. <clears throat> So uh, the way that money is going to be divided up, 75% of it, plus the applicable pension and health, or, or yeah, or re retirement and health uh, contributions, uh, will go to the performers who were in the program that hit the success metric. So they're going to get 75% of that money. 25% of the money is going to go into a streaming bonus distribution fund, so that it can be spread more broadly and benefit more performers. Uh, than uh, only those who are in those most successful programs. And by the way, when I say 75%, it's 75% of the applicable residual that would apply for that exhibition year. So it's the equivalent for those performers of getting 175% residual for that show. And yeah, we can <laughs> applaud for that. And then the other 25% goes into this bonus distribution fund. Uh, that fund is going to have trustees from the AMPTP, and it's going to have trustees from the union. And together, they will develop a set of distribution guidelines. Um, the money does need the money paid by a particular producer does need to go to people who are on their shows. Uh, but within that, there will be discretion to set exactly how the distribution will work. Uh, and that money is then going to be distributed by the fund directly to members, again, so that we can um, achieve the objective of really more broadly addressing the economic challenges that streaming has brought to our members. So that's the uh, distribution fund, and I'll go on to the next slide. Uh, we did a lot in this negotiation to address the advanced payment of residuals. The advance payment of residuals is a problem because people confuse the advance paid residual money with their initial compensation. It's often not clear what's what when you make your deal and you're getting paid. And so performers think, oh, I got my quote, I, my agent achieved my quote for me, when really they didn't. Uh, they achieved less than your quote in initial compensation and the difference being made up by the prepayment of a residual. And those uh, members are understandably then quite frustrated when the program goes into exhibition and it comes time for residuals checks to show up and lo and behold, there's no residuals checks because you were actually prepaid that money. It just looked like initial comp money when you got it. And so uh, we did several things in this negotiation to try to resolve that problem. The first is that the advance pay now has to be set out in a completely separate rider where it will be spelled out in numbers how much of your compensation is initial comp and how much of your compensation is the prepayment of a residual, so there will be added clarity that way. In addition to that, the, the advance paid residual check, the check itself, 
is going to be processed by the union just like a residual check. So when you get it, it will look like a residuals check rather than like an initial compensation check, and that will add another level of clarity for members about what's what in terms of the money that they're getting. Um, there is an exception if you use direct deposit. They can deposit all the money at once, but they do have to provide you with better reporting. So when they make that deposit, they're going to have to send reporting to you along with the deposit that makes it clear what of this money that just got deposited into your account is initial comp, and what is the advance payment of a residual. Yes. Um, in addition to all of that, we did two things to limit and constrain uh, how much of your compensation can be used as the prepayment of a residual. One of them is on the slide. Um, there is a new limitation that for those performers who are guaranteed less than $75,000 per week or per episode, only up to 15% of your compensation can be used for the advance payment of a residual. So it sets a limit on how much of your comp can be advance pay. And it's not on the slide, but the current system that we have for regulating this was improved. And that current system is there is a series of threshold numbers, depending on whether you're on a half hour, hour, other type of show. And it's only money that's in addition to the threshold that can be used for the advance payment of residuals. So you have to get up to that threshold number in just initial comp before they can start paying anything to you that is the prepayment of a residual. And all those numbers went up uh, in the contract in this term. So two different ways in which we constrain that amount. I mentioned earlier that in addition to the high budget SVOD streaming bonus, which is a completely separate source of additional money, there were very substantial improvements made in this cycle to the formula, to the residual formula that applies to the continued exhibition of a program made for a high budget subscription video on demand service um, on the platform for which it was made, um, the high budget SVOD residual. So just to sort of baseline it for you, the way this residual works is it starts with what you got paid for the job. In contract terms, that's total actual compensation, TAC, you'll see it on the slide. What you got paid for the job is then subjected to a cap. Um, and then that capped number is multiplied by a percentage that declines with each year. So newer programs will generate higher residuals than older programs. Uh, once you multiply that capped compensation by the exhibition year percentage, you then adjust that number either upward or downward based on the size of the platform. So a really big platform like Netflix is going to be in the 150% tier, so that your residual will go up if it's a Netflix show. If it's a really small platform, it can go down to 20% of the number uh, under the current formula. And that, that is basically how the residual is constructed. So I'm explaining that to explain the elements of how it was improved. So I mentioned you take the total actual compensation, you subject it to a cap. All of those caps went up by 2.5%. So more of your compensation money comes into the front end of the, of the formula. That then gets multiplied by the exhibition year percentage. For years 8 through 12, that exhibition year percentage also went up. So for programs that have been on the, on the platform longer, those residuals will be higher because those exhibition year percentages went up. And then I mentioned that you take that number and you adjust it either upward or downward based on the size of the platform. How many subscribers does the platform have? And there are five tiers from biggest to smallest the two lowest tiers have been eliminated. So the 20% tier and the 40% tier are gone, and the lowest your residual can be now is 65% of the number. Six, the 65% tier is now gonna be the smallest subscriber tier. So that's yet another way in which the residual improves. So every element of the domestic residual formula has gone up and improved. The biggest, yeah, you can see. More money is always worth clapping for. 
The actual biggest change in the formula, though, comes from how your foreign SVOD residual gets calculated. And this is the residual that gets paid for the availability on a, on a related and affiliated foreign platform. So if it's a Netflix show, this is what you get paid for the availability on Netflix UK or Netflix wherever. Um, right now, the way that residual is calculated is it's just 35% of your domestic residual. So you just take, do all the calculations I just described and you take 35% of that number, that's the foreign residual. There's now going to be a completely separate calculation for the foreign residual. It's going to be the same total actual compensation to a ceiling multiplied by the same exhibition year percentage as the domestic residual. Th there's going to be, however, a new set of foreign subscriber tiers. So the same way you would adjust the residual up or down if it's on a big domestic platform versus a small domestic platform, you're going to do the same thing based on the size of the foreign platform, the affiliated foreign platform. Uh, the result of changing the way this is done is going to be that you're gonna get a residual that is at least 47% of your domestic residual, but can be up to 90% of your domestic residual. So that's gonna be a big improvement from the 35% we're using now. Two new, two additional, or actually three additional improvements to this uh, that we need to talk to you about. The first is the grandfathering removal. So this, this high budget SVOD formula first went into the contract in 2014, and it has been successively improved in every cycle since then. But for older shows that commenced under an older formula, the way residuals typically work is whatever the formula that's in place when you do the work, that follows that episode or that movie forever. It never, it never changes. It's locked at the time of production, whatever the residual formula is. We've made an exception to that in this case, and we've said that for new seasons of any existing series that is still working under an older formula, the older formula goes away, and the performers on that new season of the series are gonna get the full benefit of the new improved SVOD formula. Uh, there is also a provision in the current contract. I mean, there's a little bargaining history behind it that I won't get into, but for those programs that, are, that were on the 20% tier and the 40% tier, uh, they could, for series regulars, they could credit 35% of minimum um, to other things, uh, whether it's overtime or a, or a force call or residuals even, uh, could be, they could take 35% of minimum and credit it against those things that would be due to you otherwise and not pay them to you if they come within the 35% and that's gone. We're getting rid of that 35% crediting. And finally, um, the last element of these many improvements has to do with transparency and reporting obligations. One of the challenges that we have had in the world of streaming is that streaming has been a black box. Unlike, say, television, where you have a Nielsen rating and it's very transparent to everyone, which are the most successful shows and which are the shows that are on the bubble and which are the shows that are probably gonna get cut, that's never existed for streaming. It's just been a mystery because they have been so tight with that information that, that even some of the top agents in Hollywood have been unable to get at that data. Um, that's now gonna change too. And in fact, we are gonna get uh, viewership information reported to us for every made for streaming show that is represented by these companies. That's an, that's an even bigger deal than it seems like because you know all along what these companies have said is they're not us, we're not the streamers. The streamers, those are separate companies. The companies you're bargaining with are the producers and we can't make the streamers give you any information at all. And you know this was a fight that the Writers Guild had, it's a fight that we had. There was a moment, actually more than once uh, in the bargaining room, once with the full AMPTP and another time with the CEOs where we literally had to say to them, what are you talking about? This is a ridiculous shell game and it doesn't fool us for a second. And you know, are you saying that these four CEOs sitting here are not the CEOs of these streaming companies as well? And it was just <laughs> silence. It was just like, 
okay, let's just move on. So, you know, I think that finally, this is another sort of wall we've broken through, which is finally there is an acknowledgement that they can get the streamers to do things because they are the streamers and the streamers are them. And so <laughs> that's gonna start with transparency, but I don't think it's gonna end there. Yes, one less bit of phony baloney to deal with. <laughs> All right, well, on to some additional residuals changes. These are areas, um, they're, they're comparatively minor, but areas where we did agree to producer proposals. Uh, the first has to do with the promotional launch provision. So for a new primetime series, um, they can rerun the first three episodes without paying residuals to the series regulars. Everybody else has to get their residuals, but the series regulars, if they rerun an episode within a certain window of time, I think it's two months that they have to do it, then uh, they don't have to pay the series regulars for the first three, and that's been modified so that it's any three episodes and not the first three episodes necessarily. Um, the second change has to do with a limited theatrical release provision that we have in the agreement that, you know, provided the theatrical release doesn't go beyond, I think it's nine days, um, that uh, they can pay instead of the fixed residual, and we're talking here really the theatrical release of a television program. Uh, so there's a, a provision in the television agreement, section 19, that would otherwise call for a fixed residual. Um, they can, under this provision, pay a distributor's gross receipts or a revenue-based residual. 9% of their revenue is the residual in this case that gets shared to the cast. And that has just been slightly expanded to include now basically feature-length content made for a high-budget SVOD platform. So if it's a high-budget SVOD picture, 66 minutes or longer, it is, it's now within the th limited theatrical release provision. There was a modification to the theatrical promotional exhibitions provision where uh, provided the producer is not charging any fee for admission and not making any money, if they do a purely promotional theatrical release, um, then they can do that without payment. Um, it has been the case up until now that they could only do that with respect to television programs if the program had not yet aired its final episode and that restriction has been removed. Um, there was also an increase to the foreign overage thresholds by 3%. This impacts how residuals are paid for foreign free television. That formula starts out as a fixed residual, so it starts out at 35% of total applicable minimum, what you would have made at scale, whether or not you worked at scale, 35% of that is the first fixed residual that you get. And then if the revenue from those foreign licenses exceeds a certain amount, you start getting paid a distributor's gross receipts or a revenue-based residual on top of that, and it's those amounts that have to be exceeded that went up by 3%. Finally, we have provisions in our contract for new media inspections. Uh, right now, it provides for semi-annual new media inspections. Frankly, they haven't been happening semi-annually, so we did agree they could happen annually and uh, they could happen on, th um, we, it, it's required now to give them 30 days notice instead of 10 days notice. So uh, those were the changes on this slide. Um, we had a lot of changes in this cycle to the casting process. Casting, yeah. <laughs> Uh, casting and especially self-tapes in the wages and working conditions process for this contract were among the hottest burning issues that members, even members who like self-tapes, some do, some don't, but even the members that like self-tapes were coming into the w, w process angry about how abusive the process was and how totally unregulated it was. So we have implemented uh, many new regulations on the self-tape process. The first having to do with turnaround time. Um, so once you get the self-tape audition request, you have to have at least 48 hours, excluding weekends and holidays, so you don't have to spend your weekend self-taping um, to, to deliver that submission back to the producer. <laughs> and, and that's expanded to 72 hours for minor performers. Um, there's a limit as well to how much you can be asked to perform for a self-tape of eight pages for a first self-tape and 12 for a second or subsequent self-tape. Um, you may not be required to memorize. You have to be allowed to hold your sides or use a prompter. Uh, 
Uh, there is increased transparency on whether the role is cast. You have to ask, but, but there is a requirement that the producer endeavor to respond to you, the casting endeavor to respond to you about whether the role has been cast. <clears throat> you may not be required to use any paid editing software or any specific equipment in connection with a self-tape. Uh, there is now a, limit, a limitation on the slate. There's a standardized slate that's provided for in the contract, so it's going to be the same items of information that you can be asked for every slate. Um, you may not be asked to be nude on a self-tape or to be in anything more revealing than a swimsuit you would wear at a public pool. You may not be asked to perform a stunt. <laughs> Good idea, right? Uh, if you are a dancer uh, doing a self-tape, they have to provide you with the music, they have to provide you with the choreography, the amount that they can ask you to do is limited to four eight-beat counts, it has to be performable in an eight-foot by eight-foot space, and it's, yeah, it's, it's solos only, so you could not be asked to go recruit your friends to be in a partner dance or a multi-person dance. Uh, your self-tape has to be stored securely and maintained so that only people with a legitimate business purpose in doing so can access the self-tape. If in the future they want to use your self-tape in some public-facing way, they have to go get your consent for that at the time. They can't make it a condition of submitting the self-tape. They can't get your consent at the time they're asking for it. Later, when they want to do it, they have to come back and get your consent for that. And um, uh, for those performers that maybe don't prefer self-tapes as their most preferred option for auditioning, they have to provide either a virtual or a live in-person auditioning opportunity for members. Those are gonna be provided on a first come, first serve basis. You'll sign up for them, but they have to create enough opportunity for that, a reasonable opportunity for that, so that those members that prefer not to self-tape are gonna have another option. Uh, further on the casting process, uh, we also have regulations on virtual interviews and auditions. Um, it's many of the same things I just talked about. You have to ask, but they have to endeavor to respond to you on whether the role has been cast. Uh, no paid meeting sites, editing software, or specific equipment. Uh, if they ask you to memorize, then they trigger the payment provisions for that that already exist in our schedules. Uh, they cannot ask you to be nude or wearing anything more revealing than the swimsuit you would wear to a public pool. No stunts. For dancers, same deal. They have to provide you the music, the choreography, four eight-beat counts, an eight, it performable in an eight-by-eight eight space and solos only. They have to securely store it if they decide to uh, record it. And they have to get your consent for any public use at the time of use, just like with a self-tape. Um, how will disputes under this language get resolved? This was actually a major bone of contention over the course of the negotiation. The producers did not want to make this subject to our grievance and arbitration provisions. They wanted to do this all on the honor system. <laughs> I, I get the same reaction to that line every time. <laughs> Wonder why. Um, obviously, we didn't agree to that. Uh, we did agree that there would be a six-month moratorium on claims, uh, during which we have been encouraged to bring forward any violations that we find to the AMPTP. So we encourage you in turn to bring to us any violations you see. The idea is that you're gonna use this as ramp up time so that by the end of that six month period, they'll be fully in compliance and we won't have any more claims. But if we do, um, then those claims will first be referred to a conciliation committee where we'll try to resolve it. And if it cannot be resolved, then it will go to arbitration and we'll be able to enforce this like other contract language. Um, a new regulation is actually kind of a big deal on uh, general casting calls, which is that you cannot be charged a fee or, give it, or given preferential treatment or less preferential treatment on the basis of whether you've paid a fee. So um, whether it's Actors Access or any of the other services that exist for this, you have to be able to access the audition materials for free. You have to be able to submit your self-tape for free. 
And, and they cannot discriminate against you if you chose the free option. So there's actually regulations there in the language about how the information appears to the casting director. They can't order it based on whether you've paid a fee or give you any other preferential treatment. Uh, so that uh, those members, that they just, they will, I'm sure they will still offer their subscription option and their premium option, but if that's not a value to you, you don't have to pay it and you'll be treated just like any other performer. Uh, the AMPTP has agreed to meet with us to discuss payment discrepancies in different geographic markets. Uh, there is a, a view, especially uh, from your fellow members in uh, the locals outside of Los Angeles and New York, that there, the, when roles are posted in those markets, they're posted with lower billing and paid at less money, and they're understandably quite upset about that. So we're going to bring those concerns to the AMPTP during the term. And we now have language uh, that specifically requires accommodations in the casting process for performers with disabilities, seniors, and minors. And Duncan, we're back to you. Yeah, it's back to me, but I just I realized that, I ne that we neglected to give you a proper introduction, Ray. So it, for now, belatedly, Ray Rodriguez, our chief contracts officer, also my co-lead negotiator on this contract. A lot of you probably know him because he used to be based in New York. A lot of you probably know him because he used to be based in New York, and he is an extraordinary negotiator. And we're, you forgot we're really former happy. deputy general counsel in the New York office. Of well, I didn't forget. I just, I, I vividly remember. But, uh, but yes, yes, that's true. That's a while ago. Um, so anyway, turning back to pension and health, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the overall increase in benefit plan contributions. Um, part of that comes from increased contributions due to the significant increases in minimums that we talked about and other things under this contract. But a big chunk of that comes from the fact that for the first time in decades, we've been able to increase the pension and health caps on episodic uh, programs. And the result of that is going to generate by itself about $180 million worth of additional contributions into the plans. So that's obviously a really good thing. And it's particularly good for members because sometimes we get additional contributions through contribution rate increases, like an increase in the percentage. But the, the downside to that is those increased rates, uh, increased contribution rate percentages don't generate additional eligibility for members. They generate additional contributions, but it doesn't help you earn eligibility any faster. In this case, because more of your earnings will qualify for contributions, it will be easier to earn eligibility for the health plan and also pension or retirement. So in the case of half hour episodes, that's going up by 67% from $15,000 cap to $25,000 per episode. And for, thank you, yeah. And for hours, it's going up by 43% from $24,500 an episode to $35,000 per episode. So that's really good. Next, let's talk, talk about performance capture. As some of you may know, for more than two decades, we've been fighting to get the companies to officially recognize performance capture as covered work under this agreement. And while over that entire two-decade period, there's been a, a lot of performance capture work that's been covered under the contract unofficially, there's been a lot that hasn't been. And finally, after this, this really long effort, uh, dating back to the original Avatar and before that even, Polar Express and things like that, we finally in this contract have confirmed coverage of performance capture services in both live action, TV and theatrical uh, projects and also for animated theatrical projects. And so that is, a, it's a really <clears throat> momentous accomplishment and it is one example of building those structures and breaking those walls that the companies have held onto for so long. Um, in case you're wondering, the reason television animation isn't mentioned here is because it's a separate negotiation. And uh, for performance capture actors who work in, in that manner, they'll be covered by the terms of whatever the applicable schedule is. So A, B, C, F, G, H, J, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of things that we weren't able to achieve in this round of bargaining that will have to be saved up for a future round of improvements in the next cycle. One of them is the application of consecutive employment to this work. The other is the application of drops and pickups to this work. 
And um, in addition, this does not cover motion capture work. And there's a definition of performance capture and there's a definition of motion capture. And we definitely will be looking in the future to narrow that definition of motion capture so it's not used by the companies for any nefarious shenanigans. But nonetheless, having this recognition is really important. And it's, for example, going to mean that a lot of dance work that hasn't been covered under this contract, that's been done by performance capture and some stunt work, et cetera, is now going to be definitively covered and that's a, a great accomplishment. It also isn't going to cover um, reference capture or reference modeling. And for example, the reference modeling exclusion is something that's a long standing, it's been a long standing jurisdictional understanding is that, that our contract doesn't cover reference modeling. Um, let's move on to Schedule F performers. For those who aren't familiar with this, this is a certain schedule where if you make over a certain amount of money, the companies have more freedom to bargain with you over a variety of different issues under our contracts. And so um, we have, for the first time in a long time, significant increases in the Schedule F, F thresholds. And that will be really beneficial for a number of performers because when companies are motivated to have that freedom to bargain with you, they're motivated to pay you at least the amount that's listed in the schedule. So we expect this to result in real increases for a number of performers who are earning right at the Schedule F threshold. So for theatrical motion pictures, that's gonna go from $65,000 per picture to $80,000 per picture for half hour TV and uh, new media streaming series. That's gonna go from $32,000 to $37,500 per episode. For one hour uh, of those types of projects, it'll go from $32,000 an episode to $45,000 an episode. And for multi-part closed-end pictures or miniseries, it'll go from $40,000 uh, to $47,500 per picture and for more than $4,650 per week to more than $5,150 per week. So when you look at all of that combined, that is a range of increases from 17 to 40% in each of those thresholds uh, in this contract. <laughs> now I'll turn it back over to Ray to talk about series regulars and options. Yes. So um, there are a set of rules in the contract that, that regulate when your option for a subsequent season, if you're a series regular, uh, has to be exercised. And the way the contract stands right now, those regulations don't benefit you if you are make, unless you are making less than $32,000 per episode or per week. So anyone who makes more than that, it's free bargaining on the subject of options and the collectively bargained protections in our agreement don't help you. That number has now gone up significantly to $65,000 per episode or per week for a half hour show or $70,000 per episode or per week for an hour show. So that means there will be many more series regulars that have the benefit of these limitations in our contract on when your option has to be exercised. Um, the way that the options will work now is that it's an 18 month option period but it starts with the commencement of principal photography on your prior season. Right now it's 12 months, but the clock doesn't start ticking until you're done uh, producing the season. Here it's 18 months, but it starts on your first day of work on the prior season, and then there's 18 months from there that they have to exercise your option or not for a subsequent season. Um, that 18 month period, it can be extended up to three times for up to three months per each extension, but for each extension, they have to pay you an additional episode's worth of compensation, and it's non-creditable. So it's new money, it can't be used to credit against anything they might owe you later. They just have to pony up an extra episode of pay for each such extension. Um, once they get to the end of that option period, uh, and they've either exercised your option or they've run out of time and run out of extensions, uh, there is now a regulation on when they have to start you on the next season. And this is very significant for series regulars because one of the main sources of delay under the current system is the period that transpires between when they've exercised your option and then when you actually start working on the next season of the show, that can be a very long period of time and there's nothing in the contract that sets a limit on when that needs to be. So now for the first time, we're gonna have a limit in the agreement that 
they have to start you within three months of exercising the option uh, or at least start paying you. And that's also when the next 18 month period will start. So they're eating into their own option time once they get past this start date, required start date. So they have to start you within three months. Uh, they can extend that once for up to two months for a subsequent season's episodic fee, usually more money in the subsequent season uh, fee. So they have to pay you another fee if they want to use the start date extension. And then they just either have to start paying you and start counting, you know, start counting the next 18 month window uh, once, once they're past that point. So that's a, a new requirement. And finally, in this area, uh, we did something to address the challenges of the series regulars who are uh, at or above the 65 and the 70,000 who don't have any benefit of this collectively bargained language because they can also be, uh, there, there's been very compelling uh, examples of where folks in this situation have lost their health insurance uh, because of being held off of work uh, because they're under option. And so we now have a provision that says that in that circumstance, if you are under an option and you don't have the benefit of the collectively bargained terms in the contract and you lose your health insurance, the producer now has to make a special payment to the health plan in order to extend your health insurance. So in fact, you don't lose it. We also made a very significant improvement to the relocation allowance for series regulars. This is what is paid to a series regular if you have to go to another market. If your show is produced in Atlanta instead of New York and you have to relocate to Atlanta for the show, right now what you would get is $10,000 in a relocation allowance uh, for either two or four seasons, depending on whether it's more or less than 13 episodes in the series order. Um, so uh, you only get $10,000 no matter how long the production period of the show works and it's limited to either two or four seasons. Now the way it's going to work is you're going to get $5,000 a month for up to six months. So if it's a six month production period, it's tripled. And there's no limit on the number of seasons. So it's not two seasons or four seasons, it's all the seasons that you are required to relocate for that work. So based on our, our calculations, on, based on previous employment patterns, this is a 153% effective increase in relocation allowance. Uh, for the first time in the history of the contract, we have actually increased the span money break that applies to series regulars. The span money break is how much money you have to be paid in order for the producer to bargain freely with you on the subject of overall production time. So, you know, your work days is another matter, but when those work days have to happen, what period within which those work days have to happen is span. And um, if you are below the span money break, the, the contract sets a maximum. But if you are above the span money break, it's free bargaining with the producer over how much span uh, they are entitled to. Uh, and the, that money break has gone up from $20,000 to $25,000 per episode, from $100,000 to $125,000 for a series in a combined format and from $150,000 to $190,000 for a 13-episode guarantee. Some improvements for recurring guest stars. Um, right now, our contract allows you to be engaged for an episode with no start date. So they can hire you, they can say, you're gonna work on this episode and tell you absolutely nothing about when the work is gonna happen. And for a recurring guest star engaged across multiple episodes, this is a particular problem because it makes it really difficult for that recurring guest star to get another job when they can make no commitment as to their availability because at any point, their guest star show could call them and say, you gotta come in. So they're not in a position to say to a casting director, I'm available during these dates. It makes it really difficult to find another job. Um, so we have uh, made a, uh, an improvement in that regard. 
uh, in that they must now provide you at least a soft work window as, as to when your work is going to happen. And that is the period of your guaranteed period of employment, however long that is, plus or minus five days on either side, five days on either side. Um, if you get a job in that window, uh, you can go to your uh, guest star employer and uh, tell them that, and they either have to provide you with a firm start date for your work that conflicts with the other job, or they have to move the soft work window, and they have to do that within 24 hours, excluding weekends and holidays. Um, uh, if, however, the soft work window has to be moved because you got another job, uh, and it, it proves impossible to reschedule your work on the episode, then uh, you only need to be paid in that instance for the work you actually did. And if there's a remaining unpaid balance on a guarantee, for example, for that work, they will not have to pay it uh, if the reason is that they had to move the soft work window for your other job and they couldn't reschedule you. Improvements as well to the area of major role. You know, major role minimum is a provision in our contract that if you get certain billing, they have to pay you this enhanced minimum. You have to be guaranteed at least five days for a half hour, eight days for an hour. Um, and uh, this is now being expanded to apply to half hour, an hour, high budget SVOD series. So that's a, a very significant additional body of work and as well to the first season of a pay TV series. So right now, major rule minimum applies to the second and subsequent season of a pay TV series, and now that gap is gonna be closed so that it applies to the first season as well. Um, we've agreed to two new forms of engagement in this contract. Uh, for those of you who have either worked under the Netflix agreement or are familiar with it, this may look familiar. These are uh, taken from the Netflix agreement and they are the modified deal performer and modified guest performer uh, provisions. So uh, for a modified deal performer, you have to be guaranteed at least $21,538 per episode and that amount is gonna go up by the applicable general wage increase. Uh, and in exchange for that, for each episode, the producer gets 10 work days and 30 days of production time. So 10 work days that have to occur within a 30 day window for each episode. Uh, for the modified guest performer, you have to be paid at least $14,000 for the episode and they get eight work days within a 23 day window uh, for each such episode. Uh, if you are engaged that way. Um, there's a technical point here about how the, uh, uh, there are some residuals that are based on total applicable minimum, and the way that'll work is total applicable minimum will be two weeks at scale for a modified deal performer, and one week and three prorated days for a modified guest performer. The way the scheduling of those work days will work is, um, when you're first engaged under one of these forms, they have to tell you what your work days are for the first 30 days if you're a modified deal performer or the first 23 days if you're a modified guest performer. And then moving forward from there, uh, they have to give you at least 14 days advance notice of any work days. And that is to maximize your opportunity to go find other jobs at the same time that you're working under one of these forms of engagement. Um, we made some changes to the consecutive employment rules. So now for a day player on a series or a mini series, there can be up to three drop pickups per episode or part. And that pickup can be a soft pickup date. So a date plus or minus four days on other side, on either side. And you could be picked up as either a daily, a three day or a weekly performer. And for weekly performers, they can have up to two drop pickups per episode or part. Same soft pick update rule applies, and again, you can be picked up as either a daily, a three day, or a weekly. Um, there's a provision we've agreed to with respect to franchise projects, and that is defined as a series of related projects that have common settings, characters, and or storylines. Um, if you are engaged on more than one franchise project at the same time, and there is a day that is a whole day on one franchise project and a work day on the other franchise project, you will get paid for the work day, but not the whole day. 
if there is a day that is a whole day on multiple franchise projects that you are engaged on, then you will be paid for the whole day at the highest applicable rate, but you will not be paid multiple whole days. And finally, um, with respect to the reuse of photography or soundtrack, you can grant consent at the time of engagement on one franchise project to reuse the photography or soundtrack from that project into another franchise project. Um, the exception there being nudity and bloopers where they will still have to get your consent at the time of use. Uh, we made a significant breakthrough in the area of high budget AVOD advertiser supported video on demand. Um, right now, this area in our contract is free bargaining. That means that scale does not apply to this work and there is only a handful of terms from the television agreement that will apply uh, to this type of work. And again, this is work that is on a platform that is free to the consumer. If there is like, the, if you think about like the ad supported tier of Netflix, yes, there are ads on it, but the, but the consumer still has to pay a subscription. So that's SVOD, that is subscription video on demand. It's only AVOD if it's totally free to the consumer. Um, the way the residuals here, well, I for, should first say that now all the terms of the TV agreement are gonna apply, essentially, uh, the exception being there are a handful of terms that will apply based on the 2020 agreement rather than the 2023 agreement. But other than that, all it will look just like TV or working on a high budget SBOT program. Uh, the way residuals will apply here is that your initial comp will cover 26 weeks of exhibition on the platform for which the program was initially made. And then after that, you're gonna get a residual based on 6% of distributors' gross receipts. Uh, if the program moves to a paid new media platform, like a subscription video on demand service, the residual is 3.6% and that's inclusive of PNH. And these are the traditional residuals that apply to that form of exhibition throughout our contract. Uh, if that program goes to traditional media, like goes to television or home video, uh, then the residuals, the traditional residual formulas that apply to every other form of programming that move to those uh, forms of exhibition will apply here as well. All right, before I launch into the next slide, I just want to let you know we're more than halfway there, so good job. I can't see you all that well, but I can see your faces are directed this way, and everyone still appears to be vertical. So that is good, and uh, I just want to know, because I know this is really, some of it's dense, but we really want to make sure you get all the info. So let's talk about um, background actors for a moment. I had mentioned at the beginning that we were going to come back to this issue as far as background wage increases, and here we are. Um, one of our key efforts in this negotiation was to try and address the impact of inflation over the last few years on our members' earnings and to make sure that, that our members were able to keep up with that. And in no area is that more important than members who are working at minimum, minimum wages, whether principal or background. But I think we can all recognize that um, our members who work at the lowest wage rates suffer the most from the impact of inflation because um, inflation impacts necessities particularly, and they're called necessities for a reason, which is you really need them, whether it's rent or food or whatever. And so um, there's just less room to maneuver if you are you know, fighting to take care of necessities. And so in the case of our background actors, we were able to achieve an unprecedented wage pattern. It's also a two-step increase in the first year. The first wage increase, which took effect on November 9th, is an 11% uh, increase uh, for background, and there'll be an additional 4% on July 1st of next year for a compound increase in the first year of 15.51% for background. And, yeah. And then just like everybody else, background will receive a 3.5% additional increase on July 1st of 2025. So that is uh, a really good thing, and, and we're really pleased with that. Um, also, one of the things that we were trying to do throughout this negotiation is achieve what we call a single Schedule X, meaning equalize the terms for background between the West Coast zones and the East Coast zones. And um, while we weren't able to achieve full exact um, 
um, single Schedule X, because there are a few pieces of that that we didn't achieve. The biggest and most important piece of that, which is the number of covered positions on television and streaming projects and theatrical projects, we were able to equalize those numbers. And that's really important for a couple of reasons. One, um, it means that going forward from this negotiation, uh, New York background actors will no longer have to wait for us to achieve gains in the covered numbers for the West Coast so that we can move those numbers up in the future for everybody together. And so I think that is a huge thing. Um, and really looking forward to us continuing to do that. Also, just from a background perspective, this is a massive change. The, the increase, for example, in theatrical uh, features from 57 covered positions in the West Coast zones to 85 to match the numbers out here means that there'll be an additional 10,700 covered days of employment for background actors under this contract. And that just sets us up for future success in raising those terms and improving those conditions for everybody on both coasts. I also want to note, oh, I forgot to advance that. Oop, there we go. Uh, I also want to note that for stand-ins uh, who are working on half-hour multi-cam shows who rehearse or perform in the role of a cast member during a run-through, they will now receive an additional $150 bump that is covered with additional pension and health contributions as well. So that'll be... If you're a stand-in doing that, I think that'll be well received. And also for photo doubles who are required to memorize and deliver scripted dialogue on camera, they will also receive an additional $150 adjustment uh, and P&H on top of that as well. Finally, in the background um, section, we are um, matching, we're, we're changing the late pay provisions to match the principal provisions so that when there is a bona fide dispute, for example, if there's a dispute between an employer and the union over the proper interpretation of contract language or things like that, where there's a bona fide dispute, um, those late pay payments will be told just as they are for principal performers. They'll be paused while that bona fide dispute is resolved. Um, where there's not a dispute, the late pay is unaffected. Um, next, let's turn to stunt coordinators. So for the first time, we've been able to break through that wall that the, that the studios and streamers have put up, uh, preventing television stunt coordinators from receiving fixed residuals. Um, this is something we were able to achieve in the Netflix agreement last year, and we were able to now achieve it with all the rest of the studios and streamers. Um, this is important because while stunt coordinators have been able to participate in pooled residuals where it didn't cost the producer any more money, there was, for some reason, a philosophical objection to including them in fixed residuals where the companies would actually have to pay more instead of it being an issue of sharing a pool. That has finally been broken through. And while the formula that's used definitely needs to be worked on in future rounds of bargaining to increase it, stunt coordinators now, even if they don't perform an on-camera stunt, will be entitled to receive fixed residuals for television uh, work. Um, in addition to that, one of the things we were looking to achieve in this agreement was to equalize the rates for the television and the theatrical flat deal rates for stunt coordinators. We weren't able to achieve full equalization of those rates, but we were able to achieve an outsized increase for the television um, flat deal rates so that we are moving in the direction of equalization. Um, we will have to come back to that to try and push it all the way forward in a future round of bargaining. But during this uh, term of this contract, in the first year, the first year there'll be those two increases of 10% and 6.5%, and then an additional 5% increase, bringing us um, significantly towards uh, in the direction of uh, equalization. And finally, it was brought to our attention in this negotiation that too often producers are asking uh, flat deal stunt coordinators to come to set too early or to stay to set later than they need to, and that this is having an adverse impact on our stunt coordinators, including on their ability to have proper rest periods, which I think we all agree. If anybody needs a proper rest period, it definitely is a stunt coordinator <laughs> for everyone's safety. Um, so. The companies have agreed, the NPTP has agreed to direct production companies not to bring in stunt coordinators earlier than necessary to supervise stunt action if they're on a flat deal, and likewise not to ask them to stay later than necessary than to supervise stunt action. A bulletin will go out to all productions stating this, and the union will absolutely be monitoring their compliance with this and will address it if, there is, if they are not following through on this. 
Um, next, let's talk about singers. So vocal contractors fee will now be paid on top of any multi-tracking and or sweetening, so that's a good improvement. And singers who are required to dance, in addition to singing, whether in rehearsal or on camera, will now receive a 25% bump of the applicable dancer rate. So they will no longer... Oh, slide. thank you. There we go, there thanks we go. so much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> then we'll now receive a bump of 25% of the applicable dancer rate. So singers will no longer be expected to uh, do the dancing work for free. There will be a bump and a higher rate to account for doing both the singing and the dancing. So yay for that. Likewise, dancers who are required to lip sync or sing, whether in rehearsal or on camera, will also receive a bump of 25% of the applicable singer rate. So all of these double threats, whether dancers or singers, will now uh, be compensated for that additional work that they're doing if they're doing something besides their originally engaged work. Um, so that's a good thing. Also for dancers, and I have a feeling there will be many dancers very happy about this, we have finally eliminated rehearsal rates in this agreement. So dancers will no longer be expected to rehearse at a discount. Um, and, and we certainly heard, and I think even the companies heard and understood the point that rehearsal is often more difficult than on-camera days, and it absolutely should not be coming at a discount. So we're very excited that that's part of this agreement. In addition, um, the companies have agreed to increase their efforts to make sure that warm-up spaces are adjacent to the set so that the whole point of warming up is not defeated by jumping in a van for 20 minutes to be driven somewhere. And uh, obviously, we will be monitoring their compliance with those increased efforts to make sure that is really happening. And uh, as we approach a holiday, uh, appropriate that we talk about two new holidays in our contract. At long, long last, Martin Luther King Jr. Day will be added as a holiday in this contract, as will Juneteenth, uh, both days that are very deserving of inclusion. And I will acknowledge that, yes, it seems weird that we have to uh, applaud that in 2023 when Martin Luther King Day should have been in this contract a long time ago, but it is here now, and rightly so, and I'm really glad about that. So continuing on the theme of equity and inclusion, we have achieved improvements in protected access to health care. So just to give some context, our health plan has now for a little while had a benefit in place. So when a member who's covered by the health plan works in a jurisdiction where there is restricted access to reproductive health care, that there is a travel benefit that pays for that member, that performer, to travel back to where they live or to another jurisdiction where they can get access to reproductive health care. And so that's existed. The problem was there was a gap because if you weren't covered by the health plan, for example, let's say you're, you, you weren't covered on insurance and you were now, um, you know, let's say you were cast as a series regular in a new project and you hadn't earned enough yet to get your eligibility, there was a gap there. So the companies have agreed to provide funding for travel benefits so that whether you're covered by the health plan or not, if you're in that situation, there will be a travel benefit for you to get back to a, a jurisdiction where you can access reproductive health care. <laughs> that benefit is also going to now cover gender-affirming care as well. So also, if you're in a jurisdiction where access to gender-affirming care is limited. And the parties have agreed to recommend to the trustees of the health plan to expand that health plan benefit to also encompass gender-affirming care so that that will be fully covered no matter whether you are um, covered on the health plan or whether you aren't covered on the health plan if you're working in a jurisdiction with restricted access to health care for reproductive or gender-affirming care, that will now be covered. So also in equity and inclusion, I want to note that we now have a provision that does not allow the producers to ask you to translate your own or anybody else's sides. And, and makes clear that that's not covered work under this contract, and if they want you to do it, they have to negotiate and pay you separately for that translation work. So please do let us know if you find that there's any violation of that, because, because that's important. Um, 
moving on to stunt doubling. We now have a requirement that producers consult with the union to help identify additional sources for qualified stunt uh, performers that resemble the person they're doubling. This is part of our effort to try and uh, reduce and ultimately eliminate wigging and paint downs in the stunt industry. And so there have been too many times where, stunt, where producers have basically said, we couldn't find anyone, we couldn't find anyone, so we had to wig or we had to do a paint down. And so now they will have to come to the union, we will help make sure they've exhausted every possible resource to find a qualified stunt performer who can double for the principal before anything like that happens as part of an ultimate goal of getting rid of that practice completely. And I'm also really excited to say we've achieved provisions for hair and makeup equity in this contract, which will... They'll, for the first time, provide a consultation right for principal performers so that all performers, regardless of their hair texture, regardless of their, the color or complexion of their skin, will have a right to consult with the hair and makeup um, uh, folks from that production to make sure that they are qualified uh, to work on you as a performer and also that they have the necessary equipment and supplies to be able to work on you, and that's specifically provided for in that provision. And there'll be a notice that goes out from the AMPTP to all producers to make sure they understand their obligation in this regard. And there's also a commitment to work together with industry partners, including IOTSE, to expand and maintain the pool of qualified hairstylists and makeup artists, including by providing funding for additional training so that people can, can be qualified and competent to do that. I do want to acknowledge uh, one thing we really we fought for but we were unable to achieve is to apply this provision to background actors. Um, we fully recognize that this absolutely should be applied, perhaps with some variations because of the net way of the work is done to background actors, and I fully expect that we'll continue to fight for that in a future negotiating cycle, um, especially after we have demonstrated through practice that pursuing this actually improves outcomes on the set and makes production better for everybody. So. I also want to talk about the fact that we now have agreed to exchange and share aggregated diversity statistics once a year between the companies and the union, which will give us a much better ability to help hold them accountable for their obligation to reflect the American scene in productions and both on screen and also in terms of hiring and casting. And I'm also very excited to say we've eliminated the casting data reports, which are an antiquated report. Um, I know you're like, why would we cheer the elimination of this report? Well, let me tell you why. Um, because the concept behind the casting data report, which was well intended when it was created, but doesn't really work in the modern era, is that the, the producer would have some PA or somebody on set just go and look at people and kind of guess what they think their you know, diversity statistics might be. And so I think you know, that, that's, that doesn't work. And so what we, what we wanted to do for a number of years is we've launched our diversity census, we've gathered self-identification information from our members and we'll continue to do that. And we will use that data and cross-reference it with uh, employment data from the benefit plan so that we can produce a report that actually reflects a, an accurate um, and self-identified uh, set of diversity statistics for, for our, our members. And one of the extra huge benefits of this is for many years the companies have refused to collect information on performers with disabilities. And now, because we can gather that information ourselves, we will actually be able to meaningfully include performers with disabilities in our reporting in this area, which is an <laughs> important accomplishment. And that'll also be true for seniors and, uh, and issues related to gender identity, for example. So I think it's gonna be much more inclusive and a much better way of addressing this. Um, so let's talk about sexual harassment prevention. First of all, I'm so excited to say that we have achieved a provision that obligates the companies to use best efforts to engage intimacy coordinators on all projects that include nudity or simulated sex. And that also includes any kind of intimate scene upon the request of a performer. And there's a provision that explicitly prohibits any retaliation against a performer for requesting an intimacy coordinator. And that's a, 
That is a really good thing. This is the you know, culmination of many years of work to establish intimacy coordinator training programs accreditation standards to get those programs up and running in cooperation with folks who sort of uh, led the creation of this of this part of the industry, and also to establish our intimacy coordinator registry. And so now that there is a sufficient population of intimacy coordinators who are trained and qualified to do this work, we actually were able to get this into the contract, so that's great. Um, thank you. And in addition to that, we have increased notification regarding non-discrimination anti-harassment policies. So not only will those now have to be provided to people in their start paperwork, vouchers, et cetera, but it'll also be included on the call sheet and uh, made available in uh, background uh, holding areas and places like that so that everyone has access to those policies and importantly, how to report violations of the non-discrimination and anti-harassment uh, policies. <laughs> And for background actors, for the first time, you will now have a contractual right to be notified in advance if a role that you're being considered for includes nudity or simulated sex. That notice will need to come to you prior to the audition or interview, uh, or can be provided in the casting notice, but it has to be 48 hours in advance of call time. So there will no longer be a scenario where you show up at set and you're surprised with a request to do nudity or simulated sex as part of that role. Yeah. yeah. I know it seems basic, but it's certainly something that everyone should have the right to have advance notice of that, I would think. And finally, the companies have agreed. Um, finally, there's a, a commitment to uh, reviewing and updating the training programs, the industry harassment prevention training programs to cover best practices for scenes with nudity or simulated sex, and also to handle any kind of triggering scenes in a more trauma-informed manner, with the goal being to make sure people understand how to handle those types of scenes in a way that supports our members and performers, um, instead of our performers and members having to not only participate in those scenes, but also educate everyone about how to handle them in an appropriate way. So, very, very happy about that. So, um, in order to, it, it, oh, thanks. Yep. In order to um, finish this out, we only have about 20 more slides. Well, actually, no. Um, we decided that we just couldn't do a slide for every single topic because it would just make it too long. So this is a slide that shows you all the other things that are on the list that we didn't make specific slides for. And, you know, and so we want to just make sure you know that. So if, you, if any of these topics are a particular concern to you, obviously, in the summary, you'll see that information. You can ask us about it now. And I also just want to proactively address a topic that I know a number of people have asked me about, which is, will we be, be able to see the MOA language before we cast our vote in this ratification? So just a couple of things about that. We start out by saying, yes, you will be able to see the MOA language before you cast your vote. <laughs> But I do want you to know that that is not something we've ever done before because the MOA language reflects the final draft that goes back and forth between the companies and us, and it usually takes many weeks or even months to finish that draft. So every prior ratification has been done on the basis of the summary. I understand that because there's so much in this agreement and for a whole host of reasons, people really want to see that language. So our contracts and legal team have been working really hard to get it completed so we can provide it to you. But I just want you to know that that's, that's the reason, and, and it's a departure from what we've ever done in the past, but if it helps our members feel uh, comfortable and confident in making their vote, I think that's, a, that's great. I do want to note it's going to be a roughly 130 pages long, so, you know, uh, set aside some, some light bedtime reading time, or if you have insomnia, that might help, but um, it will be there for you should you so desire to read it. Um, On this list, there's just a couple of things I want to highlight. I just want to mention so you'll know that for wardrobe cleaning allowances and per diem, there are increases in both of those areas that I think members will appreciate very much. And I know, Ray, there's at least one thing on here you want to highlight. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight the items applicable to minors since we didn't go have a slide for minor items. Um, we achieved a provision that emancipated minors who have not yet completed the compulsory education requirements of their state of residence still have to be provided on set instruction, so they will still get instruction on set. And with respect to background checks, for any welfare worker, child labor coordinator, or anyone who performs in a similar capacity on set, they now have to mandatorily be subjected to a background check. And for anyone, <clears throat> that is good.
And for other folks that might be working uh, in or around minors, the contract will now allow for those people to be uh, background checked as well. Great, so, so now let me just say, this is the web address that, that Fran said and that I said verbally, but for those of you who, like me, like to see things visually as well, there it is. It's uh, sagafter.org slash contracts 2023. And so I think we're pretty much ready to turn it over for questions or comments and uh, look forward to having a dialogue with you about this contract. Okay, okay. Thank you, Duncan. So we brought out our uh, top experts and legal minds uh, in the form of Duncan Crabtree Ireland and Ray Rodriguez. Please, another hand for them and that presentation. Thank you. Also, um, because we know uh, uh, that we have a membership here, uh, we also have our negotiating uh, committee members on this stage as well to give you a visual balance of what this uh, process is as well as uh, uh, other voices who may be able to answer a question or two if that comes in that direction, we're able to do that as well. So, um, rules of the road, we have two mics. We'll go from the view of the dais. Uh, mic A, mic B, okay? A, B, you have two minutes to contain your statement and or questions. Uh, we'll, we'll pause the clock for the answer of a question if necessary, but also just be mindful. We have extensive lines on both, so be succinct to the point. A lot can happen in a New York minute. So, uh, we can adjust the mics because uh, Duncan can't see people. Right. We have an interesting dilemma here. Uh, um, the sign interpreters can see people, but Duncan and Ray can't see. These columns are beautiful. <laughs> but, but, but very, very, very blocky. Um, uh, is it a... Yeah, if you can put people, if they can make it so we see them on the... Okay. You're going to see them... Oh, okay. Video. Okay. Yeah. We, you will, we'll uh, shift. Shall we... No, we should... Let's hold for a second until we get a position for the oh, mic so you can be mic seen. Is, no, they're not going to the put them on the screen? Oh, yeah. okay. Let's see. <laughs> Mike Just give us a tech moment for a second so we can see the faces of the people at the mic, all right? Mm -hmm. Guys, single file, please. Single file. Oh, okay, we, there we go. Okay. Oh, great. And I can, okay, over here. Start B before A? Okay. Okay, he's right there. So we're going to start on mic B. Let's break the rule, right? Okay. <laughs> Mike B, you're on. It's All right, a uh, quick question regarding the casting process, in particular the eight-page maximum. Um, that seems like a lot to me for a, for a first audition. Is that something, what was the initial ask from SAG-AFTRA on, on page limits? Do you see that as something that should be and can be renegotiated down? So I'm, I'm gonna ask Ray to, to remind me what the initial proposal was on the page limits. Ray is saying five, you just give me the, mm -hmm. the high sign. So five was our original ask. I think the company's, if I remember, was at 12, if I'm not mistaken, uh, something like that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, these, these kinds of provisions are exactly the kinds of provisions that we would uh, renegotiate or imp negotiate improvements in in future cycles. And I do want to note self-tapes as a particular example, and there's several examples of this, AI is another example, is something where there was no regulation in this contract whatsoever, as I think all of you well know because of the experience that you've had with self-tapes over the past few years. So. Um, there were a whole host of things that we wanted to negotiate for in this contract, and ultimately uh, the committee decided that, um, and I think Ray and I agree, that going with eight pages was a good solution because there were other things we were fighting for, like the exclusion of weekends in the, in the uh, time period, and so it had to be balanced with what could be achieved. But if it turns out that eight pages ends up uh, being uh, problematic, then we can absolutely in future cycles come back and look to lower that number. Um, but I think it is really important to have a limit because, of course, as many people pointed out to us during the W&W &W process, right now the companies really were not complying with any limit whatsoever. Thank you. I would just add, um, just to remind folks, that under our low-budget promulgated agreements, the limit is five pages. Thank you. Mike A. Uh, yes, hi. Um, background rage increases 11, then 4, then 3.5. 
how much of each of those is going to be shaved off as a contribution to the pension, noting that background actors are made to contribute to pensions that they themselves will rarely, if ever, qualify for, with inflation and potential, potentially less work due to AI, background needs to retain as much of their wages as possible. Um, if I have the two minutes, I can get in my second question, or do you want me to take that and reserve my time? Take that and reserve your time. Go ahead. <laughs> so none of that increase will be taken away for pension and health contributions. The pension and health contributions are on top of all of that. Um, and I, I totally understand the point you're making that it is hard as a background actor to qualify for health insurance in, in, in this program. By the way, it's hard as a principal performer to qualify for health insurance in this program, and we know that too. But there, is, there continues to be a, a, back, a day's eligibility system so that background actors who earn less than the qualifying threshold uh, can qualify on the basis of days worked as well, and so that will continue to be in place. And I think um, uh, it, this is a good point to also mention, because we didn't mention it in the main presentation, but part of this uh, agreement, part of the strike suspension agreement, includes a, um, a provision that reduces the eligibility requirement for people who are impacted by the strike. So if you're already uh, covered by the sag after health plan and you might lose your coverage as a result of not earning enough because of the strike period, there is a reduced earnings requirement that's proportional to the amount of the strike period that's in your eligibility period, and that will trigger an additional quarter of coverage and an extended eligibility period to count more earnings. And let me just say for the seniors in the room, if you're an active senior uh, who is covered on the health plan, then if you meet that qualification, that reduced uh, eligibility threshold, you will receive four quarters of additional coverage, a full year of additional coverage because of the timing that's required to sync up with Medicare eligibility. So those are really significant additional um, things that were part of the resolution of the strike. But to your fundamental point, none of the wage increases for background will are diverted in any way to go into pension and health. The pension and health contributions are on top of that. Bravo. Um, okay, secondly, uh, regarding the general casting call provision that states performers may not be charged a fee to access a casting notice or submit themselves for a role being cast, are you going to enforce this provision for background casting agencies? Many background casting agencies, thank you. Many background, don't take away from my time. Uh, many background casting agencies use third-party fee-based casting aggregators, like Casting Networks, for all of their notices and submissions, creating a pay-to-play necessity for background. While SAG-AFTRA does not have contracts directly with casting agencies, should not SAG-AFTRA demand producers require background casting agencies to hire, uh, that they hire to have a fully open to all notice and submission system, perhaps like uh, a free web portal, like, uh, like the one Grant Wilfley has, for those familiar with that. So background can see all casting notices and submit for any and all projects without fees. No actor, background included, should have to pay in order to find and submit for work. Okay. This, only people on the mic, please. Keep civility. We're not going to do that. Thank you. Thanks. So that's, you know, that's an excellent point. I have to say, and Ray can jump in a minute if he wants to, you know, most of what we talked about in terms of those limitations are really directed at not at background actor exactly. calling services or casting agencies, but exactly. that doesn't take away from the validity of your point, and absolutely it's something we should keep working on. I feel like you know, this contract contains really strong gains for the background community. I think if you look at this contract and you think about um, the range of things that we have fought for, that this negotiating committee fought for, that's really strong. I think that's an area where we could, uh, in the future, pursue some improvements there as well. Um, and really, ultimately, the principle that you just said is, is right. No actor, no background actor, nobody should have to pay to access employment opportunities or be considered for employment. That's the, 
you know, goal that we're trying to reach, and we definitely will need to continue pursuing that with respect to calling services. Um, I do want to note, this, this provision that Ray talked about, it doesn't stop casting services from offering subscriptions that people pay for, right? So if there are services they provide to you that you choose to pay for that are not involving getting access to the notice of the audition, uh, getting access to the sides, submitting a self-tape, et cetera. If there's separate services they provide, they can still provide those. And so to the extent that you end up with a calling service or somebody like that for a background actor where the background actor chooses to engage a service to help them with casting, that will still be something that's outside the ambit of what we'd be pursuing. Because what we would be pursuing is uh, related to what the employer does, that's what we can negotiate over. And so if they are using a service that requires you to subscribe or pay, then that is something that we can and will attack in a future but the, round. But the employer uh, controls the people they engage and hire. They do, The producer right. can make that, impose that rule on background uh, uh, casting agencies. So I hope you'll, I mean, it seems you've done it for uh, principals, probably should do it for uh, background, and I hope you will be working on that in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Hey, do me a favor, state your name. I forgot to mention this. Jory Levine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Mike, Mike B. Did, did Ray want to add anything? No, he was, he was good. good. Okay, good. good. Hi, yes. good evening. Uh, my name is Bonnie Harper, and first of all, I want to thank you. This was a lot of information and pretty informative. Um, basically, most, well, I, I'm undecided at this point, even though there has been a lot of information presented, and I wanted to read the contract. I'm concerned that we're not going to get it until December 5th, and we're, our votes are due December 5th, and at 130 plus pages, we're really not going to have time to read it and actually go through all the provisions. So one, is it going to be due and uh, available earlier, whether or not we have to download it, et cetera? Um, additionally, because of rumor, innuendo, whatever the story is, the people are nervous that voting in favor of this contract is essentially voting out their jobs, specifically for background actors as well as stunts. Um, essentially, all these AI provisions are replacing us. And we, not saying that that's necessarily the end of actors on film and television, but we're not hearing of created opportunities and new opportunities so that, for instance, when we went from the silence to talkies, that all of a sudden there were script supervisors and Foley artists and all these other new jobs that didn't exist before. We're not hearing that now, um, at least not available to us anyway, maybe, maybe computer science people or something. Uh, so there is a lot of fear, and my final portion of this is if there is so much fear, and I'm hearing it from both coasts, and people vote no, because right now the strike is suspended, what is our next step? What are we planning to do if the contract vote fails? Okay, so that's three big questions. Uh, sure, first of all, let me just say, you know, my intention is for you to be able to, uh, you know, spend your Thanksgiving holiday reading 130 pages of contract language, as opposed to your evening of December or evening of December 4th. So, uh, you know, uh, there are a number of people involved in getting that work done, and it isn't quite there yet, but I um, have every hope that we will be able to post it this week, um, and uh, we will get it posted as soon as possible. It's no, no, no idea or sense that we posted it at the last minute where you don't have time to review it or whatever. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. Um, second of all, as far as, you know, protecting jobs, let me say, first of all, from a background perspective, you have the best possible protection you could hope for because every covered job, as far as AI is concerned, every covered job under this contract is protected from replacement with any kind of digital replica. That was, that's the provision that's there. Every covered position has to be filled with a human actor. So, so when people say they have a fear that they're gonna be replaced, I, I understand that AI can be a scary topic and frankly, there's a lot of misinformation and sort of, for lack of a better term, fear mongering going around on social media. So I'm, I really appreciate you being here and listening to this presentation and asking this question because what I wanna say to you is, I don't know if you're a background actor or not, but for background actors, those positions, those covered positions are covered, protected, and can't be replaced by digital replication or by the use of an AI synthetic or anything like that. There is that protection. 
Um, likewise, I want to say to um, anyone who's concerned about synthetic fakes being used to replace them, such as stunt performers, such as looping performers, um, the provisions that we have enable us to, number one, get advance notice of anything like that happening by the companies. They've said it's not going to happen, but we have the right to know in advance if they're going to try to do it. And we can use our bargaining power to bargain for economic terms that make that undesirable for them to do. And that's one of the best ways to motivate these companies to not do something, is to make it economically unfeasible for them to do it. And so that's something that we have there as well. And I want to just remind everybody, that's not happening right now. It is not a fact that people are out there or that these companies are out there using generative AI or other technology to create synthetic fake stunt performers, synthetic fake anybody. Another point I want to make, which I haven't made yet, but I will just mention it, is we fully anticipate providing um, standard form writers for purposes of our members either granting or denying consent for use of their digital replica, which means if stunt performers are concerned about problems with doubling, for example, like they're concerned that principal performers are going to allow the use of a digital replica to double for, a, for them instead of a stunt performer, we'll have standard forms where our principal performer members can decline to do that. And just like today, you do have some performers, some principal performers who choose to do their own stunts. There may be some principal performers who choose to have a digital replica replace them instead. But I think with um, writers and language ready to go that help protect against that, I think our principal performer members will, by and large, avoid scenarios where they are agreeing to allow the use of their digital replicas for that purpose, and likewise with looping as well. So I think there's a lot that we can do um, in this contract, and I want to just say to anybody who's you know on the fence about it, what's important to remember is, without this contract, we do not have any protection. It is a blank page. So if we had not negotiated for anything in AI, or if, as some people have suggested, all we had done was negotiate a sentence that said that actors are humans, um, I mean, that sounds great, but it doesn't actually provide, in our contract, any real protection. And what we did in this negotiation was go in there looking to provide real protection for our members against what actually is happening and what is likely to happen during the term of this contract. And we 100% will be back on this topic in less than two and a half years with the benefit of seeing what happens over the term of the contract and also um, seeing what's coming down the line in terms of the technological developments and advancements in generative AI. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously everyone's going to have to make up their own mind. To your third point, uh, if, what, if we, what if the membership does vote no and, and does not ratify this contract? So um, I have no reason to believe that if, this, if the membership said no to this contract, that we could just go back and have the AMPTP or the CEOs offer us a better deal. Um, we were on strike for four months almost, on top of two months, two and a half months, that the Writers Guild was on strike before us. Uh, we pushed this industry to the very brink. We extracted things from them on the very last day of the strike. Um, I think anybody who's out there saying to you, if you vote no on this ratification, the CEOs, the CEOs are just going to offer you something better, it's not true. What we would have to do to extract more from them is go back on strike. And it would probably have to be an extended strike because if you think about it, put yourself in the place of one of those CEOs now. You have a whole industry that's got unions. If this union comes in, if we go on strike for four months, we get a hard-fought deal that the studios agree at the last minute to some additional concessions to get us to, to make that deal and go forward with it, and our membership rejects it. In their mind, what they're going to say is we cannot encourage other unions to do this because we can't have deals made that then don't get ratified, especially when we push so far beyond what we ever said we would do. So it's going to be hard-fought. And, you know, I can't predict the future, I'm not, obviously, not psychic, so, you know, could we stay on strike for a long time and achieve something different? Perhaps, or perhaps not. But please understand that this is not a kind of scenario where, oh, you know, they, they're not, you know, they were just kind of kidding when they said they wouldn't do this stuff, and, I mean, we went to the brink. In my view, we held out to the maximum point of leverage and made the best possible deal that could be made in this contract. And I want, you know, I want to be very clear that if this deal is not ratified, we have a major, major problem and fight ahead as we think about going back on strike after already having been on strike for four months to try and achieve, to try and achieve what specifically? 
uh, if, the, if what we're trying to achieve is a ban on AI, please understand these companies will not do that. It is as existential for them as it is for us. So they will not agree to a ban on AI no matter how long we stay on strike, in my view. So anyway, those are all food for thought about what the best decision is. But I just encourage you to really realize that when you come from nothing and you achieve a whole bunch of detailed limitations and regulations, that is, that is a very important gain, and it's a gain that can be built on in subsequent rounds of bargaining. So it's important that fear motivate us to a certain point, but we should not let fear paralyze us and prevent us from actually seeing that we have an extraordinary deal in front of us and saying yes to that deal, locking it in, and then doing what we always do, which is come back in another round and improve upon it, improve, improve upon it, and improve upon it. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone A. Come on, is that a little easier? Well, first of all, thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Ray. Uh, you two are extraordinary. Oh, by the way, I'm Jay Potter. I thank you. I'm a local and uh, national board member. And I've had the pleasure of working and serving with this august group of people up here on the stage for quite a few years. And I am moved almost to tears for what you have accomplished during this contract cycle. It is extraordinary. Folks, we have hit the SAG after a mega millions jackpot. Over a billion dollars in contract to help go into members' pockets and to make this union even more robust. And I have to say, Ray and Duncan, you have been on this tour online and in person in Chicago, in New Mexico, here, Boston, wherever, everywhere. And uh, I can't believe your vocal quality is great as it is. And so that's extraordinary. Um, I want to just turn around for a second and look at my fellow Where picketers. Where is your question? <laughs> it's more of a statement. Is that OK? You got 45 seconds, Jay. 45 seconds, Jay. I just want to say this is an incredible deal. It is great to see all of you here and participating in this. Seeing you on the strike line for 118 days was extraordinary. Decorum, give him his time. He can make a statement. Decorum. Everybody Decorum. has two minutes. Two minutes. Was extraordinary. It's great to see you here. I hope you will support this deal. It is incredible. As Duncan just told you, not supporting it actually would be a catastrophe. And we have so many gains. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, clarification and decorum. You have two minutes. In that two minutes, you may ask questions. In that two minutes, you can make a statement. That is what we're doing. Understand, whether you agree or not, let's keep the decorum. Let's keep it adult and clean. Microphone B. I have two questions. Your name, sir. Max Goldbaum. Hello, Max. Hi. Hi. We ran against each other for president. <laughs> anyway, my first question is, since there's no such thing as a perfect contract, what, in each one of your opinions, is the contract's biggest flaws? Uh, I mean, that's a great question. I guess I would say, um, <laughs> Probably one of the biggest flaws is that the way that the AI provisions are framed uh, has caused people to not see them as an integral part of a larger contract and to be analyzed in this isolated manner that I think has really caused a lot of misunderstanding. Um, I think that um, in terms of what I'd like to see us improve upon, I would have liked to see us have a union consent requirement in generative AI. Um, that is something I would have liked to see. That was incredibly hard fought with them. We started out with it on June 7th, and it was on the table to the very end. And, uh, and it became very clear that the companies just wouldn't do it. So I think that's something that we're going to have to keep uh, fighting for. And I wish that were in there, but it's not. But I do think what we did achieve in that area pro provides really meaningful protection and is the best protection that we could get in this negotiation for generative AI. The other thing that I would highlight, I guess, would be I think that um, the concept we came up with with attaching a, uh, a streaming bonus to the revenue stream of the streamers was a really good idea. I think the companies should have seen it as such because it from my point of view, could have helped foster a sense of greater collaboration 
and uh, fostered a, an environment where we didn't end up in uh, contentious bargaining cycle after cycle over making sure that streaming was sharing a, a part of its money in a fair way with actors. So I think that's another thing we're gonna have to go back and fight over in the next round of bargaining is how to expand that bonus pool beyond the 25% of the 40 million that we talked about. Um, and so that should be greater. So uh, from my point of view, I think those are two, two of the things that I would have liked to see us be able to achieve more. But I guess in the context of your question, I would just say, please know that it's not from lack of fighting for those things. We fought for both of those things the entire time. We fought for those things on the picket lines. Uh, Fran and I talked about them until we hardly could talk anymore. We, we fought for those things, but the fact is a, a negotiation uh, you know, it involves compromise, it involves, you know, getting some of the things you want, but not all of them. You know, you don't walk into a negotiation with a wish list and they're just all granted. It's not a genie, it's not a magic bullet. So what we did though was extract more from these companies than I guarantee you more than they ever thought they would pay. I guarantee you they never thought they were gonna break the pattern on minimums. They told us that over and over and over again during the first 35 days. They told us that over and over. So, you know, there's a lot in this agreement that they wish they hadn't agreed to, that they didn't want to agree to, that they were forced to by you and anyone else who showed up on picket lines and held that fight. And so, yeah. So I guess when you say my biggest regrets, I would say that's regrets in the sense that I wish we could have achieved those things and I know we're gonna need to continue to fight for them. But as far as this contract goes, I don't have any regrets about whether this contract is worth being voted for. I don't have any regrets about whether this contract protects our members better than what came before it because anyone, in my opinion, who actually sits down and reads the summary and says, this is how, this 18 pages show how this contract is changing. Tell me how that's not an extraordinary achievement on the part of our membership. I think it is, and I think that, that that's how it should be seen. Thanks, Duncan. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Um, I'm going to leave that response from the expert. It would, I think every member here would have something to say about that, but in fairness to the room and the process, if you'd like to speak to individuals about their concerns about it, you were totally free to that after this process, but go on to your next question. Okay. Um, why is scanning not SAG only as principal and stunts are? Why is there no prohibition against studios in SAG productions from using scans of non-SAG individuals? That would give us control over AI, how AI is used, but the contract now makes it a free-for-all for studios to do whatever they want with non-union, building up a database of synthetic performers they can use for free. I understand that about the minimums, but that's a temporary fix. Sooner or later, the studios will completely abandon SAG-AFTRA and the entire union will collapse unless we pro prohibit the studios from scanning non-union without a SAG waiver. And don't say that live actors will never be replaceable because AI will c continue to grow and improve exponentially in accordance to Moore's law. And uh, also, they don't even have to be actors to be scanned. It could be anyone that they could hire for like $100 to to scan or whatever. So I'm sorry, I mean like respectfully, almost everything that you just said is not correct under this contract, so I'm gonna need to correct it. Number one, it is not true that the studios can engage someone, and just anyone they want, and pay them whatever they want to create a digital replica. To the contrary, that is exactly the, the concept we prevented with the languages in this contract. The employment of someone to create a digital replica is regular employment under this contract, and all the preference of employment and union security rules in the contract apply to that. Number two, the the compensation for that is covered by the minimum requirements of the contract as we talked about, both for the creation of the digital replica and any use of it has to be paid just as if they were employing that person under the contract at our minimum rates or above. So when you say what's going to stop all of that, my answer to you is the contract, if you approve it, will stop all of that. How are you if you reject it, nothing will stop all of that. How are you going to enforce the, you gonna enforce the so contract? So that's the problem with that framing of the question. And as far as generative AI goes and the creation of synthetic fakes, again, we have a right under the contract to notice. We have a right under the contract to bargain for compensation. So my answer to you is 
the contractual language will protect against it, and if it's not approved, there is no protection against it. So I don't understand the framing of the question because it, it just contemplates things that are not at all accurate about the proposed agreement. They can build up a database without your permission and without your knowledge and just have it um, have it there building up for years until they're finally ready to use it because they don't need us anymore. Well, sorry, just to be clear about when you say they can build up a database, so if you're talking about a replica of specific performers, they can create those replicas only with your consent, so they can't just build up a database. They have to get your specific informed consent to create it, and they cannot make any future use of it without your specific informed consent. So it is not true that they can just not build ours. up a database. Not ours. I'm talking about random people. Okay, well, Great, so that's the first part. Second part, with respect to generative AI, it is true that any company out there can and have already ingested all kinds of publicly available material, right? There's lawsuits about that. There's uh, the Getty Images lawsuit, for example, where all of Getty Images copyrighted photographs were ingested into an AI system to train the system. And there's currently lawsuits over whether copyright law protects or doesn't protect that. So that's a much bigger battle than is within our collective bargaining agreement. But I want to just point out to you, in our collective bargaining agreement, if one of these companies uses a system like that that's been trained with publicly available material to create a synthetic fake actor, do you know what they have to do? They have to notify us and they have to bargain with us over compensation for that. So that is actually party. a stronger restriction and limitation than a random AI company would have by ingesting publicly available materials in there. We actually got stronger protections for you in this contract with these employers than any other company out there in the world, like OpenAI, for example, would have on them. So when people say to me, where's the protection? My answer is, it's right there on the page. You just have to look for it. But this doesn't answer anything about non-union. So, sorry, Max. Uh, go ahead with your next question. Sorry. Or, I couldn't hear what he said. Uh, this doesn't answer anything about the non-union, like uh, who are, who are, no, it's not. Yeah, yeah sorry. To, to, yeah, sure. To, so the answer to that is if, it's, if there's employment, if they're engaging someone to create a replica, then the same rules apply as if they engaged a person. You know, there are certain times that um, there is a preference for professional employers. Let's be clear, in this country, the closed union shop was, was banned by law in the 1950s. So there is not a requirement that someone has to be a member of the union to be engaged. But there are preference of employment provisions for professional performers that equally apply to the creation of digital replicas. If you're talking about training an AI system, a generative AI system, like chat GPT, there is not a requirement of that because that's being done outside the scope of employment under our contract. But what there is a requirement of is notice and the ability to bargain for compensation. And as I told you, the strategy with that bargaining for compensation is to disincentivize the companies from doing it at all, which is how we favor professional performers and not random people who might have been ingested into an AI system. All right. You good, Max? Not really, but yeah? we can go on this for a while. So. All right. Thank you, Max. <laughs> microphone Thanks. A. And microphone A. I'm sitting down. Oh, hey. Hey. <laughs> it's dark over there. Hi, I'm Christine Bruno. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, my colleagues, my union siblings, for your Herculean efforts on this contract. My, my God. Um, I have a quick question, but um, first I want to say to everybody in the room, thank you, thank you for being here, thank you for your questions, thank you for your concerns. Thank you to our team, our incredible team, for putting protections in this contract that, we're, that we have never had. We've never had, if you want to compare the two contracts when the MOA comes out, read the last contract. We went from $318 million to over a billion dollars in one cycle, people. One cycle, because of the people on this stage and the folks in LA. Because of this team, it's called a negotiation for a reason. Please, thank you so much. Now, I want to ask a quick question <laughs> about, about casting. Um, 
Okay, so you brought up the, the casting. Um, great on the casting data reports. Folks with disabilities, we've been fighting to get on the casting data report for 30 years. That is, that is so amazing. My question is that you said that live or um, live in person or live Zoom auditions would be first come, first serve. Now, what about performers with disabilities? Would, would they be given precedent over um, non-disabled folks um, because that is a reasonable accommodation? And, and if so, uh, do the casting directors know that? Thanks for well, I don't know how much the casting directors know yet, but there's clearly a, a very substantial task ahead of us of educating them, along with a lot of other people, about uh, terms of disagreement. So that will be the next uh, frenzy of activity. Uh, but yes, they are. There is language that um, uh, asks them to provide priority to performers with disabilities, and I think seniors may be referenced in there as well in terms of how they um, schedule people for those opportunities. Great, thank you. Microphone, thank you, Christine. Microphone B. Hi, my name is Imoya Manrock, and thanks for finally having a meeting to explain things to people or deal with anything since COVID, okay? so. First of all, I will, personally, I would like to, a full copy of the contract. I'm quite capable of reading it for myself. A summary will not suffice for me to make a decision of yes or no. I think I'm entitled to it legally, so make that happen as soon as possible. So that's one, and if, if not, I wanna know why, if you have an answer now. Um, there, there will be no fear mongering online or misinformation or anything if I can read it myself. The other thing, Duncan, you are not a SAG actor affected by AI generative replica or synthetic fakes, okay? On that note, Duncan, you tried selling the original me, Imoya Monrock, by trying to coerce me to vaccinate against my will. To to let me continue. Two minutes. Let me continue, it applies. Specific work. You punished me with the, along with the other board members who, who went along with you and who made those decisions with, with the producers and violating my constitutional rights. I'm in the United States, okay? Now, e Emoya, no, we're no, trying let me to continue. stay with Do not stop me. You, talk, stop pe you did not stop people who subject. were pro doing propaganda. Don't stop me. Let me finish. It's I have my time. Don't let me lose my time. Now you want me to vote yes to selling a copy of my scanned body, etc. When in the first place we were talking about the original me you wanted to vaccinate. I didn't want that. Now you want the copy. It's against my will and, with, and I want to know a copy. You see you guys throw me off. But against my will with no ability to enforce discrimination, I want to know how you will enforce discrimination with AI when you did not enforce it with me being unvaccinated and you signed an agreement, the return to work agreement, and it was never enforced. I'm fighting it myself even at this moment. That's two minutes. Let me, no, I didn't finish because you two interrupted. Two minutes, let, let, you let Duncan up. answer. You interrupted me. Let me continue. It's almost done, okay? Um... Do you want to hear his answer? Let me finish because it has the point that's connected right here. Um, I'll just repeat myself. At this point, I think if you think we should vote yes, you are willing to be, you are willing to be scanned yourself as an avatar to become our national executive director. This can potentially save us at least half of your current salary. All right, that's Duncan, two minutes. You thank you very much. Okay, Moya, Let thank you. Me, I'm thank you. My question. Let Duncan, him answer your you question now. After all, most we're going of your to, job experience was funded by SAG. We're going to allow him to answer. And then with I actor, I believe that instead of two minutes, we're going to allow him to answer free. now. Can, can you get, stop? We can get to apply can you, for jobs there. Can you stop? I'm done. Thank you, Duncan. Sure. Um, so, look, I. Uh, I understand that you and a bunch of other people have very strong feelings about how this union, and perhaps me personally, 
handled certain issues in connection with the return to work agreement. I am more than happy to talk about those, but I don't believe this is the right forum to do that because this forum is about this contract. So what I will respond to at this time is your question about how do we address uh, discrimination in the use of digital replicas and also, you know, so the stuff that relates to this contract I'll address. Uh, I'm happy to address other topics at another time when, it's, when, that, when that's appropriate. Um, as far as in this contract, I, what I'm sort of, what, the first thing I want to say is this contract 100% protects your right to say no to the creation of a digital replica. If you don't want to create a digital replica, you do not have to create a digital replica. You can say no to it. And by the way, if you do ch choose to say yes to it, and then later on you decide you don't want it ever used again, you can say no to every request that ever comes in after that for the use of it. If you create a digital replica, it can never be used again without your informed consent for that use. So I feel that this contract protects our members' choice as to whether they want to or do not want to create a digital replica. But let's take head on, I think, the issue you might be raising, which is what if a producer says, I, I need someone who is willing to create a digital replica for this project, and you say, I am not willing to create a digital replica. Are they still required to hire you? And the answer to that question is no. They are not still required to hire you any more than they would be required to hire you for that project if they said, this project requires nudity, and you said, I don't do nudity, then they can either change the project so it doesn't have nudity in it, or they can hire someone else to do it if you refuse to do it. That's how that works. If they have a project where they're going to shoot for a year in Australia, and they say, you have to relocate to Australia for a year if you want this job, and you say, I'm not willing to relocate, they either move the project for you or they hire somebody else to do it. So I think the most important piece to know about that is, Whatever, whatever happens with respect to the question of whether you do or don't choose to grant the right to create a digital replica in one project, it is not a decision for life. It is not something that carries over past that project. You have absolutely a legally enforceable right to say no to any further use of it, and this union will stand behind you and help you enforce that right if needed. So that's the best answer that I have to the question as I understood it, and happy to you know, continue the dialogue. I never thank you, Moya. I never thank you. Thank you, Linda. Microphone A. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm Becca Lish. I want to make a quick statement, or actually what I want to do is express my profound thanks to everyone who is on the dais. I'm astonished at what you achieved in this negotiation. I never would have believed that this could happen. So many of these provisions things that have been in the mix, you know, for decades, right? <laughs> <laughs> and to, to get all those things, I would have said was beyond improbable, impossible, an unreasonable expectation. So thank you. And thank you even more deeply to my brothers and sisters who volunteered their time without compensation, who lost time with their families, who lost time at work and who are now bizarrely having to defend their work. It, it, I, I'm disturbed at the level of disrespect and lack of decorum uh, in the room. I want to encourage everyone to listen more than speak and to read. I think that um, Christine's point about comparing the existing MOA with the, uh, the one that will be prepared at lightning speed. I don't really even understand how lawyers do that, and I hope it's not costing too much. Um, <laughs> prepare before Thanksgiving break by reading the contract as it exists, reading the contract that we've been working under in order to understand how the new contract differs and recognize what's been achieved there. I have two money questions. First money question is, what does it cost to create a digital replica if, for example, rather than letting me go to Australia five times over the course mm -hmm. of a year, uh, NBC Universal decided, oh, you know what, we'll just take that old lady and if she agrees, we'll scan her and, and we'll stick that replica in wherever we need it. What would that cost NBC Universal to do? And I can compare that to what they paid me. Um, 
second money question is much more important to me as someone who is nearing Social Security age and nearing the age of qualifying for Medicare. I know that there's been considerable uh, noise about changes that the uh, health trustees were compelled to make and choosing between providing fewer benefits or providing benefits to fewer people. And I see those caps lifting up and I want to have a sense of how much of a pile of money that presents to the health trustees, the pension trustees, anyone to make decisions for the future about coverage and number of members covered. Okay. Um, because I think that that's thanks, time, thanks, time Becca. Becca. Yeah, that's it. Just give me that second question. That's it. Okay. Sure. So as to the first question, and um, I think there is a there are countervailing forces that affect the answer to that question because obviously if you're creating a digital replica of a performer there's a cost associated with that there's not only the cost of scanning there's the cost of actually doing the manipulation that's necessary to implement the use of that digital replica in any scene or footage that might then be created there's a countervailing cost uh, or or reduction in cost for them in terms of uh, well, depending upon the nature of the use that they're going to make of that. If that use allows them to avoid doing reshoots, for example, then they might save some money on the lack of having to bring everyone together for a physical reshoot. So it's very hard to say what the net result is. It's going to depend upon each particular project. But it is worth noting that um, if, if everything else were equal, if the scenes were kept intact the way they were originally planned and the question was would they use a digital replica of a performer to save money, the answer is no because the cost of creating and using that, that digital replica is significantly in excess of the cost of a performer, especially a performer who's working at scale or at any of our negotiated rates. On the other hand, if you're talking about a performer who, for whatever reason, is a very expensive performer, or has very limited availability, or has negotiated limitations on how much, much of their time the producer can have access to, there may be times when for a performer in that circumstance, they can actually save money or achieve a result they could not otherwise achieve because of availability. Uh, you know, probably a classic example of that is, you know, a deceased performer who's going to be used in a project with consent, by the way, because there would the consent requirement applies to deceased performers as well, but with consent, then, you know, there is no, perhaps no other way to achieve that result other than to use digital replication. So the answer is either they spend the money it costs or they just don't do it. So um, hopefully that's helpful. As far as the, the point about the benefit plan contributions, so our goal in, um, um, in achieving that magnitude of benefit plan contribution increases, which is very, very large uh, compared to a normal cycle, was to try and give additional resources to the health plan trustees so that they could consider modifications to some of the changes that were made in 2020. And while it's ultimately a trustee decision, certainly it's been discussed within the committee and something that we've talked about that one of the things that's on the list for reconsideration as part of that is what's called the dollar sessional rule, which is also known as the rule that prevents uh, seniors who are receiving a pension or receiving their retirement from having their residuals count towards health eligibility qualification. So there is a desire to revisit and change that rule. To do that requires significant additional money into the plan, and that's one of the things we were looking to give the trustees enough money to have the option of doing um, in that process. And so uh, I think we did accomplish that goal, and there is a sizable pool of money going specifically to the health plan in addition to what goes to retirement fund and the pension plan so that the trustees can, can have that battle. I do want to note, you know, anything the trustees do requires management trustees to agree. So the union trustees don't get to just choose things and then dictate terms. It's that kind of process. But one thing we know is if the money's not there, no amount of effort by the union trustees can make something happen. So we had to get the money there, and this deal gets the money there. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. All right, microphone B. Hi, I'm Nubia, New York delegate, so I speak on behalf of myself and my constituents. She, uh, her. Let's pause the live stream. Thank you, tech. Pause the live stream. She, she her, sovereign being, organic human. Did we're, we're not 
the implementation of AI in their workplaces, and I tell you, you won't find any. We are out ahead, and, I, and, and by the way, in saying that, I'm not comparing to the Writers Guild and Directors Guild. They negotiated AI protections that I think work well for their members, and that's great. But looking at these three unions in comparison to everywhere else in the world, you have tremendous protection in this contract that nobody else, no other workers yet have. And I frankly believe a lot of other unions in other industries are going to be looking to this agreement as a model for how they can help protect their workers from abusive implementation of AI. As far as, um, as far as, you know, control of your likeness being a new Me Too movement, I think that would be amazing because the fact is there's a lot of likeness control issues that are external to this contract. That's why we have legislation that SAG-AFTRA has introduced in the U.S. Congress to help provide a federal protection for your right of control over your image and likeness. That's why we've been fighting for those bills in the state legislatures like New York and other states as well for many years. That's why we have a bill in California's legislature right now to um, eliminate the validity of any kind of um, consent that's been granted outside of a collective bargaining agreement or without legal representation for someone who may have signed a contract. We're doing a lot of things to try and protect image and likeness. And if all of you want to be part of that movement, I assume you are, you will. And I know that when we put out an email to our members and say, write to your members of Congress and help demand that this get passed, you, you show up, you do that. So yes. Um, and uh, and, and finally, you know, when you, the last part you said about coercion is not consent, I agree. Coercion is not consent, but to even have a right of consent, you have to have information. You, the, consent is meaningless without, I'm so sorry, but I'm, I just, I'm not, I don't want to be. If, it's coming. Consent requires information. And one of the things that this contract does that has never been present in any other agreement is it provides a formal right to have reasonably specific detailed information about what the companies intend to do with your image and likeness as part of a digital replica. By the way, you don't even have that right now for footage that's shot without AI. This is a huge gain in terms of rights of information that helps you decide what you want to do with your career, with your body, with your image, with your likeness, with your voice, with your performance. And frankly, um, if I were a member or if this were a contract being negotiated for me, I would lock that protection down Absolutely, because that is a huge, huge advance. Mm. All right, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Duncan. Thank, thank you, you, Nubia. Thank you, Duncan. We're going to move on to Mike A, microphone A. Thank you. All right, I'll try to make this as quick as possible. My name is Henry Lynch. First of all, thank you all so much for Thanks, uh, taking the time to answer our questions. Um, I'm curious if there's very specific language outlining what things they can do without our consent, under, specifically under um, what constitutes a substantial change um, to things. Um, also under that umbrella, what specific cases would the language uh, for license or sale to a particular market cover? Um, just it seems like even small changes that might not be considered substantial could have a very large impact on the original like intent of a scene um, to make it acceptable to certain markets. Um, I'm also curious if there's been any discussion about working with members to generate guidelines of what we collectively as union members do agree to consent to and um, and cons and not consent to because otherwise it feels like the gathering of consent can feel like a bit of an ultimatum um, and specifically early career actors could feel pressure to consent to things um, they aren't comfortable with uh, in order to have those opportunities. Um, last couple of things, I'm curious what uh, specifically in places where we didn't get as many gains as we were hoping for in AI, will there be um, messaging from SAG surrounding um, the use of generative AI, specifically um, not endorsing it and against the use of it in certain mm -hmm. projects or at all. Um, and I'm also curious, how does this contract affect other unions and workers um, in parts of the production process that might be affected by digital replicas? Um, and how does SAG plan to support those other workers um, as these changes are implemented? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. That's a lot of, lot of really great questions. Um, I think, uh, well, starting sort of working backwards, um, you know, we've been in an extraordinary collaboration with the other unions in this industry that actually started out during the pandemic or that really grew during the pandemic and continued in this round of bargaining. So I want to just make sure you all know that the solidarity we've had with IATSE, Teamsters, the DGA, WGA, AFM, the basic crafts unions has been extraordinary and helped us get where we are. So we've been talking with them about these various uh, 
issues. Um, we've supported, for example, the Teamsters in their battle to try and prevent autonomous vehicles from taking over in the industry. This is a bigger fight for all of us. And it is true that there may be times when digital replication is used that might impact the amount of crew opportunities there are. Um, but that's a reality that exists independent of our contract. And we, um, you know, our first responsibility is to protect our members, just like their first responsibility is to negotiate terms that protect their members. And we will stand with them when they do, and it'll be in this coming year when they will be demanding that in their negotiations. And they expect and they will receive our support just as we've received theirs, because we all are in this together. But our job is to primarily focus on protecting actors, and that's what we did in this negotiation. And we will work with them to help make sure that other crew members are also protected. And they will have different issues than us, because as actors, you have a unique experience. Everyone recognizes this. The, even the directors and writers don't have this experience. You are the face of their projects. No one else is the face of their projects. And that means that things like replication uniquely impact you, and that's why we spent so much effort and energy on ensuring we had replication provisions that were, that were useful and protective, as opposed to um, things that sounded good but didn't actually accomplish those goals. Um, and now I've lost my train of thought. Maybe, I don't know if you captured any of the uh, other. Sales to other markets like mm -hmm. Oh, right. The digital alterations that impact for send. Ray, you may want to, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, what would that would encompass? Sure. I mean, those encompass the types of changes that are necessary to account for either content regulations or cultural differences. These are types of changes that are made now to movies when they're sold into markets where, for example, profanity, uh, is not allowed, or uh, scenes of a, a sexual nature may need to be edited because the, the mores in that particular market will not allow for that. And so uh, those are types of changes that can be made now uh, using other types of uh, visual effects, and these are the types of changes that they would be allowed to do with digital alteration going forward. And a similar answer for the substantially scripted performed, it's again, the idea is to allow for the type of changes that they are doing now, and not in the course of regulating AI to restrict them uh, beyond what they can already do. So um, uh, th that, was, that would be my response on other markets. You asked uh, guidelines for members about the areas where um, we had, did not achieve everything we wanted in the area of AI. I mean, I think mainly what I would say to that is, as I mentioned, I anticipate us putting out writers uh, that would be like recommended, suggested writers that our members can use to help ensure that the consents they may choose to grant uh, help lift other performers up where they have that opportunity. And I do think that'll be an ongoing conversation we will be having as an educational matter amongst our members. And of course, as we prepare for the next round of bargaining, we will probably be looking at specific areas of concern that have developed over the two and a half years and look to address those specific areas of concern, which I know members will share with us both during the term and also as part of W&W. &W. And as far as synthetics go, you know, I would just note um, we will be notified before that happens in each case. And so in each instance, we'll be able to respond uh, to that by bargaining, by requesting additional information, et cetera. My expectation is the amount of notices we're gonna get about synthetics over the term of this contract is gonna be very small. The, the more likely scenario is that we will be dealing with more issues relating to digital replication than we are with synthetics during the term of this contract. But I feel reassured by the fact that we have to be notified of any of that type of use and we will therefore be in a position to respond to it you know, in real time. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, can we just, um, guys, if you could hold down the, co the side conversations in the room. Uh, I know it's getting late, but we're all here to listen to what's going on, so if we could just keep the side conversations down. Next up, microphone B. Uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Cannon, and my question was about the bonus and streaming residuals, but uh, in listening to everybody and the background actors, it's really great the protections you got, but they're not gonna work because the ones that deny being scanned aren't gonna be hired, and it's just gonna be a revolving door. The, you, if, unless you tighten up the membership, you know, how background gets in, maybe go back to getting a principal role or 
25 vouchers or something like that, you're going to have a revolving door background and all the established background who really rely on that as a career, they're going to work maybe once a year maybe. There's going to be so many people vying for that and they'll get the um, people that agree to be scanned first. Now the, question, now, the questions that I did come up to ask were, you have a bonus system, you have a streaming system. I have shows that are doing fantastic on Hulu, you know, different streaming platforms. I get garbage and residuals. I'm not going to get anything with that bonus system, and, and there are limits on what I can make in residuals on streaming. What is it, $2,000? So, I mean, where's this huge increase that I'm going to get? Well, you know, what did you get for the journeyman actors? And my other question, my last question is, explain to me how, um, without the, the complete contract, which I really don't care about it because it was already released and you probably know that, we've had Zoom meetings with the entire contract. I no. mean, as you know, oh, please. It's, it's you're, not you're, written, you're, Kevin. You released it to Jonathan Handel. I was in a Zoom. Uh, with the 118 or 138 page uh, extended version that the board got. Well, he um, may, someone may have released from the yeah, yeah, PTP yeah. side yeah, a I'm, draft, I'm but that's not the that. final language, and I don't right, think anybody right. should rely on that. that. But you could release the, the, the more extended version immediately. Um, but my question about the bonus, which I still don't understand how we're going to make money, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be peanuts, how do I trust you to negotiate that when? you know, or to monitor it when you can't even get background a $14 fine. Takes you several years if you even collect it. I mean, starting in 2011, you promised uh, no split earnings. It'll be so much easier. It will be a huge, powerful union. Everybody will have health care. And then you disregarded streaming for, what, 15 years? And then, what, two years ago, um, we ended up bringing you to court, Duncan, and you were found malfeasant and withholding information on the pension and health contributions, which was proven in court, and we got a 20 point You're at time, Kevin. We're, you're at two minutes, so How Kevin. do I trust you? And then they extended your contract. You're at time. I mean, you're the same people that have been negotiating contracts for 15 years. Time, Kevin. Years. Time. So how do I trust you? Ezra? Is there uh... <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, look, I'll... I'll I can I'll... show you press releases where you promised... Time, me. Kevin. No street, no, Time, no Kevin. split earnings. Oh. Time, Kevin. Go ahead. So, okay, so first of all, as far as the streaming bonus money goes, I think a, a few things. Number one, I uh, want everyone to know that that applies to any uh, made for SVOD project that's shown on the streaming platform after the effective date of this contract. Unlike the other residuals that Ray talked about earlier, I mean, if you remember Ray mentioned that normally residuals attach based on the production date and that doesn't change through the life of the project. Uh, he mentioned another exception to that that was specific to that section, but another exception to that is in the streaming bonus area because the streaming bonus money will apply to any made for SVOD project that is shown on a streamer regardless of the production date. So if, if your reference was to the fact that you're on projects that may not have been, you know, you might be worried they won't be eligible for that, as long as they're made for streaming, made for SVOD projects that are shown on one of the streamers, then they will be eligible if they meet the criteria for that, for that bonus. As far as the money that's going to go into the bonus fund, the whole point of that is to help distribute that money to a wider pool of members besides the folks who happen to be in the shows that reach that 20% of viewership threshold. And so, you know, if you're someone who's working in one of those projects, it will be to your benefit that that fund exists because that's the only way that money would be getting to you uh, out, of that, out of that part of the bonus structure. Um, is because we fought for that fund, and we fought for it so that it would benefit members beyond the folks in those top 20 shows, or top 20% of um, viewership uh, programs. And so, uh, as I think I mentioned when we described, or maybe Ray did, we're looking to improve upon that in future cycles. I mean, that is a start. That is the creation of a structure that never existed before. We've had a fund, we've had a fund like this in our sound recordings code for over 10 years. It has helped our members who work in sound recordings dramatically for reasons that I can explain if it's needed. 
And we now are, we've achieved getting one implemented in this contract, which wasn't easy, but it's gonna give us the opportunity to do a lot of things over future cycles of bargaining to help improve um, the careers, the economic state of the careers of our members who work in streaming, to help mitigate the impact of the streaming business model. So I hope that that is something uh, that will be appreciated, and I think it will be when members start to receive those checks. Um, and uh, and yeah, so that those, so there's that. As far as you know, other things that you mentioned, um, I don't really want to get into a lengthy discussion of the lawsuit that was filed against the trustees of the health plan over the changes from 2020. You know, we could have a whole meeting just about that topic. But I think the point is that. Um, in this negotiation, one of the things that I have done as chief negotiator and that this committee has done as your negotiating committee is fight for immense increases in benefit plan contributions and specifically health plan contributions because our whole point is we want to improve the benefits in the health plan. So I think you should trust that. And I think you should trust the fact that getting over $300 million in additional contributions over a 31 and a half month period is an extraordinary accomplishment that you should be not only trusting of, but proud of. And will come to your benefit and the benefit of a lot of sag after members. Yeah, but that doesn't mm -hmm. answer my question. Okay, thank you. You didn't, um, you didn't, you didn't comment. You're at, you're at time, time Kevin. Up, Kevin. We're on to microphone A. Thank you. Oh, also, uh, we're um, over time, but um, because of the length of the, dis of the presentation, I want to balance that with the discussion <laughs> Q&A. So we'll continue. That's a nice way of putting it. Until, <laughs> uh, <laughs> until the verbosity of the presenters, uh, we will extend <laughs> until our time. We re examine that. Uh, next, Mike A. Thank you. Your name? Hi, my name is Tisha Vaughn Stewart. Hey, I'm Tisha also Vaughn. a New York delegate. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, I know we can't talk, um, it's confidential, um, the actual shows that reach the 20% um, subscriber watching, but do we know what percentage of all shows reach that 20% subscribership watching, just so we have an idea of what that pool of money may look like um, and now and in the future? And then also the question about that fund, I know it's still in progress and it hasn't been created yet, but do we know if the people running that fund and managing it to disperse that money, is that going to be elected? Is that going to be appointed? Or is that going to be staff? Um, what is that going to look like? Sure, so as far as the, I don't have an exact percentage for you, um, and, and if Ray does, he can certainly weigh in on that, but I would just note what's really, um, what will drive the amount of money that that bonus pool generates is not just how many shows, but also how many cast are on those shows because of the way the residuals are structured. And so um, our media and labor economics team looked at the data for last year and prior years, and. Uh, came up with a projection, which as we've mentioned is $40 million, uh, based on looking at the actual performance of prior projects under this um, newly uh, developed sort of criteria. So our expectation is that's the amount of money that it will generate. How many projects it will be obviously could vary, depending, I mean, it could grow in the number of projects. It, it just depends on viewership patterns. So um, that's something that we'll have to keep monitoring. And I don't think we can, we can give you an exact number other than I will say it's not a huge number of projects. It is you know, somewhere in the you know, 50 maybe projects range, um, more or less, not hundreds and hundreds. Um, if that helps give you sort of a sense of it, and yet it still is projected to generate around $40 million total between the bonus fund and the 75% piece. Um, and, uh, and that's, of course, in addition to all of those other residuals increases. So I think people working in streaming should note, and it's easy to get distracted by some of these big structural changes, but like one, some of the details that he mentioned, the foreign the, the change to the foreign residual structure for streaming, I think a lot of people are missing like how huge that is in terms of money for our members and the fact that members working in streaming who are needing to sustain themselves from through these relatively long hiatuses between seasons are going to have a significant increase in their residuals, not only because of the streaming bonus, but also and even more so because of the improvements to foreign and the other things that Ray talked about in the in the high budget SVOD section. So um, I know it's just a lot to process, uh, but uh, you know, I just urge you to think about that part too, because all of it comes together to form that billion dollar contract. And that's why that number is so high, is because we actually achieved 
gains in so many areas, and when you add them together, um, people working in streaming are going to, I believe, see a significant increase in money that's coming to them from several sources as part of that process. And the trustees. Oh, the trustees. The trustees will be appointed by our national board. There are, there, the, the configuration is two trustees and two alternate trustees, so it'll be four people. My expectation is it will be a combination of elected leadership and staff, and that entity will almost certainly engage a third-party administrator to administer the actual payroll process for all of those payments. Thank you. Thank you, Tishan. Thank you, uh, microphone B. Hi, my name is Blaze Hancock, and I've been a background actor and under five member for about 16 years. And I know that side compensations have been frozen that entire time, and I'm wondering if the new contract has any increases for things like uniforms, formal wear, props, cop belts, meal penalties, lunch and dinner, smoke, wet, pets, or cars. <laughs> there are at least two of, two of that list where there have been improvements. And that is the, um, the, the allowance for cleaning formal wear will go to $27. Um, the meal periods, uh, the, well, the, the, the per diems will go up as well. Uh, I'm not sure I caught the rest of your list. Oh, uniforms, uh, cop belts, props, like props, $10, has been the same apparently since the 80s, that's what I've been told. Yeah. So, so I don't think those other items set. were addressed, um, but the, the, the per diems and the formal wear were. Okay, so you've, none of the other things. Could you put those on your list for the next year time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the next thing was um, the exposure to viruses of people who are unvaccinated and whatever. But is there anything in the new contract about a requirement for notification? Because a lot of people, myself included, contracted um, COVID on sets, and there was no notification even after the back to work thing. Um, we were near principal actors who had COVID, and then we were just not booked for six weeks, even though we were exposed. We were not notified of, of any kind of exposure to a deadly virus. Um, and I find that a little, should probably be in a contract somewhere that they need to notify us. So there was a notification requirement in the return to work agreement. The return to work agreement expired, um, you know, uh, back in July, I think, of this past of this year. Uh, and um, so my expectation would be, you know, if circumstances put us in a position where a, a new agreement on that front had to be negotiated, then that might be addressed. It is not part of this agreement, and there's nothing that's been negotiated in this agreement that's specific to. Um, you know, COVID-19 or any kind of uh, virus notifications or anything like that. But, um, but, you know, it was part of that agreement and uh, to the extent that that wasn't complied with, then that would have been a violation. I know there were times when people brought that to our attention and we did file claims and pursue that with the employers uh, when, we, when, it, when we found out about it. But we also received notice of we would receive notice of positive test results on productions, and that did occur routinely. I think Ray and I both can attest to that because we received, I can't even tell you how many thousands of emails with uh, no test notifications in them. So um, I think, I don't know when the incident you're talking about occurred in the cycle of all of that happening because obviously the return to work agreement went through multiple iterations. So, um, but as far as this contract goes, there's nothing in this contract that addresses that one way or the other. Uh, it's just not, it wasn't an issue that was part of this negotiation. Okay. Thank you, sir. Microphone A. Hi, my name is Matt Roulard. I have one quick question, an easy question, and a second question that's not so easy. First question is, um, under this new contract, does the old 2020 Netflix contract still apply, or have you guys fixed that in terms of residuals not getting paid anything after seven years? I saw something up there, eight to 10 years, and there's, but there's been no mention if the Netflix contract has been folded in or if it still exists as it was in 2020. Do you want to say your other question too, or we want to do them one by one? You said you had one hard one and one easy one. Was that yeah. the hard one yeah. or the easy that one? That was the easy one. Okay. <laughs> Give us the hard one too. Okay. Um, okay. So, as we all know, the corporate mantra in the United States is it's better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. My concern about AI is the way the contract's currently worded 
with words like best of ability and it puts the onus on production to decide how many days we would get paid as a principal performer um, in a scene. Also, it doesn't mention anything about overtime. It just says that to their best honor effort, honest efforts that they would honor whatever overtime we might get being used as a digital replica. My concern is five years from now under this current contract, I'm watching a show or someone travels to Japan or Brazil and says, hey, I saw you in this TV show and nobody knows about it. Um, or in the America, Netflix puts on a show and shows me with a different nose. And I come to you guys and I say, hey, that's me. <laughs> What's gonna happen? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's. <laughs> They're talking Netflix. Okay, so on the Netflix contract, I'm assuming you're referring to the 2019 contract. It was renegotiated last year. Um, and that, so as part of that agreement, we did uh, agree to sync that contract up with the AMPTP agreement, but it does still exist as a separate agreement. So there are provisions that are governed by the Netflix agreement, and there are other things that are governed by the AMPTP agreement with respect to the employment of performers uh, by Netflix. So a lot of the economic terms are driven by this agreement, but there are some special terms that apply to Netflix productions that are still, you know, still there and still in that agreement, and that agreement will continue forward, um, you know, side by side with the AMPTP agreement as well. So, um, so the, the, all the improvements in the residuals, yes. that you don't get paid anything between seven in and 20. In their current Netflix agreement, we don't get paid anything after the seventh year until the 20th year, and then it's renegotiated. Oh, no, no, no. Um, that's, that, no. The, the Netflix residual and the residual that we just described for the AMPTP are exactly the same. You are talking about an imputation methodology in the Netflix agreement for what happens if Netflix produces a theatrical motion picture and then moves it onto the platform. And it's, I, I know what you're talking about, I'd have to go back and look at the language, but it's not the case that you don't get anything between year seven and 20. Um, there is, you know, I'm not gonna remember the details of it now, but that's one tiny piece of the residual formula that you're talking about. Okay, and so then your second part was this sort of question about you know what happens uh, with the concept of begging for forgiveness rather than asking for permission or if there's a violation of the consent requirements, et cetera. So uh, all of those are fully enforceable through our grievance and arbitration process. So, and the remedy that's provided by our contract for all types of violations is, is money. Um, so, you know, when you go and you sue, or when you, in this case, present a grievance, present a claim and a grievance in arbitration, you ask for a certain amount of money to account for the violation of a contract to violation of your rights. This would be true for any kind of violation, and it's equally true for violation of any of the provisions of the AI section of the contract. And so, you know, depending upon what the nature of that violation is, that would really determine how much money would you or we would ask for in that kind of arbitration. There is a cap on the amount of money that can be demanded in an arbitration under our contract, and if you exceed that cap, then the forum becomes a lawsuit in court instead of an arbitration. But it doesn't mean that you lose the right to pursue that claim or pursue that grievance, it just means it happens in a courtroom instead of in an arbitration hearing. So my answer to your question is, you know, just like every other provision we have in this contract, we'd be monitoring to make sure that they are not violating the contract. We do that through mechanisms we have in place as well as through our members letting us know when you find out, whether it's from your own observation or from a family member or a friend or a fan or just however, that something has been done that violates the requirements, then we initiate an enforcement procedure, we pull together the evidence, we file a claim, we take it to arbitration, or if it's outside of those limits, then it goes into a lawsuit setting. And so that's exactly what we would do with respect to AI as well in the event of a violation, just like any kind of contract violation. So 
um, you know, how do you stop them from choosing to beg for forgiveness instead of ask for permission is by making sure that the damages that come out of those proceedings are high enough that it is in their incentive to ask for permission rather than beg for forgiveness. And while there are times when people do the wrong thing, uh, when you look at things like our clip use provisions, our other types of reuse provisions from our contracts, they are largely complied with because companies don't want to risk the consequences of taking on additional damages in a lawsuit or in an arbitration proceeding. So that's, you know, that would be my answer to that. The one other thing I would just say about enforcement, because it's come up and it's somewhat relevant to your question, is we have been meeting with AI companies about creating AI tools for us to use to help with enforcement of these contract claims, including identifying situations where there may have been modifications made to footage or other things that might make it harder to detect that it is a unauthorized reuse or something like that, but where these AI tools can help us do that. Think Shazam, right? Think things like that. So we're looking to actively create those types of tools to help further our enforcement efforts. And uh, I don't have anything specific that I can tell you today about exactly how that's going to play out. But I personally feel that we absolutely should use AI to help us enforce against AI. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, my, so the addendum to that, to that question is, um, how many of us in this room have open claims right now under the existing contract for late fee payments or for unpaid residuals or for any other issue with SAG? Um, I see a few hands. I know a lot of people are reticent. Most of us have claims. My concern, and this is just a faith question, is that SAG is failing right now at resolving claims that currently exist, easy claims. Like, late, like NBC has openly said, we're not going to pay late fee payments. Come at us. I was told by a SAG representative, we can't get your late fee payment because MDBC is refusing to pay it, and they said take us to court. So when AI becomes a multi-trillion dollar, pro, uh, when, in a few years, by the time the next contract negotiations co come around in 2026, it'll probably be cheaper to replicate us than it will to be actually use us on set. So how is SAG going to have the resources or capacity to worldwide police how much of our AI is being used? when they can't even get late fee payments. I mean, that's my concern. And, I, and I, I respect you guys and the hard work you're doing, but we need to realistically look at, this is a Pandora's box, and by allowing SAG members to be scanned at all, where, I mean, if you guys can't protect us, and you guys can't, I can't time. go to court? I can't take my- We're can't. at time. Okay, so, how, so what, my question is, how can you guys convince us that you're gonna be able to protect us when you can't protect us right now? Well, my, my biggest, you know, issue with the way that question is framed is the you and us, because we are you, you are us. This is not, this organization feel that is an organization that's made of SAG-AFTRA members. It's run by SAG-AFTRA members. Our leadership are volunteer SAG-AFTRA members who do an extraordinary job. And so, you know, one of, the, one of the things we proposed in this very negotiation was to increase late fee penalties. Why did we propose to increase late fee penalties? Because we know that things that cost them more money make more of an impact and motivate their behavior differently. And I'm sure you probably, since you seem like you're following all this pretty closely, you probably are aware that when we published the chart at the beginning of the strike, it said in the chart that what their response to that was, we know that we pay late and we aren't going to increase our, we aren't going to agree to increase the late fee payments or late fee amounts because we don't think that's going to help us to pay on time and we're going to continue paying late notwithstanding that. Everyone acknowledges that the late fee situation is a huge problem and part of the problem is that the late fees aren't enough monetarily to motivate them to do what they need to do. That won't be the case with payments for AI use, especially for payments uh, in the event of them failing to secure the informed consent that's explicitly required by the contract. And so, you know, is there, is there a likelihood that there will be disputes that we will have to litigate all the way through the process as part of this at the beginning? I think, yeah, that's, that is likely to happen because this is a new area that hasn't been regulated by our contract at all before. But um, over time, I fully expect that whatever disputes there are about the interpretation of the contract language will be resolved and that the consent process will work smoothly and will consistently be complied with, just like the clip use processes. 
I mean, just, you know, there's a whole business of people whose job it is to go out there and make sure that productions have the right clip consent before they air. And there's going to be a whole business on these sides of these studios of people whose job it is to make sure that they have the proper informed consent before these things go forward. So I, I hear you, and I just say, uh, one other thing I would just say is, I, I fully expect that after we approve 130 pages of new regulations, we're gonna need some additional resources to help enforce those things. So, you know, as I've already warned our negotiating committee and board, they can expect that there will be a proposed budget from me in the next fiscal year that will provide additional resources for the enforcement of those provisions. Thank you, Mr. Ruloff. Thank Ula. you for your candor. Uh, microphone B. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Cass, and we have a couple of questions regarding stunt performers. I'm here with Evelyn Vaccaro and Victoria Lee Perella. Um, how will stunt performers be protected from having actors use digital doubles to take away our jobs because they are financially incentivized to do so? So, I'm um, oh, sorry, are we doing, are we trying to get all the questions or am I doing one by one? Just want to know what we're doing. Oh, there's several people, so Let, oh, okay. maybe we should just do one at a time. Let's do one at a time. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So, um, a few things. Number one, stunt performers' jobs are protected from being taken away by um, synthetic fakes in the same way that everyone's jobs are protected from being taken away by synthetic fakes, which is by the notice requirement and our right to bargain over that use which means that the same strategy that I was talking about earlier would be applied to stunt performers, which is to make sure that the cost of using synthetic fakes to do work that would have previously been done by a stunt performer is at least equal or greater um, so that there is not an economic incentive for the companies to do that. Number two is the fact that um, you know, there's this concern about digital replication being used to replace stunt performers uh, for stunts, and I want to just point, first of all, just point something out. Right now, what any type of digital replication that's being done where one person is being substituted for another is being done through the technology that I described where it's essentially a like deep fake technology where you're moving one person's face onto another person's body. I challenge you to find examples of actual practical stunts that have been replaced by a completely digital replication of that stunt because it is actually very hard and very expensive to do that. So what is more likely to happen is that a stunt performer will continue to do the stunt, will continue to do a practical stunt, but instead of them designing the stunt around the stunt performer being unrecognizable but kind of looking like the principal and not showing their face, et cetera, or doing quick cutaways or other things of that nature, they may use digital replication to do that. But in that situation, the stunt performer's job is protected because the stunt performer is still doing the work. The stunt performer doesn't have to be recognizable in order to be entitled to residuals, as you know. And so what in that case happens is you actually have two performers doing the work. You have the stunt performer still having their job, still getting paid, and you have the face let's say, of the principal performer that's being used as a digital replica to be attached to the body of the stunt performer who's done that job. In that case, the principal performer will have to be paid for the use of their digital replica, unless they're Schedule F, in which case it'll be included in their compensation, and the stunt performer will have to be, be, have to be paid just as normal. So I think the actual threat to stunt performers is the same threat that there is to everyone, which is the synthetic fake concern, that at some point in the future, generative AI will be good enough to create whole scenes that are suitable without any human participation in them at all. That is not presently the case, but that's why we have that language regarding notification and bargaining to protect against synthetic fakes. And the last thing I'll say about how we're gonna protect against stunt performers being replaced, especially in, in terms of doubling, is what I mentioned before about the writers, which is when we prepare and provide to our members writers that exclude granting consent for the use of their face to replace a stunt performer, as opposed to being used in conjunction with a stunt performer to perform a stunt scene, that will help preserve those stunt performer jobs as well. So I think it's a multifaceted approach that's required, but I, you know, we are very committed to making sure that all of our members, stunt performers, loopers, voiceover actors, et cetera, um, are protected from the loss of their jobs through the use of AI tools, whether digital replication or in the more generative AI synthetic fakes area. Next. Hi. Um, so I have a question based off of um, when you said 
when you were talking about like the AI using features, different people's features, like Julia Roberts' smile, um, how are we supposed to prove that like that piece is us and like what, what is, what like is gonna track that? Sure, so one of the requirements of that um, of that provision is that the generative AI system is prompted to use that feature by name. So it'd be, so the way that would actually work is you would have a, an AI system that's been trained with who knows what, right? Because this could be a third party tool. It could be something developed by OpenAI or Microsoft or any company that's not signatory to this contract, Google, for example. Um, so, so if one of our signatory companies uses a tool like that and says, okay, tool, generate a, an, uh, you know, a 300-pound uh, sumo wrestler with Julia Roberts' smile, right? If that were what it generated, then that prompt is traceable, and that prompt is how we would then prove that they had breached that consent right if they didn't go to Julia Roberts and say, is it okay if we create a sumo wrestler that has your smile? So that's how that would actually work is through the audit trail of that prompting. Okay, um, and then my other question is, when we were talking about, or you guys were talking about the stunt coordinator's flat deal and saying that, um, you know, about not coming in earlier or staying later than necessary, I feel like that's very vague. Like, who's mm -hmm. determining what's necessary? No, that's a, it's a, well, it's then necessary to supervise stunt action. So it's not just a generic necessary, it's a specific necessary. So if there's stunt action going on, then clearly the flat deal stunt coordinator can be expected and required to be present for that. And if there's you know, rigging that's going on before that, or if there's some activity that they need to do, then they can be required to be there before that. But if, you know, I think that's where the enforcement is, because it's not just a necessary, but it's necessary to supervise stunt action. And that's how we'll enforce that. And again, if we find out from our stunt coordinator community that this is not doing the trick, or we f have a lot of scenarios where people come to us and say they're violating this, then we may have to, um, in the next round, again, pursue this issue and, and find a different solution. But I'm optimistic because it's so obvious why this is important that um, we'll be able to enforce it with the language that we have in this round. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Is that the, all you got all? That, okay, thank you. <laughs> Microphone A. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Dickinson. Um, I have another question about enforcement. If you could just elaborate maybe on some of the concrete plans you have for the enforcement, particularly in the generative AI. Uh, I'm aware a lot of this stuff goes on in the post-production process. Uh, do you foresee, foresee perhaps like a special department at SAG or more uh, closely uh, involved with the post-production process regarding the generative AI to enforce this? Uh, I'm not currently contemplating a special department for post-production, but I, you know, I think as we see how this plays out, then that certainly, I wouldn't rule that out. But I do wanna just flag it to say at this moment, we don't have information to suggest that there's gonna be a widespread use of generative AI in the post-production editing process or certainly in the creation of synthetic fake actors. Um, there may be some use, but as so long as the use complies with those traditional editing concepts and limitations, then that's not gonna be a violation. So we'll definitely be watching for it. We'll, I think members will be letting us know if they observe that there's been something done that they think exceeds that limitation, and if we agree, then we'll certainly file grievances and look to enforce that and secure additional compensation for them as well. But, um, but I think we'll have to see if a specialized department or function for that is the best way or if it's a better way to provide additional training for our staff who work across all of the contracts areas so that we have, um, you know, we have more eyes on the situation than we would have in a specialized team. So that's to be determined. Thank you. Thank you. My, 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 my name is Randy Barrier. I have a couple of quick questions about AI, which hey, I think Randy. is going to completely destroy this industry. So um, now, when are we asked for our consent? In the availability check email? Before we get the holding? How does it, how does it work? And if, so, if I say yes, what's the equipment like? Is there a room with three or four or five cameras? How does it work? So, so the a point at which they get consent could, could vary. 
the soonest it would be is when you're engaged for the project, but they could also ask your consent after you've been engaged. So you they, mean I could get an availability check, Randy, we need bar patrons for Friday, and they're not gonna mention anything about AI, and then I walk into holding and they say, we No, want because remember, there's a 48 hour notice requirement. Right. So there's two things that protect you from that happening. One is they need to have, they need to get your informed consent, and the other is there's a 48 hour notice requirement, so it's not done at the last minute. So what I'm saying is, and, and maybe, maybe you're, you're thinking about a background engagement that's for one day. Um, right. If you're thinking about a background engagement that's for one day, then clearly they're gonna have to notify you probably when you're initially engaged, depending on how right. far the availability that's check when they ask, are you Could available? Be. Right, I mean, there's Do no. You, will, can, can we scan you? That will be in the availability check, right? S so, uh, it's really hard to answer questions when people interrupt me in the middle of a sentence, so if it's possible, let me just finish my answer, that would be great, and then you can continue on with more questions. But the answer to your question is, well, there's no restriction on them letting you know as early in advance as they want to that they intend to ask for your consent to create a digital replica. Say that again? When they can, ask, they can advise you as early on in the process as they want to right. that they intend to ask you to create a digital replica. Right. When they actually secure your consent is going to require them to give you reasonably specific details of what the use of that replica is. Right. And my expectation is that will happen when you're actually hired, when you're engaged, not just in a bail check, but when you're actually told you're booked. That, that at that time they will say, and here's a consent that you will need to sign for purposes of being scanned. They're gonna book me without knowing if I wanna be scanned or not? Well, that's why I'm saying it'll be up to them because they will tell you as early as they're prepared to tell you if they've decided that. I, you know, it is quite likely that most background actors will not be scanned because the cost of scanning and replication may not make sense, especially in light of the obligation to hire human background actors to cover, to fill all covered positions. So that's something that we'll have to, we'll have to see how that plays out, but you're entitled to 48 hours notice right. of the desire to scan or at the time of engagement if you're booked less in advance <laughs> than that. And you have to have informed consent yeah, about the reasonably specific consent. details of the scanning that's going to be done. Yes. And okay. that's the answer. Now, will all production companies, like I Productions, Blue Bloods, uh, Law & Order, everybody wants to scan or some don't want to do it, some do want to do it? Do you even know that yet? Well, that's going to be a production by production and possibly even high, you know, person by person decision for those companies because they're not going to want well, to pay you. wouldn't their parent you. companies tell them what to do? I'm so sorry, what? Wouldn't their parent companies tell them what to do, like Netflix? If, if there is a decision that they want to scan every single background actor, then perhaps the Netflix will tell them whatever company is producing the project under the contract has the contractual obligations to comply with all of the terms we've talked about. Um, my expectation from what they've told us and from observation of what's happening is that some projects will want more scans than others. Some projects won't want to incur the cost. Some projects, it's worth it for them to do it. So it will depend on the production. And they may not choose to scan everybody. They may only choose to scan some people. Right. I, I'm never going to be scanned. So that's just <laughs> not going to happen. Okay. So um, do I have a future? Of course you do. Of course you do. Because... Remember, one of the things that's required under this contract is that every production has to fill all covered background positions with human actors. Okay. So the, absolutely, both in productions that don't want to scan people, you'll have a future, and also in productions that do want to scan people, if they are not needing to scan everyone, you'll have a future in those projects too. So I expect you will have uh, you know, a very consistent future with your present. Okay. All right, finally... Um now, you keep on saying the tech, you know, banning is not an option. Uh, taking it off the table for this contract is not an option. Why? Is the AMPTP pressuring you to use AI? Did they already sign a contract with some software? Because that's a software. People write the software, right? And it's owned by companies. So the AMPTP, did they come up with a contract with somebody and say, to SIG after negotiating committee, we're using this, so push it. Why can't you say no and say, no, we're not using any AI. It's causing too much strife, stress. Let's table it for three years. Why can't you do that? Because Table it. Because 
the companies won't agree to that. Why? Because they don't want their hands to be tied while companies like Google and YouTube <laughs> and others can go out and Why do, do you they want. care? You're SAG. Why do you care about Why their problems? Why do I care because this is a negotiation. You tell them no, I don't care. That's your problem. You hear the We're answer. not being scanned. And the answer to your question is, do you want to have a collective bargaining agreement? Not do while being wanna, scanned. Do you want to have a collective bargaining agreement that provides for restrictions on what these companies can do with AI, which our current collective bargaining agreement does not? Or do you want to bargain to impasse, let the, let the companies implement their version of that agreement, which, by the way, would have no protections for you at all? Is that your preferred outcome? Because I don't see why it would be. That is way worse for you. As someone who doesn't want to be scanned, that's way worse for you. How? Than because you would have no right to say no, because you'd have no right yes, to I information. Can. If I walk into holding and somebody walks up to me, okay, we're going to scan you guys. I'm going to call you and say, look what happened. You got to stop them. And you would not have a contractual protection. Uh, you would not have don't an informed legally, consent protection. Really. No, I'm. You're at time, so that's the fact. Take and the you know, if you, you don't want to hear the answer, that's fine. If you disagree with it, that's fine. Uh, I don't know why you ask a question not wanting to hear the answer, but the answer is there's no protection in this contract right now for AI. That is not an arguable fact. Look at it, and if you think there is one, I suggest you. No, of you course there's not, but you can still right. stop it. Right. Okay. So you're at time. We're at time. So, we're, at time. It's a, we're at time, Randy. It's That's a negotiation. It. That's it. And and those. I know how to solve it. Just sit across the table from them and say no AI. Okay. Period. Microphone. That's it. Microphone A. Sure. You can't. You can't. Hi. Everybody. I can't deny it. That's just not true. I mean, you can keep saying it because you think that it's true, but it's not true. Because the fact is, this is a negotiation. We withheld the services of our members for 118 days from these companies. We shut this industry down for four months from these companies. The, the fact is, these companies were willing to have the industry continue to be shut down. They were willing to cancel television and feature films and everything else because they are not willing to accept something where they have to go tell their shareholders that other companies and competitors to them can do something. I understand you don't care about that, but I'm telling you, this is a negotiation. And if you are actually thinking about what we can achieve and how we can protect our members, then you have to think about what it is that can be gained in a contract. You can't pretend like you can walk in the room and just dictate whatever terms you want. <laughs> they are not dictating to us. This is a negotiation. Believe me, if they were dictating terms to us, these 15 pages of limitations on them wouldn't exist. That's not dictating to us. And I'm sorry if you could maybe not shout out. That'd be great. Thank you. So I'm sorry. You're just incorrect. And I understand you believe it genuinely, but that's wrong. It's not true. And the you know the <laughs> this contract started in 1937. Everything that's in this contract that protects you every day has been hard fought by other negotiating committees and members like you. The reason you benefit from residuals, the reason you benefit from a benefit plan, is because of strikes that were taken in 1960. But do you know what? Did they get everything that they wanted in 1960? No, they did not. They did not because you can't just dictate terms. You fight, you maximize your leverage, and you negotiate the best possible deal. That's what happened in this case, and if you don't see it, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you. You're Thank at you. time. Microphone A. Microphone, microphone A. Microphone A. Thank you. Microphone A has the microphone. <laughs> Thank you for your kind attention. Hi. Uh, Tyler Bunch, uh, union member for coming up on geez, 30 years. Uh, I am a member of the dubbing committee and uh, hopefully a leadership uh, member of the hopefully soon to be seated puppeteer committee. Um, don't want to necessarily Tyler Bunch, I said. Tyler Bunch, T Y L E R B N C H. <laughs> IMDb. Um, I don't want to say I speak for my peers in the puppeteering community uh, specifically, but I do believe what I'm about to say is a reflection of their concerns. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for all your hard-fought efforts to increase minimums across the board. Puppeteers, uh, in general, don't have a lot of leverage, so we're typically working for those minimums, for those scale amounts. So every dollar you fought for, uh, we are more than appreciative of and can buy more sandwiches. Um, <laughs> the overwhelming concern, however, is that the language that at least appears to be in the summaries that have been put forth 
doesn't really specifically support our endeavors. What do I mean? The, uh, when AI, any imagery, you're dealing with a still image to still image, that uh, idiosyncratic character-based movement across frame is what creates the engagement, the impressiveness, the original performance. Um, we are consistently battling to make sure we are still considered principal performers. There are a couple of regions with this, especially with, sorry to say it, AI, that it feels as if the language protects union members as brand, as image, versus union members as performer, as actor, as uh, helping the story and how the images move across the screen. Tonight, everyone talked about the specific imagery and how are we gonna know if it's our imagery. We are concerned, puppeteers are concerned about how are you gonna protect our performance when it is used to create art artificially uh, intelligence informed images on the screen. If they're using our performance to make a pod of creatures all look like they move in the same way and it's been a singular performer that's helped to create that. Uh, the safeguards don't seem to be in place to protect us of that sort of thing. Uh, there is a concern that the language negates performer as, or pardon me, puppeteer as principal on-camera performer in the way that the safeguards are worded. Now, my specific question. Um, very happy about the increase of the Schedule F. Specifically, I worked under the theatrical version of it a couple times. The, the price <laughs> was the same for almost 25 years. Um, Glad to see those increases. However, you even mentioned it earlier today that AI scenarios won't necessarily be providing additional compensation to Schedule F folks. Just so you understand, as a Schedule F performer, as a puppeteer, I report for every day of principal photography. It's not like the typical individual that does it. And over the scan of whatever it is, I will work every day. If they use stuff that they've decided to scan on a work day to create two weeks, two months worth of extra stuff, I've actually fulfilled the obligation of my contract in terms of the time that I've spent. They are now using over and above my work to inform what looks like a three month, six month shoot. Yes. I don't feel like the Schedule F carve out for specific things unless there is a limit. If you've exhausted the term of the contract in terms of the days that you work under that contract, they should have to pay you more. And if there's a way to tweak that language, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Tyler. Thanks. And very, uh, very detailed and well-informed questions. So first of all, to the, to the question of how um, puppeteers are protected. So puppeteers are defined in this contract as principal performers as part of our scope language. And the language in the generative AI section and the digital replication section applies to puppeteers as performers equally as it does in other areas. Now, I recognize there's some challenges because of the fact that um, if you're, you know, if the companies decide to try and argue that uh, particular, um, uh, you know, puppeteer performance that you're doing falls within certain of the exceptions that are listed. For example, the um, there's an exception that has to do with the customary use of digital technologies to generate non-human characters. So we're, we will have to, potentially, if they try to misuse that provision, we may have to defend puppeteers in an arbitration or in a grievance process on that point. I do want to note that that applies to customary use of digital technologies. So what that provision was meant to address was CGI characters that they traditionally would create that way without you know, the services of a puppeteer. We're very committed to making sure the puppeteer community is protected and we will use the language uh, in the synthetic fakes section as well as in the digital replication section to apply to puppeteer performances just like it applies to any other principal performance. Um, I think I wanted to turn the other half of this question over to you, Ray, if I may. Uh, a, because I'm forgetting what it was, lost my train of thought, but B. Schedule F. Uh, oh, the schedule, or thank you, the schedule F piece. Um, can you address that? Sure. So uh, the reason that there is a carve out for additional compensation for schedule F performers is because under a schedule F contract, they could bring you back to do the work yourself and not pay you any additional compensation. That's the nature of a schedule F contract. So uh, as to the compensation component, there's a carve out. But as to the consent component, there isn't. They still have to get your consent as a Schedule F performer to create the digital replica, to use the digital replica. If they want to use it in another picture or another field or medium, they have to go through all the same consent requirements. But if they are using the digital replica, for example, on the picture for which you were engaged, 
um, they are, and they are using it in lieu of you, it doesn't affect your compensation. Your compensate, you were bought out for that picture, so what it actually does is reduce the amount of time that you have to report to set because on the day they're using the digital replica, they don't need you. So, um, you know, that's why there is a carve out for Schedule F in terms of requiring additional compensation. You can always bargain for additional compensation, uh, but the contract doesn't establish that as a minimum. You're, you're assuming that they're going to keep a 13-week shoot to a post version of a 13-week shoot. I'm literally proposing that Lord of the Rings, they want to create a, a new tribe of whatever the heck, or on some planet far, far away, that there is a post scenario where they extend the quote unquote shoot. And they are doing things with our work to create a, a film that looks like it took six months to shoot on a film that took 13 weeks to shoot. Mm -hmm. And and how, how does that get protected? And the answer may be there is none. We just Well, no, there a is protection against that because if they're extending the shoot, they have to come back and get your informed consent to that continued use and you could just say no at that point because if you've already been engaged, like if you've already been hired and booked as a Schedule F performer and paid as a Schedule F performer, and by the way, in that scenario, you've, I think, according to what you're saying, already worked in person for part of that as well, then they're not gonna be in a very good position to recast you now. And even if they do, they still have to pay you in full because they've already committed to that when you were engaged. So really, I think you're, you will have the ability to control how much of that use goes on. And if you feel like they're being abusive about it, you and other cast members can simply say, if you're gonna expand our role that much, then you need to pay additional compensation. That wasn't the deal. You know, and so that's, that is the right that you'll have. Um, and of course, if they had negotiated that at the beginning, if they had told you at the very beginning, here's the extent of the use of your digital replica, then you would have taken that into consideration in negotiating your deal as well, I assume. And if, because you said at the beginning that a lot of times puppeteers are working at minimums, if what that means in this context is you would have done that work under the Schedule F minimum, whatever that would be, for that time period, if you would have accepted to do that amount of work for Schedule F minimum in the first place, then it'll be the equivalent of that. But none of it can be done without your consent, whether it was obtained at the beginning or whether it was obtained later on if they decide to make a change to the, um, to the plan. Thank you, sir. We're gonna move on to line B. Uh, who's the last person in line B here in this column? Raise your hand. You're so, okay, so you were sort of the last one in line B. Line A, last person, then. We're gonna step the lines here. No more additions. Line B, you're on. Hi, my name is Heather Spore. Hello. And I also came here very nervous about AI, and I just needed some specific questions answered. I happen to be standing in line behind John, which was, uh, who was sitting over there on the, on the committee. And in five minutes, he really quelled my anxieties by um, what he said uh, when we were chatting. Um, and so I'm sorry that he's not here. But um, if you could just specifically answer, I have just a three-pronged question. Answer these questions. I think this would help other people understand what John kind of uh, inferred to me. Um, regarding AI and being scanned for a job, can that scan be used for anything else aside from the scene that you were scanned for? Can they use it for other scenes, episodes, or seasons of the contracted show or film for any other character other than what you were originally hired for? Do you want to give all the questions? You want to do one more? Okay, way? that's the question. That's one. Okay. And regarding usage, can you define reasonably specific when it comes to what the producers have to divulge on the usage of a, of a digital replica? And is our likeness non-transferable to any other company, even if a production company goes bankrupt? Uh, okay, so first of all, can the scan be used for anything else besides what you were originally scanned for, i.e. other characters, scenes, etc.? It cannot be used for anything beyond what you consented to when you were originally engaged for that scan without your further consent obtained at the time of use. So that means that if they scan you for you know, a particular feature and then that same company later decides they wanna ask you for permission to use that in another different 
feature or a, a TV episode or whatever, they have to come back to you in advance. They have to tell you precisely what it is they want to do with your digital replica in terms of that reasonably specific information. And then you can say yes or no and negotiate for additional compensation for that if you wish to do so. So, um, so the, that's a long way of saying the answer is no, it can't be used for anything besides what you were um, consenting to when the scan was originally done without seeking further consent from you. Um, as far as usage goes, def uh, the definition of reasonably specific, you know, our lawyers like this definition because reasonably specific is a term uh, that is defined in law and especially the reasonably part. It's an objective standard that's evaluated by what a reasonable person would consider as sufficient information to make the kind of decision about granting or denying your consent. And so there are some examples of that that we talked about during the course of bargaining, but we didn't want to limit it only to those examples and neither did the companies because we want to make sure that this encompasses uh, a variety of different situations and in every case that we don't um, let them provide anything less than what a reasonable person would consider necessary to make an important decision like that. So, um, so that's you know that's the legal definition. Um, our lawyers feel that it because the word reasonably is so um, well defined in law that it is uh, a strong way for us to protect members in this kind of scenario, and uh, we expect to that that in actuality these companies will um, really err on the side of caution because of the consequences of being found by an arbitrator not to have secured the necessary informed consent because then they will owe damages to the performers involved for that. And so, so that's our expectation. And then as far as the question of transferability of likeness, uh, it's the same answer as any kind of use of the scan. The answer is not without your informed consent. So whatever you've consented to as part of the use of your likeness to create a digital replica, that they can do, but nothing beyond that, including transferring it to any third party or allowing anyone else to use it without coming back to you and asking for your informed consent at the time of use. Can I just add that uh, I think what is uh, c concerning members who are not lawyers, these terms are very well known in, in the industry of law, mm -hmm. and, and so you guys understand them, but, but when John explained it to me, he didn't use those terms, and it was, it was quite easy for me to digest um, and understand, and uh, I feel a, little, a lot better about it, but these terms are not resonating with our members, and so if there's any way, just a second, if, if there's any way we could um, try to get more Johns to like kind of give us some ideas, sure. that I think that would help. Um, because it took five minutes for him to completely dissolve my concerns. So I just want to make sure that you guys know that those personal things, we don't understand all this. We, we understand to read the contracts that we, we read every day, but um, a little personal touch I think will go a long way with some of the concerns. You can see the passion in the room. Great. Great. Okay. Awesome. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Yeah. Microphone A. Thank you, brother. Stuart Schnitzer, long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> first, I'd like to thank you all for the hard work you put in for the past 118 days. You know, it's, not, it's, it's been appreciated, and the strike captains, everybody, the staff, and all the members who went out to pick it, thank you all for showing up. Now, my question is, if you make a digital copy of me, as background, let's say, and pay for me for one day on set, but use my copy for two weeks, and the 25 or 85 on set every other day manage to get overtime, night premium, smoke or wet peg, or golden time. Will my digital copy get that also added to my checks, or will it be only straight eights? And will my voucher for those two weeks reflect that money on my voucher? And who is going to police that if I'm not there on set for those two weeks, except for that one day? Thank you. Sure. And so the answer is because the contract language says they can't oh, okay. evade your engagement by use of a digital replica, your digital replica would be, <laughs> you, well not your digital replica because it's you, you would be entitled to payment for the use of your digital replica along the same lines as the performers who actually worked 
in that same scene. So who would police that? You and we together would police that. Obviously, you'll receive a paycheck for those amounts. And if you believe that that paycheck is incorrect, you'll let us know, you'll file a claim, we'll investigate it, and we'll determine, based on looking at things like other people's pay records, based on looking at other records of what happened on those days of the project, we'll determine if, if we've got the evidence to support that claim, and if so, we'll file it, and we'll get you paid for uh, any amount under the amount that they should have paid. So that's how that'll happen. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stuart. Microphone B. What's up, people? Jamel, what? Jamel Wilson, um, SAG actor and stunt performer from New York. I got a few questions. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it short. But um, me, I'm, I'm what you call the journeyman actor. Like, I don't, I'm not making a hundred million dollars <laughs> in my career right now. I hope to one day. And um, half of us in this room is not making that much, you know? I'm just gonna be real. So my thing is, is like with the AI, you know, when it comes down to some, some of us, we're not scheduled at performance. Some of us are background, some of us are guest stars, co-stars, they play recurring. So with that being said, a lot of times, you know, we make money on ADR, reshoots, and things of that nature. So when it comes down to um, a digital replica or general AI, you know, like, will that take away our jobs? That's one thing, like, take away those days and those options. And then, two, if that does take away that option, when we refuse the job, of course we're not going to get hired, so where does that leave us? And then also, since... We getting so much things put into this health comp, this health plan, the pension and health. Where does that come, Where does that fall as far as lowering our, you know, our, our qualification to join the health plan? Because it's twenty seven hundred, and sometimes, like, I ain't even going front. I got Medicaid. <laughs> I ain't got the, um, I, I ain't got the um, the SAG health plan because I can't afford it. And that, this is probably like the. The last two years have probably been the best two years of my of my career. And then when we went on strike, that left me in a in a rough spot. I take care of my grandfather, he's elderly, he's 89 and stuff like that. My check is dependent on, you know? So with that being said, I can't afford to not have those options in place to help me even provide for my family members. Thank, Thank you. President. Sure. Yeah. So uh, if they create a digital replica of you for purposes of using it uh, in a, for ADR, for a reshoot, uh, for any of the things of that nature that you're referencing, then they will need to pay you for that. And the way they pay you for that is they estimate, and this is a minimum, you can always negotiate for better, but they estimate the number of days that you would have had to work in order to do that work in lieu of your digital replica. So the whole point is to replace the income that you lose if they decide to use your digital replica instead of you in those circumstances. The, the very problem that you are articulating in terms of how that lost work would affect you is the thought process that went into negotiating the minimum use fee for a digital replica. So we don't want you to lose out on the ADR or on the reshoot. We want Look, we want them to hire you, but if they're going to use a digital replica instead of you, we want them to pay you the same as if they hired you. So that is how the contract is set up on that point. Um, as far as uh, the qualification for uh, health, uh, I think it's significant to note that any money they pay you for the use of a digital replica is treated as wages for all purposes, including pension and health contributions. So if they use the digital replica for a reshoot and then they pay you what you would have made to do that reshoot, they have to pay the P&H money on that digital replica money. And by the way, when they go to calculate your residuals and they look to how much did this person work on the program because for, um, for residuals that are based on time and salary units, they have to look at your time. They include the sum total of not just what you work, but how much they used your digital replica to. So your digital replica's time on set, quote unquote, 
counts in your favor for purposes of determining what your share of that pooled residual is going to be. And then the last thing I will say is just to remind us, because you mentioned that the strike put you in a, a tight spot, and I sympathize with that strike put many people in a tight spot, um, just to reemphasize the fact that as part of the strike suspension agreement, we negotiated for lowered qualification amounts. It's not going to be 27000 for next year, depending on what your qualification period is. If you go online and you, you click on strike suspension agreement, there's a chart in there and it will show you based on your qualification period what your actual qualifying amount is going to be for the next qualifying health period and it's much lower. It's going to be reduced in proportion to how much of that time was occupied by the strike. So basically the strike time gets taken out of consideration and the qualifying amount is recalculated to be the number that it needs to be so that it's no harder for you to qualify than if there hadn't been a strike. So I guess those are the aspects of the deal that I would emphasize in response to your question. All right, and one more thing, like, like as far as the stunt performer in me, you know, a lot of times, like, when we, when we do, um, when, when we on set doing them stunts, we catching wrecks, and those wrecks require us to get adjustments. Now, as a digital replica is created, we not going to get those, those, those stunt adjustments. And those stunt adjustments, like, not for nothing, that covered the taxes that get ate, ate out of our check already. So I'm just, I'm just saying, so how would that compensate? Will the digital replica get the adjustment? Because I'm just asking. Like. No, I mean, it's not that the digital replica is going to get the adjustment. But I mean, again, to, to sort of emphasize the point that Duncan made about this, the, the way that's going to happen for the foreseeable future is not that some synthetic performer is going to, or a synthetic fake, is going to be used instead of a stunt performer. The way that needs to be done in, under the present technology is they're going to map the principal's face onto you mm -hmm. using their digital replica. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, they still have to hire you. So you're still going to be there doing the work, getting the adjustments, et cetera. And what's going to happen is they're going to use the digital replica of the principal on you to make you look like them. But that doesn't take you out of a job. It just makes you look like the principal that you're doubling in the final product. All right, that's my final question. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Microphone A. Hi, um, I'm Annika Connor, New York board member. This is Dave is here. Thank you for your patience with him. Um, I just want to thank all of you for your incredible hard work on negotiating everything that you've done and all the time that you've put into it and all of the time that you've put into things here today mm -hmm. and everybody that was on the picket lines and all the solidarity that you showed. I know we're talking a lot about AI and everyone's very, very concerned about that. But one of the things that I think is really extraordinary in this contract is the protections for women in states that put them in high risk situations. Yeah. So, you know, I think that it's really important to point out that if people are scared about AI and they're voting no on AI, you're also voting no on protecting women, you're voting no on intimacy quarter, coordinators, you're voting no on many, many other things. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about the protection that you're gonna have for women and what that really looks like, and then what you might be doing on a governmental level um, for AI and um, on a federal and state level that extends beyond this contract. So that's my two questions, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. Sure, sure. Um, so the way the protections will work with respect to women who are working uh, in states that have these restrictive laws, as a resident of Texas, I'm sorry to say I live in one of them, um, is twofold. First, there is the health plan benefit. And there's a benefit under the health plan uh, that will pay for you to travel either home or to the nearest state where you can get the care that you need. If you are not covered by the health plan, then this contract provides for funding for um, a benefit that will be created, I think it's through the ECF that we're gonna do that, the Entertainment Community Fund, um, that will cover people who don't have, who haven't qualified for health benefits, they're gonna get the same benefit through a different source. 
Uh, that benefit will also extend to gender affirming care if you're in a place like Texas where uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a problem. Uh, and as well, we will be looking to expand the health plan benefit to include gender affirming care as well. So every which way you look, there's going to be something to cover you to make sure that you can get the health care you need. And is there going to be built into that something that protects the um, actor from retaliation if they need that and they're working in a state that that is very controversial? I mean, I think there will be uh, there will be serious consequences, whether at law or under the agreement, to retaliating against someone for exercising their health benefits or another benefit. So I don't expect that we will see that kind of retaliation. Thank you for including that. And then, um, Duncan, maybe you want to help me with this part, as I'm less familiar with it, the legislative efforts that we are undertaking with respect to AI. Um, I I could do a less adequate job, but maybe you want to do it. Sure, I mean, I, there's a number of them, and I think they all form part of kind of a, a, a mosaic of protection that we're looking to create. One of them, uh, we'll just start from the beginning, one of the earliest pieces was the Human Artistry Campaign, which is part of our support alongside other industry players for the Copyright Office's decision not to allow copywriting of AI creative material which is huge, yeah, you should applaud that because, <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, that's gonna be very helpful in helping make sure that um, any entity, signatory or not, doesn't have a benefit, doesn't have the benefit of copyright to use to monetize content that's created with, ex with AI technology, whether that's performance, whether that's writing, et cetera. Uh, in addition to that, we have a bill that's currently uh, either introduced or about to be introduced in the U.S. Congress to protect image and likeness, uh, give you a federal right of control over the use uh, of your image and likeness, which does not presently exist. Those rights exist under certain state laws, um, and those state laws have some limitations to them. Uh, and, a, and so it will be a great improvement to have a federal version of that right. In addition, we have a bill in the California legislature right now, and I expect if it's successful, it'll expand to other states, <coughs> hint, hint, uh, that, would incl that includes a um, uh, ability to essentially make invalid any kind of consent that's been signed for the creation of an AI replica of someone if that consent was not obtained under the auspices of a collective bargaining agreement or with independent legal representation by a lawyer. Um, and so that obviously would help address some of the, not within the union context, because it's already addressed by this agreement, but for outside of the union context, uh, releases or other consents that people may have signed. For example, if any of you do print modeling that's outside of the union context, you may have signed a release that in retrospect you wish you wouldn't have because maybe it contains AI language. So this is an attempt to address that. Um, we also, uh, I testified at the Federal Trade Commission, I don't know, it was probably a couple of months ago now, um, as part of our support for their AI labeling initiative, which is a, it's a consumer focused initiative, but the goal of it is to make sure that whenever content is created using AI technology, that it's labeled as such so that consumers know when they're consuming AI content. And of course, that could be important for a number of reasons, not the least of which, as we make the case to the public, that human creativity should be rewarded and focused on, it would be very helpful for consumers to know what content has is authentic human content and what isn't, so that they can make their choices about what they choose to support. So those are just some of the legislative initiatives we've got going and government uh, public policy initiatives going to help supplement what we're doing in collective bargaining, because it's we need every single part of that in order to have um, the kind of protective shield that we want to create. Great. Thank you so much for all that legislation work. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Annika. Uh, over to microphone B. Hi, Pascal Armand here. Hello, Pascal. Hi. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start <laughs> off like with easy questions and then whatever. Okay, so one, when do the W&W &W meetings start in New York City? Um, regarding self-taping, if they want to use our self-tapes for public use, do we get paid for it? Um, 
I know that there are protections to pay for us for using our digital replic replicas, but since we're moving further into a world where we have to share our jobs with technology and they believe that we can easily be bought, as it gets cheaper to create the digital replicas, what happens if they decide to pay us off to use the clones rather than the human actor? We know that the longer time goes by, people forget to enforce things they agreed to, and when I'm on a set, I know it's not my job to police people. Uh, what happens if during the time we're allowing to see what'll happen, um, like before the W and Ws and stuff, a loophole we haven't seen because AI is developing exponentially every day, damage is done, guardrails are neglected, and our threading of the AI needle is evaded. What do we do? They would have what we're trying to protect. protect. And I'm on a set busy doing other things. <laughs> um, regarding uh, synthetic fakes, you keep using the examples, I guess that's Duncan, keep using the examples of uh, known am actors being able to track their body parts or their attributes, their smiles and stuff. But who's enforcing the rules for unknown actors like us? Who is going to be honest enough to alert those actors to obtain informed consent and or compensation? Their honor system, ha ha. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, W&W. &W. Sure. Was the first question, when do W&W &W meetings start? Yes, Is that what you yeah, asked? Yes, in New York. <laughs> well, we in haven't scheduled the W&W &W meetings yet for the next round of bargaining. <clears throat> we usually wait till after ratification of the current agreement before we do that. <clears throat> but, you know, it'll be, it'll be roughly, you know, somewhere in the approximately six months to eight months prior to the next round of contract negotiations. So it'll be, you know, in about 2, 2.3, 2.4 years from now, something like that. Um, as far as self-tapes for public use, do you get paid? Yes, if you want to condition your consent on that. They can't use your you know, auditions for anything, any public purpose without your consent. So you could insist on getting paid for that if you even wanted to grant it at all. You may very well choose not to. Um, as far as, uh, as it gets cheaper to create digital replicas, what happens if they pay us off? I assume by that you mean what happens if they choose to use more digital replication and less <clears throat> human performance? <clears throat> I think, you know, first of all, you will have the right to choose whether you want to agree to that or not, but I think it's probably, you know, a similar kind of question that performance capture actors, that other actors who've worked in the type of films where sometimes you're in acting with a CGI, in a CGI environment or green screen acting have to address. And so um, that is probably a topic we will have to take up. I don't think that that is going to happen within the term of this contract. I think that much is fairly clear. Um, what happens if during this time a, upole, a loophole is used um, that we, uh, in essence, I think that was referring to during the window between this contract and the next contract negotiations. No, um, that or, I'm sorry, that or during the, um, I think there's like six months or uh, 90 days, some, some moratoriums were spoken about like where we would have time to be able to let the union know that these um, certain uh, um, violations to the contract were, were Yeah, that was, on the, that was on the self-taping regulations. There's a six month moratorium on claims. That doesn't apply to the AI section. But self-taping, but then also, um, just, I think there was also 90 days for um, who was going to get the, which shows were going to get the bump or something. I'm just saying well, that Well, there's a 90-day window right. in which you evaluate whether a show has met that 20% of viewership criteria. Right. What but I'm, I'm sorry, one second, Duncan. What I'm saying is that during those moratoriums, those times where they're trying to figure out, like, who's going to get what bump and stuff, there's time there for all of the bad things that we're like imagining in our heads to actually materialize. When they do, and we say something about them, then it's just kind of like, oh, we've gotten away with it, or we have their digital replicas. So, okay, like, but let him explain the 90 days. Well, I, I just don't understand how the 90 days relates to that, because if you're talking about AI, if you're talking about concerns that they're gonna do something with AI, the 90 days for the, calculating the viewership of streaming programs doesn't have anything to do with AI at all, nor does the six-month moratorium on self-tape claims. That has nothing to do with AI. So 
I'm, I'm just, you know, with respect to AI, once this contract is ratified and takes effect, then those provisions are in effect. And so if your point is, you know, maybe there's things that will happen during that two and a half years that we haven't anticipated that we'll need to respond to in the next round of bargaining, that's very true. But I do want to point out that all of the consent obligations apply, period. They're not conditioned on the nature of the technology. They're not conditioned on what kind of uses they might come up with that we haven't anticipated yet. That was kind of the whole point of them. So yes, we may have to negotiate for new or different changes to these rules in the next uh, round of bargaining, but it doesn't take away from the informed consent and fair compensation protections that are absolutely guaranteed and committed to by this contract other than, you know, the question of enforcement, which was your last question for digital fakes, you know, if it's not a known actor, uh, how are we enforcing that? We're enforcing it because, as, you, as you'll recall, when we talked about how it works, they have to prompt the generative AI system by name. So if they're prompting that system for your name, no matter what your level of notoriety or fame or whatever is, um, that audit trail exists, they have to notify us that they're doing it, and so if they then use your identifiable facial feature without properly getting your consent, we'll be able to challenge that. So that really doesn't track off of fame other than it may be true that they'll more likely do it with someone who's more famous because that may be part of their motivation, just like sometimes casting is driven by that factor. But in terms of enforcement, we'll be, it'll be equally enforceable regardless of that. But, uh, so I'm just saying as far as, in, uh, as the synthetic fake is concerned, mm -hmm. it would be easier for them to use people who are, don't have a certain amount of notoriety in order to create a whole new image and, you know, let that just go. Like, no one, of course, everybody's going to go um, and going to say, oh my gosh, I know Julia Roberts' smile, but they're not going to recognize my ear. And they can get away with that a whole lot. <laughs> right, but the way but the way that the generative AI system use, works is it's probably not going to use your ear unless it's prompted to use your ear, right? Like that concept is driven by a desire by the companies to have certain elements that are recognizable of particular people combined into a synthetic performer. But a synthetic performer that isn't uh, developed in that way won't have a recognizable feature of anyone. That's sort of the nature of it. And so the protection in that case is the protection of negotiation on the part of the union to make sure that there's not an economic incentive to do that. It's not cheaper to hire, to quote unquote hire, a synthetic fake performer instead of you. That's the protection that actually protects you there. It's not a consent right, it's the economic disincentive of the union making them pay to use a synthetic fake that's trained on any number of people. So a synthetic fake will be um, just as expensive as a digital replica, like making a clone of me through, like with, as, as opposed to making an amalgam of Right, that's the, that's the goal, is to negotiate terms that are just as expensive or perhaps more expensive uh, so that the, there is an incentive to go with a human performer or a human performer plus a digital replica instead of a synthetic fake. And that's not going to get cheaper as we go along? Well, that's why we needed the bargaining right, because the bargaining right, we're not constrained in what we bargain for in that scenario. And if, you know, if ultimately we're unable to reach an agreement, we have the backstop of the grievance and arbitration process. So the whole purpose of that bargaining provision, from my point of view, is two things. One, what I, to do that, to negotiate terms that make sure that it's not advantageous economically for them to do that. And number two, that with bargaining rights under labor law come certain information rights. And so that'll give us the right to demand certain information from them as part of the bargaining process. So those are the two reasons why that right is so important. But all of that is predicated on me giving consent to be scanned for them to even have my ear, my... No, because this could be done by a company like OpenAI that, I mean, like, let's assume for the sake of argument, I don't know, I don't know you, so I don't know if you are, but let's assume that you have a social media account. Let's assume that there's ever been a photograph taken of you ever that has been published on the internet. Oh. OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, have 
may have already or will in the future scrape that information off the internet and use that to train an AI system. So they didn't necessarily get this information from these companies, they probably didn't. They gathered it from their own sources online and now what they're doing is, you know, this company is trying to sell to a Disney, sell to a NBC Universal, a replica, well, a synthetic fake performer that doesn't look like you or any other person recognizably, but is made up of trained images from tens of thousands of people, perhaps. What we're looking to do is not to try and generate, well, I mean, if we could generate a consent right for all 10,000 of those people, that'd be great, but in, re in reality, what we're looking to do is use that bargaining right to make it so that there is not a, uh, it's not cheaper to do that than to hire a human performer and, or, and use their digital replica, because they'll obviously get a better result by doing that. So if it's both equally expensive, um, or, or less expensive to hire the human performer and get a better result, then that's what they'll do. And so that's how we help make sure that your jobs are protected instead of having synthetic fakes out there at some future point trying to compete with you for acting jobs. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. You good, Pascal? <laughs> I'm still debating. Okay, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Thank you. Good Over to microphone right. A. Hi, Ross Weiner. Um, oh, Ross. Now, Look, John Gilbert couldn't stop sound from coming in, and there are a lot of stage actors who were very unhappy with Mr. Edison's machine, and it's gonna happen anyways. We know that, but we nevertheless have to deal with this. A couple of things came to me, I wanna just rattle more fast, and hopefully you can. You, s nothing in the displays I saw talked about dead people, or, but you did mention it once. Now, I understand that gathering information to create a generative AI from um, living actors or from just totally artificial people is, is covered. But what about if some producer wants to pay some 23-year-old in Wuhan to give them Gregory Peck and John Wayne and, you know, Cary Grant? Well, Mrs. Weiner's son isn't gonna compete with that. And the point is, who would get paid? You say they have to pay and get consent. From who? They could create a film of people who don't exist anymore, but there is plenty of information on them. So I'm not sure how you do that. Also, you said that they can use some of this to alter things for local cultural sensitivities. Well, that's a concern because there was, China wanted the American flag taken out of a movie. There are places where they want anything which would um, obscure the fact that someone might be identifiably Jewish out there. And as an actor, I might want to know about that happening before I sign on. So the union has to be careful about these things. And also, um, let's talk about uh, for a moment um, <laughs> Producers who actually read the contract, which is rarely done. Um, Dick Wolf read the contract and discovered that, unlike the commercials contract, the theatrical contract just says first hired. Here it's so time. why so why what is to stop them from saying, okay, we'll hire so many background people, and then we will pay Microsoft or whatever it is to scrape up and create 40 other people, send the Union people home after the first five hours. You're at time. And run a non-union set. Non-union virtual set. Okay, let's see if we can get some answers to that, Ross, thanks. Sure, so starting with the last question, the prohibition on evading the engagement of a background actor with the use of a digital replica uh, will prevent the companies from using digital replicas to cut back on overtime hours or anything else regarding background performers within the numbers. Above the numbers, we can't control that. Above the numbers is outside the scope of our contract, so that is not something that we can control or limit, but within the numbers, that's protected by those provisions. As to who gets paid, I assume what you mean is in the, in the case of a negotiation over a synthetic fake, who gets paid whatever money we negotiate for, if that's the 
if that's the question. And the answer is just like when we have claims for unidentifiable for performers, but we pursue them anyway because what's important is that the company not benefit by getting out of paying something because we can't identify whom. Typically what we do with those kinds of payments is we deliver them to an entity like the sag After Foundation to be put into the Emergency Assistance Fund. Sometimes we have an arrangement that splits that money between sag After Foundation and another entity like the Entertainment Community Fund. But the bottom line is those monies generally go into a charitable fund. Hills. I'm sorry, what? Hills. It could be, well, you're right. I mean, that would be a determination that's ultimately made by the board or the standing committee. But, um, but a charitable destination is where money that's unattributable goes so that, you know, the union can't keep it in case you're wondering. So, um, and then uh, also as far as um, digital alterations, uh, I made a, I noted to your question about digital alterations, but I don't remember what it was. Oh, deceased or performers? Pictures. Oh, uh, someone identified in Jewish. Yeah. Oh, right. I mean, the, 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 oh. the concept is this is equivalent to what can be done now with editing. So right now, if you had a scene or a line or a word in a project that they wanted to remove because it you know, was in some way undesirable for purposes of marketing, a scene with an American flag, a, whatever it might be, if they can edit it out now, they can do that same uh, thing using an AI tool. That's the concept. Um, and, uh, you know, but it doesn't allow for alterations beyond the scope of that. So, for example, someone in another session asked, you know, could it be used to, without your consent, to change someone's gender, change someone's uh, ethnic ethnicity, for example? And the answer is no, it can't do that. Um, that's beyond the scope of the list of digital alterations that are allowable. Um, that would require the informed consent of the performer before anything like that could be done. And this, what was it? Was there something about deceased performers? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a qu uh, you. Yeah. You mentioned yeah. deceased performers, and just just to be clear, deceased they still have to get the consent of your estate or your authorized representative if you're a deceased performer. So if they wanted to create a digital replica of Cary Grant, they would have to go to his heirs and get their consent. Okay, guys, we, we're going to have a hard out, so I'm going to one minute questions, please, so we can uh, try and get through all the speakers and get out to the beverages and snacks that are outside. <laughs> so, uh, Microphone A. A B, excuse um, me. B. Hi, uh, lots of questions have already been asked, and these may. Uh, what's your name? Um, uh, my name is Lynn Ann Castle. Thank you, Ms. Castle. Um, lots of questions have already been asked, and this is kind of like backwards. But anyway, this first, I have, th I think, three questions. The first question is, if I'm not scanned, but I'm a background actor, and my image and likeness is altered um, in the post-production <coughs> to the extent that, um, just for example, a lot of times you'll do omnis, they'll all be moving my mouth as I was trained to do because I'm an old school actress saying peas and carrots, peas and carrots without making any sound, pantomiming. And then when they, I didn't approve a scan, but when they do, an, uh, when they're doing the um, post-production, they're changing my mouth instead of saying peas and carrots, I'm saying, please open the door. Someone's overdubbing it. Um, would I get paid as a principal performer? Yes, if it's made to appear that you're saying that line by altering your lip and mouth movements, then you would be paid as a principal performer for that. Okay, and even though I wasn't scanned. Correct. Okay, great. <coughs> um, my next question is the photo double, um, if they are getting a $150 bump for speaking the lines, and are they being filmed? Why are they not being paid as a principal performer? This is uh, when they're doing that as part of a run-through. So Just this is, rehearsal. Right. This is for rehearsal purposes. Okay. And then my next question. Last one. My last question <laughs> is my Zoom, uh, the Zoom, it, you may not guess it, but I'm a certain age, and I'd like to know what the, the threshold for senior performer is for age, um, for uh, getting a, um, having um, a priority for ability to do uh, in-person audition because I have struggled doing self-tapes. It's way too hard for me. 
I tried them. I, it was just an exercise in futility for me. And so I would like to be able to know, um, because I want to get a job, I used to just learn my stuff, go in there, so show up. So what's the threshold? The, the age threshold, and also a second question is, um, <laughs> well, regarding the same thing, because it's a virtual, if it has to be a, a, a virtual um, audition, I'm sure other people have this question. I don't have a reader on hand to do anything with me if I even can manage to self-tape it. So that's another thing. We're talking about dancers and yet not to engage other people to dance in the group. Right. We've been asked to have a reader with us to do the, um, this may, may apply to me or just to others, to have a reader with us for a scene. I can't just instantly manufacture somebody to so show up. So the question is if there's a reader for the virtual audition? The question, two questions. A, the age, right? And the right. second question is, they have been requiring readers for, for, for virtual and self-tapes. Well, self-tapes for sure, and they have been requiring them for self-tapes, so that means the dancer who's making her own self-tape okay. or okay. his own self-tape, she doesn't have to have a dancer with Thank her. Thank you. But the actors are asked, being asked to we have a reader We understand the them. question. So first of all, as far as the, the term senior, it's not specifically defined in the contract. I expect that the companies will push for that to mean 65 and over. If our, you know, if the community tells us we're to look for a different number than that, we may be able to push for a different number. But I do think, you know, that will be, that'll ultimately be a decision that's made by the standing committee in combination, probably with input from our senior performers committee, I would imagine. Um, so, so that's the answer to the first part. And the um, second part of your question is there's not a provision in this agreement that requires them to provide a reader. That may be something we want to take up in a future round of bargaining uh, for a virtual audition like a Zoom audition or whatever. Uh, hopefully they would you know, have that because obviously the scheduling of that is going to be done by them in contrast to a self-tape where the scheduling of the when you actually conduct the self-tape is done by you. So, um, so uh, that is something we'll have to uh, also take a look at over the term of the contract and see if there is a problem with them providing readers in virtual auditions in the way that they traditionally did in uh, in-person auditions. Well, just, you know. I'm sorry. The, for the dancers. You're one cannot, minute. The dancers you're cannot. You're two be, minutes, Sarah. Okay. Uh -huh. Much less, you're one minute to have another dancer with them. And I would also oh, say that I'm, to the, uh, the, actor, the virtual auditions, they reader. aren't required just for, for seniors. Um, anybody can re request a virtual or a Zoom I, audition. I got too. that. Yeah. Um, my, my Your time is up. But the, Your the, time is the up. Question. Your time is up. Your time is up. Thank you. It's not a question. I can have my imaginary partner in there. I don't need to have a, somebody reading with me. Now they want me to have a reader with me. I have to enlist the help of a reader for my, for my self-tape. The dancer doesn't have to have a, a co-dancer for her self-tape. I can imagine my... So the answer to the question is that's not part of this agreement. Could it be something that's taken up in the next round of bargaining? Yes, and I would definitely urge that if that is uh, something that you're passionate about, that you bring it to the W&W process so that it can be included in the next round of in the next round of bargaining. Um, I am aware of passionate the fact about. that there is, you know, the, the about the dancer provision that you mentioned, and you know that is something that flowed from the W&W process that dancers participated in as well. So. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Oh. Microphone A. Hello and thank you. I'm Matteo Boyce, SAG after actor. Um, I, I didn't hear your name, bro. Matteo Boyce. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, it's kind of like a question and a statement. So one question I have is, well, in regards to AI, I already know the horse is out of the gate. So I agree with you, Duncan. I've been watching different things of AI in terms of chat by GPT and just facial recognition. It's already there. I think I agree with sag after I think their stance is we could either be the blacksmith who makes horseshoes, who watch the Model T roll by the shop and continue to make horseshoes, or we can figure out how we're going to make automotive parts and just continue to succeed. Mm -hmm. So that's my thought on it. Mm -hmm. That said, that said, I do understand that, it, you know, uh, AI is, is, is important. So I'm wondering if we could follow 
the model of like the music industry. If we recall, we go back maybe, what, 20 years now, more 25 years, CDs. Remember when music business came out and then they, they were terrified by CDs coming out because people could make exact duplicates of the CD that they went and bought, Prince, Michael Jackson, whatever you wanted. So what they did is they came up with a structure that every blank CD that was gonna make, they were going to get a percentage of that. I wondered if we could kind of follow suit because we're in this motion picture industry, image industry, if we could say that any kind of artificial thing that you create that is like a person doing a function of an actor or an actress, can we get a percentage of that? So this way we cover ourselves no matter what goes on, whether it's an image of ourselves or whether it's something that they create. So now. So it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I think you could effectuate that individually by use of your consent rights. Right. Uh, I mean, because for subsequent scale. use, you could simply, and, and I suppose we could also promulgate a writer for subsequent use that has a concept embedded in it of a percentage, would be like a percentage residual almost. But I just want to point out that the CD levies that you're talking about, right. those were not contractual. Those were government mandated. Right, and know, in the United I mean, States, they largely failed. They were all rescinded. And the only one that still exists is a levy on mini discs. And right. I doubt any of you have ever, or at least not recently, <laughs> held, I mean, owned, or seen a mini disc, and the younger people in this room probably don't even know what a mini disc is. So, um, so I mean, that has not, that particular method, at least as a levy, did not uh, do well in the US. It did better in Europe, um, right. and some of those still exist there, but even there it's become disfavored and is starting to um, be rescinded in a number of jurisdictions. So I, I guess I would say this is probably going to have to be driven by uh, what you can bargain for as part of your um, authorization of any kind of reuse of a replica. Correct, correct. And I mean, I know, just also thank you for your service because I know how hard contractual negotiations are. I've been in commercial residential architecture for almost 25 years. So I've sat on the other side trying to deal with municipalities and con you can never enter a contract without the other side feeling also that they walk away with something. Thank you. If you think that you're going to strong arm somebody, you are sadly mistaken. That is not how it works. In fact, you get more leverage when you think that you cooperate with them and they think that you have given up something that you'll get more in the future. That's the goal. That's thank the you. smart play. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for that. Thank you. That yeah. said, the last thing, oh, the last oh, thing. Oh, yeah, there's more. You. <laughs> what we, I, I, well, I don't want to take my minute. I see you, had, you had three, you brother. You had three, oh, okay. well, as <laughs> All I right, said, make it quick. Make it quick. Get to, it, get, to get to it. Get to it. Get to it. Get to it. Can we please do something about the car rate? Because that 3750 is ridiculous. <laughs> that is, like, ridiculous. I mean, right. try to call Hertz and say, I'd like a 23 Cadillac Escalade, and I want the 3750. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, though. I appreciate it. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone. Be We're running it fine just here. So. Calm down. Thank you. Come, that microphone, B. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Please, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go for it, right? So, Absolutely. first is a shout out. Uh, and that's to uh, the SAG AFTRA Foundation Assistant Team, their fund, and the Entertainment Community Fund. I don't know if any of you accessed them at all over these last four months, which have been difficult times for many of us financially. Well, well, you know, not making, you know, so I, I would just like to say that they are accessible. Uh, they have worked for me personally. Um, they've, they were very easy to access. And I think we deserve a real shout out to both of those foundations that have made my life, because pay my mortgage, pay my utility bills, pay my health insurance. Those foundations were there for me, and I'm very eternally thankful for that. And a member of the union. To move on, uh, I had a question earlier this evening regarding pension. Um, uh, this is a second life for me. It's been a good life for me. And uh, through the month of June, I was more than tracking for qualifying for pension for the fourth year to qualify. I've made calls to, you know, L.A. over the course of the last number of months, but nobody really had, you know, an answer to say to that. I've heard about health insurance. I understand that. And I've certainly had the work days to qualify that, but I get, I get, you know, Medicare. But in regards of the pension, since I'm more, since I'm well on the way to make it, but I'm only through six months of real work, what is being done to qualify us for pensions for the back six months, and how is that going to be um, factored in? Right. So I think the the main thing that that 
that hopefully will be done with regard to pensions is it, that the trustees, uh, hopefully of both funds, <clears throat> will adopt um, rules to provide that there is no break in service for people who fail to qualify for a pension credit during this year because of the strike impact. I do not expect the trustees of the pension or retirement fund to adopt reductions in the eligibility um, requirements for these years. I think that's only going to apply to the health plan for health insurance eligibility. So that becomes then punitive to us, though, right? But but is the, I think that the eliminating the break in service problem will be very important for people who are. Um, concerned about, you know, or, or on the cusp of vesting and might have their vesting status impacted by a break in service right. this year. So I think that, I mean, just to be really straightforward, I think that is the most that we expect to be able to accomplish in the in the retirement plans. Okay. Uh, to continue, a, qu a question was asked earlier, which I thought was really a, a very poignant question. I think it impacts most of us as actors, background actors, et cetera. And that has to do with language. And it's the language, basically, when we do go in and we're asked to sign that contract, you know, to, to the use of our images, right? And legalese gets a lot of people turned around. And I, I'm just wondering if there's any, when you guys were, when you were negotiating with, you know, the major, the Peacocks, the Amazons, the Netflix, et cetera, is there going to be a template that will be, so we go from law and order to FBI, well, that's the same to NBC, so it'll probably be the same. But if you're going to, you know, to, to features and or to what have you, will there, will there be something that will be uniform or we're going to have to read through each one individually and then go, oh, my God, what are we supposed to do? So this is what I was talking about in terms of a rider that we would promulgate and put out as a standard form. But I do want to be clear, the companies, you know, won't be obligated under this contract to use that form. They can create their own form or use a different type of, you know, method for securing that consent. Um, but uh, since this form will have received the union's preemptive blessing, that will mean that they won't have to worry if they use our form that we will file a challenge on the basis of their document not being compliant. So we'll have to see whether those promulgated documents get adopted by the industry or not. I think we'll encourage agents and lawyers to push for them. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. And it may be something that we add to the list for the next round of bargaining to attempt to bargain for that if we need it. No? You guys, we have about 20 minutes okay. left in this room. So nice. in, 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 the, in the hope of getting everybody's questions asked, if we could just tighten yourselves up a little. Microphone bit. A. Okay, good evening. Uh, Alvin, Alexis, uh, real quick. Okay, background on set. Uh, I would like to know if this was part of the negotiation to get more SAG background versus non-union on set. Is that part of the negotiation, or is that something that you do separately? No, that is part of this negotiation, and we did do that, but the primary form that that has taken is in the form of equalizing the number of SAG after a covered background on set between the West Coast and the East Coast, because one of the things you, you may have noticed over the last few cycles of bargaining is it's hard to bargain up the numbers for the East Coast zone while the West Coast zone's numbers were so much lower to begin with. So part of our future plan to increase the number of covered background in the East Coast zones is to get those numbers equalized so that we can then move all of them up together at once. And that is what we did achieve in this round of bargaining is to fully equalize the coverage numbers, West Coast and East Coast, so that going forward as we gain numbers, it'll, it'll benefit everyone in the East Coast zone also. Okay, that, that's really important. Uh, I mean, besides all this AI stuff, that is very important because you, it's not, it's, it's crazy that you got more non-union on set than you got union. I mean, that's absolutely right. absurd and insane. So I hope that's going to be the case going forward. And um, that, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone B. Oh, it doesn't come off. I wanted to see everyone. Hello. I'm Layla Johnson. Hey, Layla Johnson. I ask that you give me a bit of grace because first, during a strike, it is very difficult to call for a vote. And I only hope one day to raise to the level to gain your trust to be on that stage to represent you all, honestly. I won't want your thanks, I don't need your applause. This is a job and the sacrifices that our elected members chose to do, including you, right? Okay, so while I thank you, like, thank you. I'd be doing it anyway, thank you. as I previously 
told Ezra. Um, having had an incident of sexual harassment on set, I contacted SAG, and during a strike, I was told to contact a lawyer. I was very unprepared to have an email sent to me by, by Fox saying that um, that day they were calling me at 12.15 to go through an investigation. At that, in, when it happened in May, I was told by SAG that the incident was over. So this was three months later, I had done my own healing, et cetera. Then um, I get an email saying at 12.15 I have a phone call with the Fox a HR. I did not know this was happening, SAG did not let me know this was happening. Um, I felt like I had to relive my trauma all over again and to hear that intimacy consultants' best effort when already their best efforts seem to fail is troublesome to me. And I'd like to know what, do, what does the phrase best effort mean? Sure, the phrase best effort means that they must do it unless they can show why they couldn't do it with a really good reason. And the reason that language is in there uh, as opposed to just a flat out absolute requirement is the fact that even now there's still not enough intimacy coordinators, qualified intimacy coordinators. And so the companies were, you know, that was the pushback we got on attempting to put this into the contract. So my belief is that as uh, over the term of this contract, you know, as more intimacy coordinators are trained and registered, then we'll be in a position to change that language from best efforts, but it still is a very high standard, and I, I'm mindful of what um, the member earlier said about legal terms and so forth, but just to be clear, like a best effort standard is a very high standard, and they would really have to uh, provide real justification if they fail to engage in intimacy. So if I were to get, as I just went to the website, as I, if I were to get certified and I'm on set, and I see that there is an intimate scene happening, and I raise my hand, I give my certification, isn't that make the me, make, that they should be making the effort to collect my resume and hire me if that's required, right? <laughs> well, they wouldn't have to hire you, they no, would have to I, hire someone yes, uh, okay. who is qualified as an intimacy coordinator, it could be you, yes. but it, you know, if you're already engaged on that set as an actor, it might be that they would prefer to engage somebody else to, to do the intimacy coordinator piece, but yeah, sure. Okay, also, um, I've traveled the world, been 32 countries, and um, sometimes I've seen inserts, especially Asia and China. You recently spoke that there hasn't been a fully AI-generated movie. There has, it's a short film called Froze, and it is completely AI-generated. There is not one human on that set, so are in that film, so they're on their way. Um, I've contacted uh, Professor Dr. Peter Rowe at Harvard University, and he took me through the steps of development of AI. And they say because of there's so many laws that leave them unchecked, they are going full forward. And not only because of that, but because of the youth that they teach, and the entertainment industry leans into the youth, and the youth are so passionate about seeing how far AI can go, those are my concerns. Like, they really, the youth really want to see people want to see how far AI can go and what limits or what watermark time. would, what, I would say what watermark is on my, my scan so that I can download into an app or something that's developed and see if it's been used without my consent. Because in your first meeting you said, yes, it probably will be used without your knowledge. Time. I don't think I said that your, pro your digital replica will probably be used without your knowledge. And in fact, I don't think that's the case because the companies will be spending <clears throat> a considerable amount of money to create a digital replica of you, and they will not want other people to be to be able to use it when they are the ones who've invested resources in it, and they are also legally responsible for any use of that digital replica that occurs without your informed consent. So I don't think that's the case. What I think you might be referring to is when I was talking about the fact that there are other technology companies, not through digital scanning, but through the use of generative AI that can ingest work that you may have done that's been publicly released or pictures of you or whatever. Um, and so to me, that is different than the creation of a digital replica. And, uh, and that type of ingestion into an AI system will be used to create synthetic fakes, not to, probably not, to create digital replicas because they will need more than that and for digital replica to be fully authentic, they need really, at, the, at least at this point, they need your cooperation to create that. As far as the fact that people will experiment with AI, absolutely, um, I've never suggested otherwise and the fact is, for sure, there will be experimental projects done by these companies as well as academic institutions and other companies that are outside of the scope of this collective bargaining agreement with respect to the capabilities of AI. But in terms of a commercially released uh, you know, television series or feature film, that hasn't happened yet, and 
certainly now that we will, once this contract's ratified, we'll have a right to be notified in the event that anything like that is being contemplated and to bargain over it. So I think those are really important advances that don't exist now uh, and wouldn't exist without this contract being, uh, being ratified. Okay. We're going to go to microphone A. Okay. Microphone A. your time. Okay. It's, that's time, Layla. Thank you. Thank you, though. Good evening. I'm Vandit. Uh, I have a question about the language. Uh, I've noticed in the contract there's no language defining actors as human beings. The WGA and the DGA have such language. So I was just wondering if you guys considered it, if uh, there was a conversation about it, and if there was, why did you guys decide to not include such language in the contract defining actors as human beings? Thank you. Thank you. Sure, and I, I made reference to this earlier, but um, certainly bears repeating that the, the language works for the WG and DGA because their contract structure is different than our contract structure. And so, you know, what we needed in this contract was enforceable language that could actually be used to make sure that digital replication being done was done in compliance with these restrictions. And you know, one of the big differences between the DGA contract, WGA contract, and our contract is that both of their contracts require the engagement of directors and writers. This contract, our contracts have never required the engagement of actors, and why not? Because, well, because they were never negotiated to, because of the fact that there was never really any doubt that a project made under, uh, in this industry would need to engage actors probably a whole host of reasons why not, but that's the reality, is that contract structure doesn't exist. So we could have, potentially, uh, if we could get the companies to agree to it, negotiated for a statement that said, uh, you know, actors are humans. And if we had done that instead of what we did do, then what we would have is a statement that actors are humans, but we would have no contractual way to enforce that because there's nothing in this contract, sorry, could you let me just answer? because there's nothing in this contract that says they have to hire an actor. So, you know, when they use a synthetic fake, when they use a digital replica, et cetera, all they have to do is not call it an actor, and all of a sudden they're not in violation of the terms of the contract. So when we looked at it, we really felt from the very beginning that the goal here was not to do something performative, the goal here was to do something enforceable and real for our members to protect them from the kinds of things that are actually happening now, which is digital replication, and the kinds of things we could foresee happening in the future, which involves the generative AI piece. And let me just be very clear so there's no misunderstanding. When I say it's performative, I mean for us. For the DGA and WGA, that language, I, I understand fully why that language is good for them. And that's great because it works with their contract structure and their hiring mechanisms. It doesn't work for our members, and that's why it's not what we focused our energy trying to achieve. Microphone B. Microphone B. Hi. Um, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm a little nervous, but if you, you're seeing a lot of people getting upset and, and really having a lot to say. We're trying to form our words right, but we're really frustrated. And I'm one of those people who's frustrated. You just bear with me for one minute. You say solidarity and respect. Um, that's something that's been, you've said a lot, but when the strike ended, I got told by a family member, I didn't even know the strike was over. It was everywhere you guys said, trust the union only. It was all over the media. I was like, why weren't we told that? That was, first of all, that was very hurtful. I know that sounds silly and small. And then when you say things, and again, I say all this because I want better from my union. I think we can all get better. And that's, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. But when you say things like, uh, there's fear mongering, respectfully, the only fear mongering I've heard is from the union. And I just want to say really quickly, I went um, this past weekend, uh, or the weekend before, there was a beautiful brunch WGA put on for us. SAG didn't contribute. It was wonderful of them to do. But Michelle Hurd came, and I was very politely, she's one of your negotiating people, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but um, just really quickly, sorry, again, very nervous. But um, basically, I asked her, I said, you know, when are we going to see the contract? She didn't know. And I said, politely, you know, I'm concerned about AI. And instead of being kind about it, she cursed out Justin, Justine Bateman, who I'd never mentioned, to my face. And that's, you should want members who have questions and concerns. You shouldn't be shutting people down. So I hope well, that, like, with all due respect, we have, have been here for four hours I answering have questions sitting and here concerns. For hours too. I'm yeah. just saying that it's hurtful to hear that we're naysayers. We're bad kids, basically, because we're upset about things that we're scared. We're but, frightened. But, but none of us have said that. I know, but I'm telling you, one of your negotiating committee members basically like said that to me. So I'm just saying that's a frustration, and that's what I see a lot on social media. If people comment, they're basically told, oh, just, just, they're just like shoved aside. So that's just one quick point I wanted to make. Um, 
And also, as far as you're saying background might be able to be elevator performer, our dream, most background people, is to get a line and go on set and perform it, not to just have it done like that. So I don't get that idea of saying, like, oh, we're not going to act when we're actors. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, but uh, one thing I do want to mention in, in what you said earlier, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish up. I'm sorry. It's just a lot to say. Okay. Um, is you said you would make it so that there's no retaliation for intimacy coordinators if people ask for that. But why is there going to be nothing to say? Because, yeah, we're going to, a lot of us background people and a lot of those people, if we say no, we're probably not going to get hired again. So that's kind of also a concern. And also to say you're going to pay us for one day to scan us for like 200 something dollars, that's it? Like, it's just, it's very upsetting and scary, and I apologize for being jumbled, but I just need to get some of that out. So okay. thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mark Raponet. Well, may I? Oh, oh Duncan, sure. sorry. You wanna? Yeah, just a couple sure. of things. Sure. So first of all, um, as far as, uh, you know, I understand uh, members being upset about how they found out, and I, I'm sorry, there you are. Okay, <laughs> I was trying to see where you were so I could look at you. Uh, that's fine. Um, and, uh, you know, that no one intended for that to happen. One of the things that really was very disappointing and problematic during this negotiation process, and not just at the very end, but throughout the strike, was the leaking that was done by the studio side. So I think if you saw like an article on one of the online trades saying that the strike was over before you saw the email from our negotiating committee, that's because someone on the studio side told someone that um, before, probably before we even give them, gave them final confirmation that we had reached an agreement because we moved as fast as we possibly could after the committee took its official vote. But you know, the other, but, but people in the trades, uh, in a number of cases played totally fast and loose with the facts. They put out things that just weren't true. I remember one time seeing an article that said we'd agreed to meet the next day when I was literally still talking to Carol Lombardini at that moment and we had not in any way agreed to meet the next day. Someone just made that up. So um, I just want you to know that A, I'm sorry that you heard about it that way and for any other members, I'm sorry about that. I don't know exactly how it happened, but I can tell you it was not anyone's intention on this day as our negotiating committee because, I th and I think it, it speaks for itself that throughout the process, our negotiating committee wrote messages directly to the members to try and keep you informed on what was going on. And so you know, I'm really sorry that anyone thinks that the negotiating committee would have changed that because that's not something that they decided to do or whatever. Um, one area I'm really going to have to disagree with you on respectfully is this comment you made about fear mongering because um, as far as I'm concerned, I've, I don't even know, I've probably done eight of these, something like that, with, between the webinar and this. There's no fear mongering going on from us, but there are people out there online, because I've seen it myself with my own two eyes, who are making up things that don't exist, who are misleading people about what the contract says, and they're doing it to try and scare people. So to me, that constitutes fear mongering. And I'm not saying that people who have legitimate questions or debate or disagree, I'm not saying that's fear mongering. I'm saying when someone misleads people about what is either happening in the world of AI or about what this contract says with an intent to try and scare them, uh, then I have a problem with that because that's not what members of this union should be doing to each other under any circumstances. And I've been very careful in my description of what the consequences are of a potential non-ratification vote to deliver what I believe is an accurate statement about what the risks of that are without trying to fearmonger or generate anything like that because I think members deserve to know what the consequences of their decisions are one way or the other and then they have every right to make their decisions. And so I just wanted to say that. As far as the retaliation issue with intimacy coordinators and why couldn't that be applied equally to the question of scanning, I mean, the non-retaliation for an intimacy coordinator means that they can't fire you or do something to you for asking for an intimacy coordinator. If you ask for an intimacy coordinator and they say, no, we're not gonna have one, it doesn't mean that, and you decide, I don't wanna go forward with this project because there's no intimacy coordinator. That's your choice, but it doesn't mean that they are required to have one if the contract doesn't require it. So I don't really see that as parallel. In the same scenario with respect to consent for a digital replica, if, you know, if, you, if they say to you, um, we're, you know, we, we need someone who will agree to a digital replica, I mean, for whatever reason, and you say, no, I don't wanna do that, then just like if you said no to relocating, no to nudity, no to any number of other things, then they may choose to hire someone else. If they've already engaged you, 
if they've already engaged you and you are asked to do that and you say, no, I won't, they still have to pay you, just like they would if you, know, you were already engaged and, and uh, you, know, you were unwilling to um, grant them consent for a nude scene that they hadn't already gotten your consent for. They would still have to pay you and they couldn't make you do it. So uh, those things are very parallel and I just wanted to point that out. And as far as the, the last question or last comment that you had about scanning, um, I guess what, um, and actually, I, I think, I don't know if someone else captured that. I, I, I've lost my train of thought about what the, what it, I had a note scan, but I can't remember exactly what you'd said. So sorry if I missed that one. It's been a long you evening. had to do with the consent. I only said about the loophole. Okay. I may have to, may have to wrap it on that question there, yeah. but okay. Thank um, you. Thanks for your comments. We have to be out of this room at 1015, so we might not get to everybody. I just Microphone want to A. set that up. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm what sorry, uh, Linda. Uh, I just wanted to address her. She said, um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. The, the Solidarity Brunch was not a WGA. It was mem members of the WGA that got together to try to help people in the industry to give them resources because when the writers were on strike, everybody was on strike. So when we went on strike, the same thing. So it wasn't, it wasn't a WGA strength. Yes, I understand. All right, we don't want to spend too much time on. Hi, good night. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you for your time. I'm Stacy Sargent. Um, I'm just going to go through my questions. If an actor gives consent for use of a digital replica, how and who is calculating the time it would take to create footage so that we're compensated as if we were working in person? Can you explain the uh, residual fund and why it's necessary? Since there's going to be transparency with numbers, why can't residuals simply reflect viewership for each show? And regarding transparency, how will we know that the numbers they provide are accurate? How is it cheaper uh, to hire an actor um, than using generative AI when you have to pay an entire crew, et cetera? Uh, what was it that made you guys decide that what we got at 118 days was all that we could get as opposed to keep holding out? Thank you. Thank you. Just noting your questions so I can make sure I answer all of them. Uh, okay. So first of all, digital replica, who calculates the time? It's the producer's responsibility to calculate that time, make that payment, just like it's their responsibility to pay performers properly in all cases and to keep records and track that time. If you ultimately conclude that the amount of time they paid you for is not commensurate with the services that the digital replica performed, then you can bring that to us and we can file a grievance uh, and challenge that. And by the way, we have a lot of data from, you know, and up exhibit G's and other sources that we can help use to validate whether the amount of time that they have uh, calculated is reasonable or accurate, especially taking into account realistic amounts of time spent per day on set. As far as the residuals fund and why it was necessary, the residuals fund was necessary in order to give us the opportunity to spread that success bonus across a wider range of performers because the companies were not willing to expand the success bonus beyond the pool of people who work only on the projects that, re that reach the 20% of viewership threshold, which for example is what the Writers Guild has in their agreement. So for our purposes, we wanted from the very beginning to have something that benefited a wider range of people working in streaming to help make that a more sustainable uh, career path for people. And we didn't feel something that was limited just to the top shows was gonna be sufficient. So the method by which we were able to achieve that was through the creation of the fund. And it also gives us more flexibility in the future so that as the streaming business evolves, we can adjust the distribution guidelines to account for that. As far as how do we know the transparency numbers are accurate, we have a right to audit, to have an independent audit done of the transparency numbers if we feel like they're not accurate. So we will cross-reference them with other data that we have access to from other sources. And if we find that those numbers seem inaccurate, then we'll audit them with a third-party auditor. With respect to how is it going to be cheaper when you have to hire a crew with respect to the creation of digital replicas, um, for the reasons we have already talked about, we expect the most likely uses of that to be uh, in connection with actual real filmed footage. And so 
Um, obviously, when you talk about a, a feature that's created entirely using uh, synthetic uh, AI generation, a lot of people are going to have problems with that uh, to deal with crew and everybody else who's involved in the industry. But as it relates to digital replication, that um, is likely to occur in connection with physical production that's going on, and so uh, that wouldn't make it cheaper because they'll still have to pay for the crew for the other segments that they are producing of that project. And as far as why did we feel like at the 118 day mark we were at the point of maximum leverage, it wasn't that it wasn't because it was 118 days, it's that 118 days happened to be that point. Why did we sense that we had the, the maximum leverage point? We'd gotten to a point where the companies, I think convincingly asserted they were delivering a last, best, and final offer to us. They formally said that, which is not something that has happened in the 23 years I've worked here, and nor has Ray ever experienced that before. We sat in a room for multiple days with four of the CEOs and on other multiple days with all 10 of the company's CEOs and, uh, and discussed the issues with them and pushed on the various things that we were looking for. We did our own analysis of the state of the industry and the question of whether when they said that they we're going to have to start making decisions about canceling series and canceling planned feature production for the next year. We did our own analysis of whether we thought that was an, an accurate and truthful statement. And after doing that analysis, we concluded that that was an accurate statement, that they would have to start making those decisions because of the timing of the production process. With that in mind, we felt that gave us maximum leverage because they clearly did not want to do that. They did not want to have to do that. And so we knew that that was giving us that extra push. And that's how, in the final day or 24 hours or so of the strike, we were able to secure important additional concessions on the streaming bonus fund and on generative AI. So I think that's the root, that's the answer that I would give you as far as why we thought that was the point of maximum leverage. And it was clear to us that going forward from that point, once those cancellations decisions have been made, given the um, sort of state of the industry and us moving into the holiday period, it was clear we were going to have to remain on strike for a lengthy additional period of time with unclear, in, uh, any, with unclear likelihood of achieving any additional gains. And so that's the decision that we made. Microphone B. Quick, quick, quick. Hi, Robert James Cooper. I wanted to first thank everyone for their hard work and sacrifices throughout the strike. Um, my first question is, safety ride requirements, are they going to include specific hours or just be at the end of a work day? Because I've actually experienced. There was no provision included in this contract relevant to safety rides. Uh, it was something that was discussed in the course of the negotiation. Uh, it became clear that we could not achieve that provision without also agreeing to additional pickup points. Uh, beyond the ones that presently exist, and the pickup points that were being sought by the AMPTP were, in the opinion of our committee, and in particular from the New York-based members, unacceptable. There were places that we didn't want our members to have to go early in the morning or late at night, and so it was ultimately decided to uh, not to cease pursuing that proposal and not agree to those additional pickup points. I do know that in those circumstances, we have had some success pressuring uh, the, pr the production to, um, to do some kind of accommodation. So if you find yourself in that situation, I'd recommend you contact the office and we'll see what we can do on a case-by-case -case basis uh, for those kind of calls. And um, fittings, are they still allowed to require a full day availability for only a quarter check? I'm sorry, can you say it one more time? Fittings, fittings require a full day availability. A full day of availability for a quarter check? I mean, the rules around fittings did not change, so um, it's the same rules that you've been working under with respect to fittings. Um, the only change with respect to fittings was an increase in the money break that allows for the prepayment of one fitting day for a day performer from $1,400 to $1,500. Yeah, because fittings are very abusive in a way. They are very far away. They require you to bring a suitcase of options and they pay 40 something bucks and they, you have to give your whole day. Mm. I would encourage you to bring that to the next W&W. &W. Um, w &W. You know, there's a, at the end of every negotiation, there's always a list of unfinished business, which is as it should be. We're always trying to make the contract better. Um, but that was not one of the provisions that we tackled in this round. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
All right, microphone A. Hi. Maybe the um, last my, one, I don't know. My name is Adepera Odie, and the question I have is regarding the streaming bonus. Um, I know you can't say what, you mentioned projects that you kind of tested what the, you know, the formula was, but I'm curious if you can tell how many of those shows were shows with casts of, of uh, mostly people of color? Because the concern that comes to my mind when I first heard it is that how many shows will make that, um, meet that threshold of 20% of subscribers in 90 days um, that aren't mainstream um, shows, AKA uh, shows with mostly white actors? Um, so I don't think I can give you a direct answer to that in this moment because I don't believe we analyzed it for the entire cast, but I can tell you from looking at that list, there were several projects on that list that um, featured lead actors who are performers of color, but in terms of looking at the entirety of the cast, I think we, I would have to go back and we'd have to look at that analysis because I don't believe that we did that specifically. Yeah, because there are shows that might be, uh, might be popular within a certain demographic but might not meet that 20% of subscribers, depending on what the, the, the total demographics of subscribers are for, let's say, Netflix. I don't know what those breakdowns right. are, but the, the concern is that that bonus, most of those bonuses are gonna go to shows that have mostly white actors, as opposed to shows that are critically acclaimed, critically acclaimed and uh, uh, popular within certain demographics and you know, generated mostly with actors of black, Latino, um, indigenous, Asian, et cetera. Yeah, definitely hear the concern. And uh, let me just say, I mean, we, we would have preferred more money to go into the fund and, and less money to be included in that pool for those specific shows because the whole point of the fund is to make sure that that payment is an inclusive type of payment. Um, so that's definitely something we'd be looking to expand on in the future. And uh, uh, we'll have to go back and look at the, at the projects to see um, what the sort of diversity profile of the projects that, um, that did qualify were. Although, bear in mind, that doesn't necessarily dictate what it will be in the future, but, um, but definitely hear your point. And I think the fund is probably our best way of helping make sure that the, f that the funds that come out of a streaming bonus are distributed across a wide range of projects, including ones that might be more critically acclaimed or feature more diverse casts, but that don't reach that threshold of viewership popularity. Okay, we'll go till they kick us out. Uh, microphone B. Okay. Hello, yes, my name is John Thompson, future genius of Hollywood. Thank you for your informative questions, but I have a question for you. You mentioned about how you're trying to wait two years for another deal to be coming into place for stuff. Why are we going to have to wait two years when we should be waiting just basically another year? Because in the whole history of Hollywood, it's been dealing with these studio executives and CEOs who do listen, but then out of the other ear, it's like, well, we don't have time for that. We'll oh. think about it sometime in the future. So I like to know, are, should we just push forward for another strike or should we just continue playing the waiting game until they decide when they decide okay, what to give you. us? Well, the contract term has been a three-year term consistently for many decades. Uh, that was what was negotiated for in this case, except for the fact that the strike took away about five and a half months of that three-year term, hence the 30, or four and a half months of that three-year term, and hence the 31 and a half month term instead of 36 months. Um, but considering that it has taken almost a year, the process of preparing for and negotiating this contract, I think that um, the reality is that we'll be starting in on preparation for the next round of bargaining in less than two years from now. So, um, so that is a normal feature of how these contracts get negotiated. And, and let me just remind us that in between that time, we'll be renegotiating our commercials contract, which is also on a three-year cycle and which has a contract value that's uh, approximately equal to this one. And a whole host of other agreements like our sound recordings code, we've got a negotiation going on right now at Interactive, which is our video games contract. So there are um, things that we also do you know, as part of a cycle of contract negotiations so that we can make sure that all of our members' needs are pushed forward 
Um, and I fully expect AI. AI is an issue in the video game negotiations. I'm sure it'll be an issue in the other negotiations I mentioned as well between now and the next uh, negotiation of this contract. So I think we can find opportunities to push the, uh, the actor's agenda forward um, our members' agenda forward in each of those negotiations during that time, and that'll help us with this one when we come back to it. Okay. Microphone A. Uh, time's up, babe. That was it. Okay. Microphone A. Hi. Um, my name's Melissa Axelberth, and um, I'm a voiceover actor. And first, I just want to thank the committee, negotiating team, and staff for the massive work that you've done, because it's a lot. Um, I have some questions and concerns. One that was just brought up with the question before about the peas and carrots question. Um, if a background actor is made to say something, then they'll be upgraded. But what about the voice that says that? So if I'm hired for something and, and give my consent for it to be used in that project, and they take my voice, and put it on a background actor. They can pitch shift it, for instance, to make me sound like, you know, not like me. How, are we compensated for that? So you're, you're compensated as per normal under the contract, principal performance, compensated for that use. If a digital replica of your voice is created, you're equally entitled to advance notice, informed consent, and fair compensation for that use, or if it's done using a more traditional technique, Likewise, you're still entitled to compensation for that as per, as per normal under the contract. Even being made a completely separate character? Yes, and, yeah. Okay, so that's one question. Um, your, se your section on generative AI, I know, you know you've got a lot about facial features, et cetera, but I don't see voice there. Am I missing something? Um, are there no protections for voice or why was that omitted? No, it's, it, well, it's not meant to be omitted, it's included, but it's included in the same way everything else is for purposes of the creation you know, of a synthetic fake in terms of notice and in terms of negotiation for compensation. The piece about individual informed consent is specifically limited to recognizable facial features, which obviously therefore requires it to be a, a on-camera or audio-visual type fake that's created because there may not be a camera involved at all. Um, so, but for voice actors, the protection exists in the notice and bargaining requirement, just like it does for most performers where synthetic fakes would be used without a recognizable feature of them included. Well, voices are recognizable. I'm sorry, what? Voices are recognizable. Right, that's what I'm saying is for, for everyone, synthetic fakes, the, the definition of synthetic fake is it's not a recognizable individual performer. That's what a synthetic fake is. If it is recognizable as you, then it's a replica. So if your voice is used in a, in a recognizable way, that's a digital replica. If your voice is used as a training element for an AI system, or, or even if it's not, um, there is a requirement that they notify us when they use that synthetic, or when they create that synthetic fake, and that we have the right to negotiate for compensation. So the purpose of that really is to help make sure that voice actors continue to be engaged to do that work by us making sure that it's not less expensive to use a synthetic instead. Got it, okay, so one more. Uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to move on. We're, they're they're gonna more. throw us out yeah. any minute. <laughs> Last Microphone B. B. Hi, my name is Vincent Tumio, a sag after member since 1986. Um, I'm going to read through all my questions. I wanted to piggyback on something she said because it was part of one of my questions regarding voices on background actors, real life scenarios, and it's a deeper question for you with AI. Um, Duncan, if you would, please. You keep mentioning if they alter the lips or mouth to speak a line, but my question is if it's over the shoulder, we only see the back of the background. We're not paid for that, are we? That's first nothing point. about this would change that because there's nothing about the AI that would be used to do that that's different than the current technology. So I'll defer to Ray. No, and, they do uh, that all the time. They ADR to the back of your head and that's not an upgrade. Right, because I could be with a principal actor, you know, just chewing bread to make it look like we're in a conversation. He waits a few beats, goes back to the principal action. You see it in post and we were there too long so they hire a voiceover actor and attach somebody else's voice to me asking him a question. I don't get upgraded, I don't get paid for that because it wasn't my voice, right? That's Same right, with In the, under the current contract you would not get upgraded for that under, if they did, if they adjusted your mouth, 
using a, a digital technology to make it look like you said the words, then you would be upgraded. So only if we see the mouth, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's the rest of my questions. Who the updated hiatus language applies to in section 15 regarding holidays, and what is it exactly? What's the penalty if it goes beyond two weeks and two days? And are there any assurances given to us stand-ins when they elongate those holidays and they're not back in two weeks and two days? That's one question. Resurrecting actors with AI most likely will require a stand-in. Would that stand-in be covered under a performance capture contract or question mark? Um, was there ever any consideration to create either a separate MOA or standalone AI contract at any time? With these terms enclosed within the TV theatrical contract, we are subjecting to risk striking over this whole contract rather than having a separate rider or MOA, MOA strictly for AI. Why did the negotiating committee agree to give the AMPTP everything they could dream up with the use of AI rather than limited, limiting that use to only digital replicas as a starting point? And then lastly, in real life scenarios, and I think this is the burning question on many people's minds regarding casting and production, Production is infamous for trying to separate themselves from casting, which they cannot because they hire casting. So at the point of being hired for casting, you know, example, Central Casting maintains a list that if you are late, if you turn down availability requests too many times, they, they keep a list of that. That list has a name. So now that we start to decline being scanned, are we going to be put on a blacklist? And is SAG doing anything to protect us from those lists existing on the casting level? Okay. So there was one that the first one Ray I said we sure yeah the um, the point of the hiatus language is that um, the period of time over the holidays where they are on a holiday hiatus does not count towards your span and it does not count for purposes of consecutive employment so if you've negotiated a certain amount of overall production time that two week period over the holidays doesn't count towards that maximum production time. So um, the allowance of that expansion means there's the potential for more time that doesn't count towards your span. It has been our experience, however, that our, our members want the extended hiatus because what it avoids is having, having to like travel back on January 1st for your show. Uh, if you don't extend the hiatus, oftentimes that is what happens, is people end up having to travel on one of the holiday days to be able to start up on the first available work day. So uh, my experience has certainly been the cast prefers the expanded hiatus, and we actually did that in connection with the return to work agreement and got positive feedback on that. So that's the only impact of that hiatus language. It, is not, it does not count towards the reduction of your span. As to your question about a separate AI agreement, I don't. I, I know that the studios would not have been interested in a separate agreement on AI, and I'm not sure it would have ended up being to our advantage either to negotiate a separate agreement as it relates to AI for several legal reasons connected to the specific items that we were able to achieve, including the independently created digital replica language and the generative AI language, which from my point of view were achieved only because of leverage that was generated due to other aspects of this agreement. And if we would have had a separate agreement, I think they absolutely would have asserted non-mandatory subject of bargaining on those pieces and we would have created a real problem for us in getting limitations there that we actually did achieve. Um, so that's why there, uh, you, you made a comment about why we gave the AMPTP everything they want. Let me just challenge that premise. We in no way gave the AMPTP everything they want. And in fact, on AI, they are very unhappy about the level of restrictions that they have agreed to, which they were, from their point of view, pressured into by us remaining on strike for so long and forcing them back to the table to address those issues. So. You know, it is just not the case that we gave them everything they wanted, and in fact, uh, they gave us a whole lot of what we wanted in this agreement, far more than they ever thought they would, I assure you. And that's why we have such robust protections against the use of AI in the agreement. 
Um, as far as this central casting blacklist uh, concept goes, uh, you know, if, if we become aware that any of the companies, whether it's central or any other uh, casting company or background casting company, is creating blacklists, especially for things that are protected under the contract, like your right to say no in an informed consent way, then we'll take action to address that and to make sure that that doesn't continue to happen. You know, it's a, it, it's, I'm not condoning the idea of any kind of blacklist, but certainly a blacklist that attempts to interfere with our members' ability to exercise their right to either consent or not consent to something is absolutely something that we would challenge. All right, Mark Capone Thank A, you. please, um, one question. Oh, one question I'm from both of you. It's 10.30 and we have to be... I will rattle my questions off as fast as class. possible. You guys can be as succinct as possible. That's cool? Go, John. All right. Go, John. Uh, can you determine what... Oh, Jonathan Kane. hi. Um, can you determine what, um, what determines and limits a franchise, multi-picture franchise? Uh, is every MCU picture in perpetuity considered a franchise? Anything that mentions or takes place in Middle Earth, whether it's been unwritten currently, would that consider itself a perpetual franchise? Uh, could you explain to people who are watching or listening that we are colloquial saying the words AI, artificial intelligence, because not all computer-assisted digital replication is directly by definition created with artificial intelligence. I wouldn't want a production to say no a human created this in order to usurp our artificial intelligence language. Um, we had a provision in the we had a provision in the interim agreement that prevented by punitive measures productions from usurping the background count by having them pay 50% uh, extra when they use pulled stand-ins or double duty stand-ins. I'm wondering what the rationale was to permit productions from continuing to usurp the count as they have been doing for as long as I've been around. I'll leave it at that. I got a million more. Thank Every you. time Thank I come you. to one of these, you guys <laughs> make more questions for me than less. I apologize. No, thanks for the questions. First of all, the franchise concept is no longer in the AI language at all. So when you ask the definition of a franchise, if you are talking about the slide that Ray was referring to, I am. it's not about AI, that's about the... Okay. I didn't, I didn't okay. ask about AI for that, and just okay. in terms of okay. the okay. franchise... Okay, Ray, you answer okay. That? Yes, probably um, Middle Earth, you know, the Tolkien universe or the Marvel Cinematic Universe probably would qualify as a franchise. Forever, even if nothing yet about that specific project has been written. Yes, it's not a requirement that it all be written at one particular Okay. Time. As far as you know, AI isn't all that's being used to create digital replication, that's true, and that's why our language includes replication by any digital technology, including AI, so that if they attempt to try to circumvent that by some, you know, by calling it something other than AI, that doesn't achieve the result that they're trying for, because that is also covered by the language. As far as you're concerned about whether the background count is being impacted uh, and uh, you made specific reference to the stand-in provisions, um, I, I do want to just note that the, you know, in this negotiation, in the equalization of the background count between the West Coast and the East Coast, all stand-ins are excluded from the count. Um, for both the West Coast and the East Coast. And so Pulled stand-ins and double duty stand-ins are used as a means to usurp that count. They'll say, well, oh, 25 background, but three of them are now also going to be stand-in. Well, but what I'm saying is, and Ray will correct me if I'm wrong, they are excluded from the count, so they can't be used to usurp the count. And yet forever we have. They will take 25 background on a television program, bring them in, suddenly make three of them uh, stand-ins, and now you have background jobs that could have gone to union members that have been usurped by double duty where this uh, interim agreement at least gave a yeah. monetary compensation. No, I understand, I understand measure. what your point is now. And you know, we did have a proposal on double duty. We weren't able to achieve it in this negotiation. I'm sure it will be back for a future round of bargaining. So when the community you know, that was represented in the committee decided where to prioritize, it was felt that prioritizing the two areas that we did achieve significant bumps in would be a better result for background. Thank you for the clarification on the artificial Thanks. intelligence language. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Last question. No? Come on, baby, come on. I don't know how to really uh, word the way I'm questioning I have because it, it was something that you said and it went really fast and it blurred past and I just wanted to ask you about it. It sounded like, so I don't know the right words for it, but it's like, it sounded like 
there used to be a way of like m making sure that there was diversity on the set, that the, the people on the crew would like give you like the information of how many people were African American or LGBTQ and da da da. And then you said like that's no more and there's this new thing. And I really just wanted you to clarify that because I'm a little bit worried about um, with AI that maybe they're gonna use the AI to start using only like this like little small amount of marginalized people over and over again with the AI. And so there'll be like this smaller amount of like black people, Latino people, LGBTQ, because they're just gonna use the same ones over and over again because they're gonna use the AI. That worries me, so it's like, you know what I mean? Like, is there? Yeah, no, I totally hear you. Just to address the worry first, and then I'll explain the whole underlying thing about the casting data report. That. I do wanna just point out that that's one of the reasons why it's important that we got language that the use of a digital replica costs as much as employing the person in person. Mm -hmm. So there should be no economic advantage for them to create a digital replica of a, of a performer, any performer, including a performer of color, and use that to replace another human performer because the cost for that would be the same. That use would cost as much as hiring the person in the first place. So if they wanted to do it for artistic or creative reasons, I suppose it's possible, but there shouldn't be any economic reason under the terms of the contract for them to do that. Um, as to your point about the, um, so the casting data report is what I was talking about, and the casting data report required the producer to have someone go and basically count up people who met those certain categories and provide that report. And what we determined over the decades that it was in place was, you know, the, it was a very unreliable method because specific random PAs or whoever on a set was doing this thing and they're just trying to look at people and sort of in their own opinion decide is that person this, this, this or that. And so once we had the technological capability to conduct a member census and let people identify for themselves what what the, you know criteria they meet or what categories they fall into with respect to this whole range of diversity considerations. And now that we can use employment data to cross-reference with that so we can see the aggregated trends and statistics, it's just a much better way of making sure that um, there is an inclusive industry and that there are opportunities being provided to everybody instead of relying on these random people's just guess about whether you are or aren't something. <clears throat> okay, here's my, just, I thank you, I understand that. This is my, like, a, just a little tweak. Okay. What I worry about is they're becoming this smaller pool of the, uh, those people being used. So I'm just gonna use terms, I, I hope I don't offend anybody, but we got like our three gays and those are, though, because of the AI, they're just gonna keep using them over and over again and there'll be like 20 that don't work anymore because they're gonna keep using the same ones over and over again. They're gonna like say, hey, you signed up for this, can we just use you here and we'll pay you and can we just use you here and as opposed to like, there's, the, do you know what I'm saying? Like in my head, I just hear, mm -hmm. I can see like. We understand. Yeah, totally understand, and that's why I was saying, I mean, one thing is that it won't be economically advantageous for them to use digital replicas to have the same few people perform all the roles. And the only other thing that I would really say is last year we fought a huge exclusivity battle with not only Netflix, but with all of the AMPTP companies. And, you know, to hear them talk about how much they don't want to cast the same people in projects, especially the same people who are stars on the other companies. We forced them, you know, using the leverage we had generated to make, you know, to walk away a bit from that position, but they consistently told us they, they don't think that it's in their interest to have the same people across those different projects. They want to have people who, in their mind, are identified with their particular show or their network or whatever. So I think that those corporate incentives may also help us avoid the outcome that you're talking about, but we can definitely keep an eye on it. And if it looks like it's trending in that direction, then we could try to um, put in proposals in the next round of bargaining to address it if it looks like that's something that's Thank materializing. Thank you so much, I appreciate you. I appreciate Thank you, Thank you very, time. very much. Thank you all for sharing. You guys did. Thank, Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Duncan and Ray. Thank you, for Ezra. The tour. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Negotiating Thank you. Committee, for being on hand. I want to thank you all for your energy, for sharing your concerns, your passion. Uh, many of you will leave here still in decision on this contract. What I will say to you is this. I cannot, we cannot, and will not tell you how to vote. 
But what I can offer you the factual information that the negotiating committee supported this 100% and the national board 86%. So take this along with you as you move forward. Look out for the MOA, the full memorandum of agreement to be able to look over that for any additional questions and any concerns to be addressed and make your vote from an informed place that we want to give you to inform your vote from. So thank you for attending. Thank you again, New York, and uh, have a wonderful night. Thank you.